The Robots of Dawn by Isaac Asimov Narrated by William DeFries Chapter 1 Bailey 1. Elijah Bailey found himself in the shade of the tree and muttered to himself, I knew it. I'm sweating. He paused, straightened up, wiped the perspiration from his brow with the back of his hand, then looked dourly at the moisture that covered it. I hate sweating, he said to no one, throwing it out as a cosmic law. And once again he felt annoyance with the universe for making something both essential and unpleasant. One never perspired, unless one wished to, of course, in the city, where temperature and humidity were absolutely controlled, and where it was never absolutely necessary for the body to perform in ways that made heat production greater than heat removal. Now that was civilized. He looked out into the field, where a straggle of men and women were, more or less, in his charge. They were mostly youngsters in their late teens, but included some middle-aged people like himself. They were hoeing inexpertly and doing a variety of other things that robots were designed to do, and could do much more efficiently had they not been ordered to stand aside and wait while the human beings stubbornly practiced. There were clouds in the sky, and the sun, at the moment, was going behind one of them. He looked up uncertainly. On the one hand, it meant the direct heat of the sun, and the sweating, would be cut down. On the other hand, was there a chance of rain? That was the trouble with the outside. One teetered forever between unpleasant alternatives. It always amazed Bailey that a relatively small cloud could cover the sun completely, darkening earth from horizon to horizon, yet leaving most of the sky blue. He stood beneath the leafy canopy of the tree, a kind of primitive wall and ceiling, with the solidity of the bark comforting to the touch, and looked again at the group, studying it. Once a week they were out there, whatever the weather. They were gaining recruits, too. They were definitely more in number than the stout-hearted few who had started out. The city government, if not an actual partner in the endeavor, was benign enough to raise no obstacles. To the horizon on Bailey's right, eastward, as one could tell by the position of the late afternoon sun, he could see the blunt, many-fingered domes of the city, enclosing all that made life worthwhile. He saw as well a small moving speck that was too far off to be made out clearly. From its manner of motion and from indications too subtle to describe, Bailey was quite sure it was a robot. But that did not surprise him. The Earth's surface outside the cities was the domain of robots, not of human beings, except for those few like himself who were dreaming of the stars. Automatically, his eyes turned back toward the hoeing star dreamers and went from one to the other. He could identify and name each one, all working, all learning how to endure the outside, and he frowned and muttered in a low voice, Where's Bentley? And another voice, sounding behind with a somewhat breathless exuberance, said, Here I am, Dad. Bailey whirled, oh, Don't do that, Ben. Do what? Sneak up on me like that. It's hard enough trying to keep my equilibrium in the outside without my having to worry about surprises, too. I wasn't trying to surprise you. It's tough to make much noise walking on the grass. One can't help that. But don't you think you ought to go in, Dad? You've been out two hours now, and I think you've had enough. Why? Because I'm 45 and you're a punk kid of 19? You think you have to take care of your decrepit father, do you? Ben said, Yes, I guess that's it. And a bit of good detective work on your part, too. You cut right through to the nub. Ben smiled broadly. His face was round, his eyes sparkling. There was a lot of Jesse in him, Bailey thought. A lot of his mother. There was little trace of the length and solemnity of Bailey's own face. And yet Ben had his father's way of thinking. He could at times furrow into a grave solemnity that made it quite clear that he was of perfectly legitimate origin. 
I'm doing very well, said Bailey. Well, you are, Dad. You're the best of us, considering... Considering what? Well, your age, of course. And I'm not forgetting that you're the one who started this. Still, I saw you take cover under the tree, and I thought, well, maybe the old man has had enough. Oh, old man, you, said Bailey. The robot he had noted in the direction of the city was now close enough to be made out clearly, but Bailey dismissed it as unimportant. He said, It makes sense to get under a tree once in a while when the sun's too bright. We've got to learn to use the advantages of the outside as well as learning to bear its disadvantages. And there's the sun coming out from behind that cloud. Yes, it will do that. Well then, don't you want to go in? I can stick it out. Once a week, I have an afternoon off, and I spend it here. That's my privilege. It goes with my C7 rating. It's not a question of privilege, Dad. It's a question of getting overtired. I feel fine, I tell you. Sure, and when you get home, you'll go straight to bed and lie in the dark. Natural antidote to overbrightness. And Mom worries. I'll let her worry. It will do her good. Besides, what's the harm in being out here? The worst part is I sweat. But I just have to get used to it. I can't run away from it. When I started, I couldn't even walk this far from the city without having to turn back, and you were the only one with me. Now look at how many we've got and how far I can come without trouble. I can do plenty of work, too. I can last another hour, easy. I tell you, Ben, it would do your mother good to come out here herself. Who, Mom? Surely you jest. Some jest. When the time comes to take off, I won't be able to go along because she won't. And you'll be glad of it. Don't kid yourself, Dad. It won't be for quite a while, and if you're not too old now, you'll be too old then. It's going to be a game for young people. You know, said Bailey, half balling his fist, you are such a wise guy with your young people. Have you ever been off Earth? Have any of those people in the field been off Earth? I have, two years ago. That was before I had any of this acclimatization, and I survived. I know, Dad, but that was briefly and in the line of duty, and you were taken care of in a going society. It's not the same. It was the same, said Bailey stubbornly, knowing in his heart that it wasn't. It won't take us so long to be able to leave. If I could get permission to go to Aurora, we could get this act off the ground. Forget it. It's not going to happen that easily. We've got to try. The government won't let us go without Aurora giving us the go-ahead. It's the largest and strongest of the spacer worlds, and what it says goes. I know. We've all talked this over a million times, but you don't have to go there to get permission. There are such things as hyper-relays. You can talk to them from here. I've said that any number of times before. It's not the same. We'll need face-to-face -face contact, and I've said that any number of times before. In any case, said Ben, we're not ready yet. We're not ready because Earth won't give us the ships. The spacers will, together with the necessary technical help. Such faith. Why should the spacers do it? When do they start feeling kindly toward us short-lived Earth people? If I could talk to them. Ben laughed. <laughs> Come on, Dad. You just want to go to Aurora to see that woman again. Bailey frowned, and his eyebrows beetled over his deep-set eyes. Woman? Jehoshaphat, Ben, what are you talking about? No, Dad, just between us and not a word to Mom. What did happen with that woman on Solaria? I'm old enough, you can tell me. What woman on Solaria? How can you look at me and deny any knowledge of the woman everyone on Earth saw in the hyperwave dramatization, hmm? Gladia Del Mar, that woman. Nothing happened. That hyperwave thing was nonsense. I've told you that a thousand times. She didn't look that way. I didn't look that way. It was all made up, and you know it was produced over my protests, just because the government thought it would put Earth in a good light with the spacers. And you make sure you don't employ anything different to your mother. You wouldn't dream of it. Still, this Gladia went to Aurora, and you keep wanting to go there, too. Are you trying to tell me that you honestly think the reason I want to go to Aurora... Aw, oh, gee, Hosefat. His son's eyebrows raised. What's the matter? 
Oh, the robot. That's our Geronimo. Who? One of our department messenger robots. And it's out of here. I'm off time, and I deliberately left my receiver at home because I didn't want them to get at me. That's my C7 privilege, and yet they send for me by robot. How do you know it's coming to you, Dad? By very clever deduction. One, there's no one else here has any connection with the police department. And two, that miserable thing is heading right toward me. From that, I deduce that it wants me. I should get on the other side of the tree and stay there. It's not a wall, Dad. The robot can walk around the tree. And the robot called out, Master Bailey, I have a message for you. You are wanted at headquarters. The robot stopped, waited, then said again, Master Bailey, I have a message for you. You are wanted at headquarters. I hear and understand, Bailey said tonelessly. He had to say that or the robot would have continued to repeat. Bailey frowned slightly as he studied the robot. It was a new model, a little more humaniform than the older models were. It had been uncrated and activated only a month before and with some degree of fanfare. The government was always trying for something, anything that might produce more acceptance of robots. It had a grayish surface with a dull finish and a somewhat resilient touch, perhaps like soft leather. The facial expression, while largely changeless, was not quite as idiotic as that of most robots. It was, though, in actual fact, quite as idiotic mentally as all the rest. For a moment, Bailey thought of R. Daniil Oliva, the spacer robot who had been on two assignments with him, one on Earth and one on Solaria, and whom he had last encountered when Daniil had consulted him in the mirror image case. Daniil was a robot who was so human that Bailey could treat him as a friend and could still miss him, even now. If all robots were like that, Bailey said, This is my day off, boy. There is no necessity for me to go to headquarters. Our Geronimo paused. There was a trifling vibration in his hands. Bailey noticed that and was quite aware that it meant a certain amount of conflict in the robot's positronic pathways. They had to obey human beings, but it was quite common for two human beings to want two different types of obedience. The robot made a choice. It said, It is your day off, master. You are wanted at headquarters. Ben said uneasily, If they want you, Dad, Bailey shrugged. Don't be fooled, Ben. If they really wanted me badly, they'd have sent an enclosed car and probably used a human volunteer instead of ordering a robot to do the walking and irritate me with one of its messages. Ben shook his head. I don't think so, Dad. They wouldn't know where you were or how long it would take to find you. I don't think they would want to send a human being on an uncertain search. Yes? Well, let's see how strong the order is. Our Geronimo, go back to headquarters and tell them I'll be at work at 0900. Then sharply, go back, that's an order. The robot hesitated perceptibly, then turned, moved away, turned again, made an attempt to come back toward Bailey, and finally remained in one spot, its whole body vibrating. Bailey recognized it for what it was and muttered to Ben, I may have to go, gee, those are fat. What was troubling the robot was what the roboticists called an equipotential of contradiction on the second level. Obedience was the second law, and R. Geronimo was now suffering from two roughly equal and contradictory orders. Robot block was what the general population called it, or, more frequently, Roblock for short. Slowly, the robot turned. Its original order was the stronger, but not by much, so that its voice was slurred. Master, I was told you might say that. If so, I was to say... It paused, then added hoarsely, I was to say, if you are alone... Bailey nodded curtly to his son, and Ben didn't wait. 
He knew when his father was dad and when he was a policeman. Ben retreated hastily. For a moment, Bailey played irritably with the notion of strengthening his own order and making the roadblock more nearly complete, but that would surely cause the kind of damage that would require positronic analysis and reprogramming. The expense of that would be taken out of his salary, and it might easily amount to a year's pay. He said, I withdraw my order. What were you told to say? Our Geronimo's voice at once cleared. I was told to say that you are wanted in connection with Aurora. Bailey turned toward Ben and called out, Give them another half hour and then say I want them back in. I've got to leave now. And as he walked off with long strides, he said petulantly to the robot, Why couldn't they tell you to say that at once? Why can't they program you to use a car so that I wouldn't have to walk? He knew very well why that wasn't done. Any accident involving a robot-driven car would set off another anti-robot riot. He did not slacken his pace. There were two kilometers to walk before they even got to the city wall, and thereafter they would have to reach headquarters through heavy traffic. Aurora. What kind of crisis was brewing now? Two. It took half an hour for Bailey to reach the entranceway into the city, and he stiffened himself for what he suspected ahead. Perhaps, perhaps, it wouldn't happen this time. He reached the dividing plane between outside and city, the wall that marked off chaos from civilization. He placed his hand over the signal patch, and an opening appeared. As usual, he didn't wait for the opening to be completed, but slipped in as soon as it was wide enough. Our Geronimo followed. The police sentry on duty looked startled, as he always did when someone came in from outside. Each time there was the same look of disbelief, the same coming to attention, the same sudden hand upon the blaster, the same frown of uncertainty. Bailey presented his identity card with a scowl, and the sentry saluted. The door closed behind him, and it happened. Bailey was inside the city. The walls closed around him, and the city became the universe. He was again immersed in the endless, eternal hum and odor of people and machinery that would soon fade below the threshold of consciousness. In the soft, indirect, artificial light that was nothing at all like the partial and varying glare of the outside, with its green and brown and blue and white and its interruptions of red and yellow, here there was no erratic wind, no heat, no cold, no thread of rain. Here there was instead the quiet permanence of unfelt air currents that kept everything fresh, here was a designed combination of temperature and humidity so perfectly adjusted to humans, it remained unsensed. Bailey felt his breath drawn in tremulously, and he gladdened in the realization that he was home and safe with the known and knowable. That was what always happened. Again he had accepted the city as the womb, and moved back into it with glad relief, he knew that such a womb was something from which humanity must emerge and be born. Why did he always sink back this way? And would that always be? Would it really be that, though he might lead countless numbers out of the city and off the earth and out to the stars, he would not, in the end, be able to go himself? Would he always feel at home only in the city? He clenched his teeth, but there was no use thinking about it. He said to the robot, Were you brought to this point by car, boy? Yes, master. Where is it now? I do not know, master. Bailey turned to the sentry. Officer, this robot was brought to this spot two hours ago. What has happened to the car that brought him? Sir, I went on duty less than an hour ago. Actually, it was foolish to ask. Those in the car did not know how long it would take the robot to find him, so they would not wait. 
Bailey had a brief impulse to call in, but they would tell him to take the expressway. It would be quicker. The only reason he hesitated was the presence of R. Geronimo. He didn't want its company on the expressway, and yet he could not expect the robot to make its way back to headquarters through hostile crowds. Not that he had a choice. Undoubtedly, the commissioner was not eager to make this easy for him. He would be annoyed at not having had him on call, free time or not. Bailey said, This way, boy. The city covered over 5,000 square kilometers and contained over 400 kilometers of expressway, plus hundreds of kilometers of feeder way, to serve its well over 20 million people. The intricate net of movement existed on eight levels, and there were hundreds of interchanges of varying degrees of complexity. As a plain clothesman, Bailey was expected to know them all, and he did. Put him down blindfolded in any corner of the city, whip off the blindfold, and he could make his way flawlessly to any other designated portion. There was no question then but that he knew how to get to headquarters. There were eight reasonable routes he could follow, however, and for a moment he hesitated over which might be least crowded at this time. Only for a moment. Then he decided and said, Come with me, boy. The robot followed docilely at his heels. They swung onto a passing feeder, and Bailey seized one of the vertical poles, white, warm, and textured to give a good grip. Bailey did not want to sit down. They would not be on for long. The robot had waited for Bailey's quick gesture before placing its hand upon the same pole. It might as well have remained standing without a grip. It would not have been difficult to maintain balance, but Bailey wanted to take no chance of being separated. He was responsible for the robot and did not wish to risk being asked to replace the financial loss to the city should anything happen to our Geronimo. The feeder had a few other people on board, and the eyes of each turned curiously and inevitably to the robot. One by one, Bailey caught those glances. Bailey had the look of one used to authority, and the eyes he caught turned uneasily away. Bailey gestured again as he swung off the feeder. It had reached the strips now and was moving at the same speed as the nearest strip, so that there was no necessity for it to slow down. Bailey stepped onto that nearest strip and felt the whipping of air once they were no longer protected by plastic enclosure. He leaned into the wind with the ease of long practice, lifting one arm to break the force at eye level. He ran the strips downward to the intersection with the expressway and then began the run upward to the speed strip that bordered the expressway. He heard the teenage cry of, Robot! He had been a teenager himself once and knew exactly what would happen. A group of them, two or three or half a dozen, would swarm up or down the strips and somehow the robot would be tripped and would go clanging down. Then, if it ever came before a magistrate, any teenager taken into custody would claim the robot had collided with him and was a menace on the strips and would undoubtedly be let go. The robot could neither defend itself in the first instance nor testify in the second. Bailey moved rapidly and was between the first of the teenagers and the robot. He sidestepped onto a faster strip, brought his arm higher as though to adjust to the increase in wind speed, and somehow the young man was nudged off course and onto a slower strip for which he was not prepared. He called out wildly, Hey! as he went sprawling. The others stopped, assessed the situation quickly, and veered away. Bailey said, Onto the expressway, boy. The robot hesitated briefly. Robots were not allowed, unaccompanied, on the expressway. Bailey's order had been a firm one, however, and it moved aboard. Bailey followed, which relieved the pressure on the robot. Bailey moved brusquely through the crowd of standees, forcing R. Geronimo ahead of him, making his way up to the less crowded upper level. He held onto a pole and kept one foot firmly on the robots, again glaring down all eye contact. Fifteen and a half kilometers brought him to the close point for the police headquarters, and he was off. R. Geronimo came off with him. 
It hadn't been touched, not a scuff. Bailey delivered it at the door and accepted a receipt. He carefully checked the date, the time, and the robot's serial number, then placed the receipt in his wallet. Before the day was over, he would check and make certain that the transaction had been computer-registered. Now he was going to see the commissioner. And he knew the commissioner. Any failing on Bailey's part would be suitable cause for demotion. He was a harsh man, the commissioner. He considered Bailey's past triumphs a personal offense. 3. The commissioner was Wilson Roth. He had held the post for two and a half years since Julius Enderby had resigned once the furor roused by the murder of a spacer had subsided and the resignation could be safely offered. Bailey had never quite reconciled himself to the change. Julius, with all his shortcomings, had been a friend as well as a superior. Roth was merely a superior. He was not even city-bred, not this city. He had been brought in from outside. Roth was neither unusually tall nor unusually fat. His head was large, though, and seemed to be set on a neck that slanted slightly forward from his torso. It made him appear heavy, heavy-bodied and heavy-headed. He even had heavy lids half-obscuring his eyes. Anyone would think him sleepy, but he never missed anything. Bailey had found that out very soon after Roth had taken over the office. He was under no illusion that Roth liked him. He was under less illusion that he liked Roth. Roth did not sound petulant. He never did. But his words did not exude pleasure either. Bailey, why is it so hard to find you? He said. Bailey said in a carefully respectful voice. It is my afternoon off, Commissioner. Yes, your C-7 privilege. You've heard of a waiver, haven't you? Something that receives official messages? You are subject to recall even on your off time. I know that very well, Commissioner. But there are no longer any regulations concerning the wearing of a waiver. We can be reached without one. Inside the city, yes, but you were outside, or am I mistaken? You are not mistaken, Commissioner. I was outside... The regulations do not state that in such a case I am to wear a waiver. You hide behind the letter of the statute, do you? Yes, Commissioner, said Bailey calmly. The Commissioner rose, a powerful and vaguely threatening man, and sat on the desk. The window to the outside, which Enderby had installed, had long been closed off and painted over. In the closed-in room, warmer and more comfortable for that, the commissioner seemed the larger. He said, without raising his voice, You rely, Bailey, on Earth's gratitude, I think. I rely on doing my job, commissioner, as best I can and in accord with the regulations. And on Earth's gratitude when you bend the spirit of those regulations. Bailey said nothing to that. The commissioner said, You are considered as having done well in the Sartan murder case three years ago. Thank you, Commissioner, said Bailey. The dismantling of Spacetown was a consequence, I believe. It was, and that was something applauded by all Earth. You're also considered as having done well on Solaria two years ago, and before you remind me, the result was a revision in the terms of the trade treaties with the Spacer Worlds to the considerable advantage of Earth. I believe that is on record, sir. And you are very much the hero as a result. I make no such claim. You have received two promotions, one in the aftermath of each affair. There has even been a hyperwave drama based on the events on Solaria, which was produced without my permission and against my will, Commissioner, which nevertheless made you a kind of hero. Bailey shrugged. The Commissioner, having waited for a spoken comment for a few seconds, went on. But you have done nothing of importance in nearly two years. It is natural for Earth to ask what I have done for it lately. Exactly. It probably does ask. It knows you are a leader in this new fad of venturing outside and fiddling with the soil and in pretending to be a robot. It is permitted. 
Not all that is permitted is admired. It is possible that more people think of you as peculiar than as heroic. Well, that is perhaps in accord with my own opinion of myself, said Bailey. The public has a notoriously short memory. The heroic is vanishing rapidly behind the peculiar in your case, so that if you make a mistake, you will be in serious trouble. The reputation you rely on, with respect, Commissioner, I do not rely on it. The reputation the police department feels you rely on will not save you, and I will not be able to save you. The shadow of a smile seemed to pass for one moment over Bailey's dour features. I would not want you, Commissioner, to risk your position in a wild attempt to save me. The Commissioner shrugged and produced a smile precisely as shadowy and fleeting. You need not worry about that. Then why are you telling me all this, Commissioner? To warn you. I am not trying to destroy you, you understand, so I am warning you once. You are going to be involved in a very delicate matter in which you may easily make a mistake, and I am warning you that you must not make one. Here his face relaxed into an unmistakable smile. Bailey did not respond to the smile. He said, Can you tell me what the very delicate matter is? I do not know. Does it involve Aurora? Our Geronimo was instructed to tell you that it did, if it had to, but I know nothing about it. Then how can you tell, Commissioner, that it is a very delicate matter? Come, Bailey. You are an investigator of mysteries. What brings a member of the Terrestrial Department of Justice to the city when you might easily have been asked to go to Washington, as you did two years ago in connection with the Solari incident? And what makes the person from justice frown and seem ill-tempered and grow impatient at the fact that you were not reached instantly? Your decision to make yourself unavailable was a mistake, one that was in no way my responsibility. It is perhaps not fatal in itself, but you are off on the wrong foot, I believe. You are delaying me further, however, said Bailey, frowning. Not really. The official from Justice is having some light refreshment. You know, the perks that the Terries allow themselves. We will be joined when that is done. The news of your arrival has been transmitted, so just continue to wait as I am doing. Bailey waited. He had known at the time that the hyperwave drama forced upon him against his will, however it might have helped Earth's position, had ruined him in the department and it cast him in three-dimensional relief against the two-dimensional flatness of the organization and had made him a marked man. He had risen to higher rank and greater privileges, but that too had increased department hostility against him, and the higher he rose, the more easily he would shatter in case of a fall, if he made a mistake. 4. The official from Justice entered, looked about casually, walked to the other side of Roth's desk, and took the seat. As highest classified individual, the official behaved properly. Roth calmly took a secondary seat. Bailey remained standing, laboring to keep his face unsurprised. Roth might have warned him, but he had not. He had clearly chosen his words deliberately in order to give no sign. The official was a woman. There was no reason for this not to be. Any official might be a woman. The secretary general might be a woman. There were women on the police force, even a woman with the rank of captain. It was just that, without warning, one didn't expect it in any given case. There were times in history when women entered administrative posts in considerable numbers. Bailey knew that. He knew history well but this wasn't one of those times. She was quite tall and sat stiffly upright in the chair. Her uniform was not very different from that of a man, nor was her hair styling or facial adornment. What gave her sex away immediately were her breasts, the prominence of which she made no attempt to hide. She was fortyish, her facial features regular and cleanly chiseled. She had middle-aged attractively, with as yet no visible gray in her dark hair. She said, 
You are plain clothesman Elijah Bailey, classification C7. It was a statement, not a question. Yes, ma'am, Bailey answered, nevertheless. I am Undersecretary Lavinia Demichek. You don't look very much as you did in that hyperwave drama concerning you. Bailey had been told that often. They couldn't very well portray me as I am and collect much of an audience, ma'am, said Bailey dryly. I'm not sure of that. You look stronger than the baby-faced actor they used. Bailey hesitated a second or so and decided to take the chance, or perhaps felt he couldn't resist taking it. Solemnly, he said, You have a cultivated taste, ma'am. She laughed, and Bailey let out his breath very gently. She said, I like to think I have. Now, what do you mean by keeping me waiting? I was not informed you would come, ma'am, and it was off time for me. Which you spent outside, I understand. Yes, ma'am. You are one of those cranks, as I would say, were my taste not a cultivated one. Let me ask instead if you are one of those enthusiasts. Yes, ma'am. You expect to emigrate some day and found new worlds in the wildernesses of the galaxy. Perhaps not I, ma'am. I may prove to be too old, but how old are you? Forty-five, ma'am. Well, you look it. I am forty-five also, as it happens. You do not look it, ma'am. Older or younger? She broke into laughter again, then said, But let's not play games. Do you imply I am too old to be a pioneer? No one can be a pioneer in our society without training outside. The training works best with the young. My son, I hope, will someday stand on another world. Indeed. You know, of course, that the galaxy belongs to the spacer worlds. There are only fifty of them, ma'am. There are millions of worlds in the galaxy that are habitable, or can be made habitable, and that probably do not possess indigenous intelligent life. Yes, but not one ship can leave Earth without spacer permission. That might be granted, ma'am. I do not share your optimism, Mr. Bailey. I have spoken to spacers who I know you have, said Demichik. My superior is Albert Minim, who two years ago sent you to Solaria. She permitted herself a small curve of the lips. An actor portrayed him in a bit role on that hyperwave drama, one that resembled him closely, as I recall. He was not pleased, as I also recall. Bailey changed the subject. I asked Undersecretary Minim, he has been promoted, you know. Bailey thoroughly understood the importance of grades and classification. His new title, ma'am? Vice Secretary. Thank you. I asked Vice Secretary Minim to request permission for me to visit Aurora to deal with this subject. When? Not very long after my return from Solaria. I have renewed the request twice since, but have not received a favorable reply. No, ma'am. Are you surprised? I am disappointed, ma'am. No point in that. She leaned back a trifle in the chair. Our relationship with the spacer worlds is very touchy. You may feel that your two feats of detection have eased the situation, and so they have. That awful hyperwave drama has also helped. The total easing, however, has been this much. She placed her thumb and forefinger close together. Out of this much and she spread her hands far apart. Under those circumstances, she went on, we would scarcely take the risk of sending you to Aurora, the leading spacer world, and having you perhaps do something that could create interstellar tension. Bailey's eyes met hers. I have been on Solaria and have done no harm. On the contrary, yes, I know. But you were there at spacer request, which is parsecs distant, from being there at our request. You cannot fail to see that. Bailey was silent. She made a soft, snorting sound of non-surprise and said, The situation has grown worse since your requests were placed with, and very correctly ignored by, the vice secretary. It has grown particularly worse in the last month. Is that the reason for this conference, ma'am? Do you grow impatient, sir? She addressed him sardonically in the to a superior intonation. Do you direct me to come to the point? No, ma'am. Certainly you do. 
And why not? I grow tedious. Let me approach the point by asking if you know Dr. Han Fastolf. Bailey said carefully, I met him once, nearly three years ago, in what was then Spacetown. You liked him, I believe. He was friendly, for a spacer. She made another soft, snorting sound. I imagine so. Are you aware that he has been an important political power on Aurora over the last two years? I had heard he was in the government from a, um, a partner I once had. From R. Daniil Oliva, your spacer robot friend, my ex-partner, ma'am. On the occasion when you solved a small problem concerning two mathematicians on board a spacer ship, Bailey nodded. Yes, ma'am. We keep informed, you see. Dr. Han Fastolf has been, more or less, the guiding light of the Auroran government for two years, an important figure in their world legislature, and he is even spoken of as a possible future chairman. The chairman, you understand, is the closest thing to a chief executive that the Aurorans have. Bailey said, Yes, ma'am and wondered when she would get to the very delicate matter of which the commissioner had spoken. Demichek seemed in no hurry. She said, Fastolf is a moderate. That's what he calls himself. He feels Aurora and the spacer worlds generally have gone too far in their direction, as you perhaps feel that we on Earth have gone too far in ours. He wishes to step backward to less robotry, to a more rapid turnover of generations and to alliance and friendship with Earth. Naturally, we support him, but very quietly. If we were too demonstrative in our affection, that might well be the kiss of death for him. Bailey said, I believe he would support Earth's exploration and settlement of other worlds. I believe so, too. I am of the opinion he said as much to you. Yes, ma'am, when we met. Demichek steepled her hands and put the tips of her fingers to her chin. Do you think he represents public opinion on the spacer worlds? I don't know, ma'am. I'm afraid he does not. Those who are with him are lukewarm. Those who are against him are an ardent legion. It is only his political skills and his personal warmth that have kept him as close to the seats of power as he is. His greatest weakness, of course, is his sympathy for Earth. That is constantly used against him, and it influences many who would share his views in every other respect. If you were sent to Aurora, any mistake you made would help strengthen anti-Earth feeling and would therefore weaken him, possibly fatally. Earth simply cannot take that risk. Bailey muttered. I see. Fastolf is willing to take the risk. It was he who arranged to have you sent to Solaria at a time when his political power was barely beginning and when he was very vulnerable. But then he has only his personal power to lose, whereas we must be concerned with the welfare of over eight billion Earth people. That is what makes the present political situation almost unbearably delicate. She paused, and finally Bailey was forced to ask the question, what is the situation that you are referring to, ma'am? It seems, said Demichek, that Fastolf has become implicated in a serious and unprecedented scandal. If he is clumsy, the chances are that he will undergo political destruction in a matter of weeks. If he is superhumanly clever, perhaps he will hold out for some months. A little sooner, a little later, he could be destroyed as a political force on Aurora, and that would be a real disaster for Earth, you see. May I ask what he is accused of? Corruption? Treason? Nothing that small. His personal integrity is, in any case, unquestioned even by his enemies. A crime of passion, then? Murder? Not quite murder. I don't understand, ma'am. There are human beings on Aurora, Mr. Bailey, and there are robots, too, most of them something like ours, not very much more advanced in most cases. However, there are a few humaniform robots, robots so humaniform that they can be taken for human. Bailey nodded. I know that very well. 
I suppose that destroying a humaniform robot is not exactly murder in the strict sense of the word. Bailey leaned forward, eyes widening. He shouted, Jehoshaphat, woman, stop playing games. Are you telling me that Dr. Fastolf has killed Ardeniel? Roth leaped to his feet and seemed about to advance on Bailey, but Undersecretary Demichek waved him back. She seemed unruffled. She said, Under the circumstances, I excuse your disrespect, Bailey. No, Ardeniel has not been killed. He is not the only humaniform robot on Aurora. Another such robot, not Ardeniel, has been killed, if you wish to use the term loosely. To be more precise, its mind has been totally destroyed. It was placed into permanent and irreversible roadblock. Bailey said, And they are saying that Dr. Fastolf did it? His enemies are saying so. The extremists, who wish only spacers to spread through the galaxy and who wish Earth people to vanish from the universe, are saying so. If these extremists can maneuver another election within the next few weeks, they will surely gain total control of the government with incalculable results. Why is this roadblock so important politically? I don't understand. I am not myself certain, said Demichek. I do not pretend to understand Auroran politics. I gather that the humaniforms were in some way involved with the extremist plans and that the destruction has infuriated them. She wrinkled her nose. I find their politics very confusing, and I will only mislead you if I try to interpret it. Bailey labored to control himself under the undersecretary's level stare. He said in a low voice, Why am I here? because of Fastolf. Once before, you went out into space in order to solve a murder and succeeded. Fastolf wants you to try again. You are to go to Aurora and discover who was responsible for the roadblock. He feels that to be his only chance of turning back the extremists. I am not a roboticist. I know nothing about Aurora. You knew nothing about Solaria either, yet you managed. The point is, Bailey, we are as eager to find out what really happened as Fastolf is. We don't want him destroyed. If he is, Earth will be subject to a kind of hostility from these spacer extremists that will probably be greater than anything we have yet experienced. We don't want that to happen. I can't take on this responsibility, ma'am. The task is next to impossible. We know that. But we have no choice. Fastolf insists and behind him, for the moment, stands the Auroran government. If you refuse to go, or if we refuse to let you go, we will have to face the Auroran fury. If you do go and are successful, we will be saved, and you will be suitably rewarded. And if I go and fail, we will do our best to see to it that the blame will be yours and not Earth's. The skins of officialdom will be saved, in other words. Demichek said, A kinder way of putting it is that you will be thrown to the wolves in the hope that Earth will not suffer too badly. One man is not a bad price to pay for our planet. It seems to me that since I am sure to fail, I might as well not go. You know better than that, said Demichek softly. Aurora has asked for you, and you cannot refuse. And why should you want to refuse? You've been trying to go to Aurora for two years, and you've been bitter over your failure to get our permission. I've wanted to go in peace to arrange for help in the settlement of other worlds, not to... You might still try to get their help for your dream of settling other worlds, Bailey. After all, suppose you do succeed. It's possible, after all. In that case, Fastolf will be much beholden to you, and he may do far more for you than he ever would have otherwise. And we ourselves will be sufficiently grateful to you to help. Isn't that worth a risk, even a large one? However small your chances of success are if you go, those chances are zero if you do not go. Think of that, Bailey, but please, not too long. Bailey's lips tightened and finally... Realizing there was no alternative, he said, How much time do I have to... And Demichek said calmly, 
Come, haven't I been explaining that we have no choice and no time either? You leave, she looked at the time band on her wrist, in just under six hours. Five. The spaceport was at the eastern outskirts of the city in an all but deserted sector that was, strictly speaking, outside. This was palliated by the fact that the ticket offices and the waiting rooms were actually in the city, and that the approach to the ship itself was by vehicle through a covered path. By tradition, all takeoffs were at night, so that a pall of darkness further deadened the effect of outside. The spaceport was not very busy, considering the populous character of Earth. Earthmen very rarely left the planet, and the traffic consisted entirely of commercial activity organized by robots and spacers. Elijah Bailey, waiting for the ship to be ready for boarding, felt already cut off from Earth. Bentley sat with him, and there was a glum silence between the two. Finally, Ben said, I didn't think Mom would want to come. Bailey nodded. I didn't think so either. I remember how she was when I went to Solaria. This is no different. Did you manage to calm her down? I did what I could, Ben. She thinks I'm bound to be in a space crash or that the spacers will kill me once I'm on Aurora. You got back from Solaria? And that just makes her less eager to risk me a second time. She assumes the luck will run out. However, she'll manage. You rally round, Ben. Spend some time with her, and whatever you do, don't talk about heading out to settle a new planet. That's what really bothers her, you know. She feels you'll be leaving her one of these years. She knows she won't be able to go, and so she'll never see you again. Well, she may not, said Ben. That's the way it might work out. Uh, you can face that easily, maybe, but she can't, so just don't discuss it while I'm gone, all right? All right. I think she's a little upset about Gladiah. Bailey looked up sharply. Have you been... I haven't said a word. But she saw that hyperwave thing too, you know, and she knows Gladiah's on Aurora. Well, what of it? It's a big planet. Do you think Gladiah Del Mar will be waiting at the spaceport for me? Jehoshaphat Ben, doesn't your mother know that hyperwave axle grease was nine-tenths fiction? Ben changed the subject with a tangible effort. It seems funny. He's sitting here with no luggage of any kind. Yeah, I'm sitting here with too much. I've got the clothes I'm wearing, don't I? They'll get rid of those as soon as I'm on board. Off they go to be chemically treated, then dumped into space. After that, they'll give me a totally new wardrobe after I've been personally fumigated and cleaned and polished inside and out. I've been through that once before. Again, silence, and then Ben said, you know, Dad, and stopped suddenly. He tried again. You know, Dad, and did no better. Bailey looked at him steadily. What are you trying to say, Ben? Dad, I feel like an awful jackass saying this, but I think I'd better. You're not the hero type. Even I never thought you were. You're a nice guy and the best father there could be, but not the hero type. Bailey grunted. Still, said Ben, when you stop to think of it, it was you who got Spacetown off the map. It was you who got Aurora on our side. It was you who started this whole project of settling other worlds. Dad, you've done more for Earth than everyone in the government put together, so why aren't you appreciated more? Bailey said, Because I'm not the hero type, and because this stupid hyperwave drama was foisted on me. It has made an enemy of every man in the department. It's unsettled your mother, and it's given me a reputation I can't live up to. The light flashed on his wrist collar, and he stood up. I've got to go now, Ben. I know. But what I want to say, Dad, is that I appreciate you. And this time, when you come back, you'll get that from everybody and not just from me. Bailey felt himself melting. He nodded rapidly put a hand on his son's shoulder, and muttered, Thanks. Take care of yourself and your mother while I'm gone. He walked away, not looking back. He had told Ben that he was going to Aurora to discuss the settlement project. 
if that were so, he might come back in triumph. As it was, he thought, I'll come back in disgrace, if I come back at all. Chapter 2 Daniil 6. It was Bailey's third time on a spaceship, and the passage of two years had in no way dimmed his memory of the first two times. He knew exactly what to expect. There would be the isolation, the fact that no one would see him or have anything to do with him, with the exception, perhaps, of a robot. There would be the constant medical treatment, the fumigation and sterilization. No other way of putting it. There would be the attempt to make him fit to approach the disease-conscious spacers who thought of Earth people as walking bags of multifarious infections. There would be differences, too, however. He would not, this time, be quite so afraid of the process. Surely the feeling of loss at being out of the womb would be less dreadful. He would be prepared for the wider surroundings. This time, he told himself boldly, but with a small knot in his stomach for all that, he might even be able to insist on being given a view of space. Would it look different from photographs of the night sky as seen from outside, he wondered. He remembered his first view of a planetarium dome, safely within the city, of course. It had given him no sensation of being outside, no discomfort at all. Then there were the two times, no, three, that he had been in the open at night and saw the real stars in the real dome of the sky. That had been far less impressive than the planetarium dome had been, but there had been a cool wind each time and a feeling of distance, which made it more frightening than the dome, but less frightening than daytime, for the darkness was a comforting wall about him. Would then the sight of the stars through a spaceship viewing window seem more like a planetarium or more like Earth's night sky? Or would it be a different sensation altogether? He concentrated on that, as though to wash out the thought of leaving Jesse, Ben, and the city. With nothing less than bravado, he refused the car and insisted on walking the short distance from the gate to the ship in the company of the robot who had come for him. It was just a roofed-over arcade, after all. The passage was slightly curved, and he looked back while he could still see Ben at the other end. He lifted his hand casually, as though he were taking the expressway to Trenton, and Ben waved both arms wildly holding up the first two fingers of each hand outspread in the ancient symbol of victory. Victory? A useless gesture, Bailey was certain. He switched to another thought that might serve to fill and occupy him. What would it be like to board a spaceship by day, with the sun shining brightly on its metal, and with himself and the others who were boarding all exposed to the outside? How would it feel to be entirely aware of a tiny cylindrical world, one that would detach itself from the infinitely larger world to which it was temporarily attached, and that would then lose itself in an outside infinitely larger than any outside on earth, until, after an endless stretch of nothingness, it would find another? He held himself grimly to a steady walk, letting no change in expression show, or so he thought, at least. The robot at his side, however, brought him to a halt. Are you ill, sir? Not master, merely sir. It was an Auroran robot. I'm all right, boy, said Bailey hoarsely. Move on. He kept his eyes turned to the ground and did not lift them again till the ship itself was towering above him. An Auroran ship. He was sure of that. Outlined by a warm spotlight, it soared taller, more gracefully, and yet more powerfully than the Solarian ships had. Bailey moved inside, and the comparison remained in favor of Aurora. His room was larger than the ones two years before had been, more luxurious, more comfortable. He knew exactly what was coming and removed all his clothes without hesitation. 
Perhaps they would be disintegrated by a plasma torch. Certainly he would not get them back on returning to Earth, if he returned. He hadn't the first time. He would receive no other clothes till he had been thoroughly bathed, examined, dosed, and injected. He almost welcomed the humiliating procedures imposed on him. After all, it served to keep his mind off what was taking place. He was scarcely aware of the initial acceleration and scarcely had time to think of the moment during which he left Earth and entered space. When he was finally dressed again, he surveyed the results unhappily in a mirror. The material, whatever it was, was smooth and reflective and shifted color with any change in angle. The trouser legs hugged his ankles and were in turn covered by the tops of shoes that molded themselves softly to his feet. The sleeves of his blouse hugged his wrists and his hands were covered by thin, transparent gloves. The top of the blouse covered his neck and an attached hood could, if desired, cover his head. He was being so covered, not for his own comfort, he knew, but to reduce his danger to the spacers. He thought, as he looked at the outfit, that he should feel uncomfortably enclosed, uncomfortably hot, uncomfortably damp. But he did not. He wasn't, to his enormous relief, even sweating. He made the reasonable deduction. He said to the robot that had walked him to the ship and was still with him, Boy, are these clothes temperature controlled? The robot said, Indeed they are, sir. It is all-weather clothing and is considered very desirable. It is also exceedingly expensive. Few on Aurora are in a position to wear it. Not so. Jehoshaphat. He stared at the robot. It seemed a fairly primitive model, not very much different from Earth models, in fact. Still, there was a certain subtlety of expression that Earth models lacked. It could change expression in a limited way, for instance. It had smiled very slightly when it indicated that Bailey had been given that which few on Aurora could afford. The structure of its body resembled metal and yet had the look of something woven, something shifting slightly with movement, something with colors that matched and contrasted pleasingly. In short, unless one looked very closely and steadily, the robot, though definitely non-humaniform, seemed to be wearing clothing. Bailey said, What ought I to call you, boy? I am Giscard, sir. R. Giscard? If you wish, sir. Do you have a library on this ship? Yes, sir. Can you get me book films on Aurora? What kind, sir? Histories, political science, geographies, anything that will let me know about the planet. Yes, sir. And a viewer? Yes, sir. The robot left through the double door, and Bailey nodded grimly to himself. On his trip to Solaria, it had never occurred to him to spend the useless time crossing space in learning something useful. He had come along a bit in the last two years. He tried the door the robot had just passed through. It was locked and utterly without give. He would have been enormously surprised at anything else. He investigated the room. There was a hyperwave screen. He handled the controls idly, received a blast of music, managed to lower the volume eventually, and listened with disapproval. Tinkly and discordant, the instruments of the orchestra seemed vaguely distorted. He touched other contacts and finally managed to change the view. What he saw was a space soccer game that was played, obviously, under conditions of zero gravity. The ball flew in straight lines and the players, too many of them on each side with fins on backs, elbows, and knees, that must serve to control movement, soared in graceful sweeps. The unusual movements made Bailey feel dizzy. He leaned forward and had just found and used the off switch when he heard the door open behind him. He turned, and because he thoroughly expected to see R. Giscard, he was aware at first only of someone who was not R. Giscard. It took a blink or two to realize that he saw a thoroughly human shape with a broad, high-cheekboned face and with short, bronze hair lying flatly backward, 
someone dressed in clothing with a conservative cut and color scheme. She helps a fat, said Bailey in a nearly strangled voice. Partner Elijah, said the other, stepping forward, a small, grave smile on his face. Daniil, cried Bailey, throwing his arms around the robot and hugging tightly. Daniil! Seven. Bailey continued to hold Daniil, the one unexpected familiar object on the ship, the one strong link to the past. He clung to Daniil in a gush of relief and affection. And then, little by little, he collected his thoughts and knew that he was hugging not Daniil, but our Daniil, robot Daniil Oliva. He was hugging a robot, and the robot was holding him lightly, allowing himself to be hugged, judging that the action gave pleasure to a human being and enduring that action because the positronic potentials of his brain made it impossible to repel the embrace and so cause disappointment and embarrassment to the human being. The insurmountable first law of robotics states, a robot may not injure a human being, and to repel a friendly gesture would do injury. Slowly, so as to reveal no sign of his own chagrin, Bailey released his hold. He even gave each upper arm of the robot a final squeeze, so that there might seem to be no shame to the release. Haven't seen you, Daniil, said Bailey, since you brought that ship to Earth with the two mathematicians, remember? Of a certainty, partner Elijah, it is a pleasure to see you. You feel emotion, do you? said Bailey lightly. I cannot say what I feel in any human sense, partner Elijah. I can say, however, that the sight of you seems to make my thoughts flow more easily, and the gravitational pull on my body seems to assault my senses with lesser insistence, and that there are other changes I can identify. I imagine that what I sense corresponds in a rough way to what it is that you may sense when you feel pleasure. Bailey nodded. Whatever it is you sense when you see me, old partner, that makes it seem preferable to the state in which you are when you don't see me suits me well, if you follow my meaning. But how is it you are here? Giscard Reventlov, having reported you... Ardeniel paused. Purified? asked Bailey sardonically. Disinfected, said Ardeniel. I felt it appropriate to enter then. Surely you would not fear infection otherwise. Not at all, partner Elijah, but others on the ship might then be reluctant to have me approach them. The people of Aurora are sensitive to the chance of infection, sometimes to a point beyond a rational estimate of the probabilities. I understand, but I wasn't asking why you were here at this moment. I meant, why are you here at all? Dr. Fastolf, of whose establishment I am part, directed me to board the ship that had been sent to pick you up for several reasons. He felt it desirable that you have one immediate item of the known in what he was certain would be a difficult mission for you. Well, that was a kindly thought on his part. I thank him. Ardeniel bowed gravely in acknowledgment. Dr. Fastolf also felt that the meeting would give me, the robot paused, appropriate sensations. Pleasure, you mean, Daniil? Since I am permitted to use the term, yes, and as a third reason, and the most important. The door opened again at that point, and R. Giscard walked in. Bailey's head turned toward it, and he felt a surge of displeasure. There was no mistaking R. Giscard as a robot, and its presence emphasized somehow the robotism of Daniil. R. Daniil, Bailey suddenly thought again, even though Daniil was far the superior of the two. Bailey didn't want the robotism of Daniil emphasized. He didn't want himself humiliated for his inability to regard Daniil as anything but a human being with a somewhat stilted way with the language. He said impatiently, What is it, boy? Our Giscard said, I have brought the book films you wish to see, sir, and the viewer. Well, put them down, put them down. And you needn't stay. Daniil will be here with me. Yes, sir. The robot's eyes, faintly glowing, Bailey noticed, as Daniil's were not, 
turned briefly to Ardeniel, as though seeking orders from a superior being. Ardeniel said quietly, It will be appropriate, friend Giscard, to remain just outside the door. I shall, friend Daniel, said R. Giscard. It left, and Bailey said with some discontent, Why does it have to stay just outside the door? Am I a prisoner? In the sense, said R. Daniel, that it would not be permitted for you to mingle with the ship's company in the course of this voyage, I regret to be forced to say you are indeed a prisoner. Yet that is not the reason for the presence of Giscard. And I should tell you at this point that it might well be advisable, partner Elijah, if you did not address Giscard or any robot as boy. Bailey frowned. Does it resent the expression? Giscard does not resent any action of a human being. It is simply that boy is not a customary term of address for robots on Aurora, and it would be inadvisable to create friction with the Aurorans by unintentionally stressing your place of origin through habits of speech that are non-essential. Well, how do I address it, then? As you address me, by the use of his accepted identifying name. That is, after all, merely a sound indicating the particular person you are addressing, and why should one sound be preferable to another? It is merely a matter of convention, and it is also the custom on Aurora to refer to a robot as he, or sometimes she, rather than as it. Then, too, it is not the custom on Aurora to use the initial R, except under formal conditions, where the entire name of the robot is appropriate, and even then, the initial is nowadays often left out. Well, in that case, Daniil, Bailey repressed the sudden impulse to say, R. Daniil, how do you distinguish between robots and human beings? The distinction is usually self-evident, partner Elijah. There would seem to be no need to emphasize it unnecessarily. At least, that is the Aurora in view, and, since you have asked Giscard for films on Aurora, I assume you wish to familiarize yourself with things Auroran as an aid to the task you have undertaken. The task which has been dumped on me, yes. And what if the distinction between robot and human being is not self-evident, Daniil, as in your case? Then why make the distinction, unless the situation is such that it is essential to make it? Bailey took a deep breath. It was going to be difficult to adjust to this auroran pretense that robots did not exist. He said, But then if Giscard is not here to keep me prisoner, why is it he outside the door? Those are according to the instructions of Dr. Fastolf, partner Elijah. Giscard is to protect you. Protect me? Against what or against whom? Dr. Fastolf was not precise on that point, partner Elijah. Still, as human passions are running high over the matter of gender panel, gender panel, the robot whose usefulness was terminated. The robot, in other words, who was killed. Killed, partner Elijah, is a term that is usually applied to human beings. But on Aurora, distinctions between robots and human beings are avoided, are they not? So they are. Nevertheless, the possibility of distinction or lack of distinction in the particular case of the ending of functioning has never arisen, to my knowledge. I do not know what the rules are. Bailey pondered the matter. It was a point of no real importance, purely a matter of semantics. Still, he wanted to probe the manner of thinking of the Aurorans. He would get nowhere otherwise. He said slowly, a human being who is functioning is alive. If that life is violently ended by the deliberate action of another human being, we call that murder or homicide. Murder is somehow the stronger word. To be witness suddenly to an attempted violent end to the life of a human being, one would shout murder. It is not at all likely that one would shout homicide. It is the more formal word, the less emotional word. R. Daniil said, I do not understand the distinction you are making, partner Elijah. Since murder and homicide are both used to represent the violent ending of the life of a human being, the two words must be interchangeable. Where, then, is the distinction? Well, of the two words, one screamed out will more effectively chill the blood of a human being than the other will, Daniil. 
Why is that? Connotations and associations, the subtle effect, not of dictionary meaning, but of years of usage, the nature of the sentences and conditions and events in which one has experienced the use of one word as compared with that of the other. There is nothing of this in my programming, said Daniil with a curious sound of helplessness hovering over the apparent lack of emotion with which he said this, the same lack of emotion with which he said everything. Bailey said, Will you accept my word for it, Daniil? Quickly, Daniil said, almost as though he had just been presented with the solution to a puzzle, without doubt. Now then, we might say that a robot that is functioning is alive, said Bailey. Many might refuse to broaden the word so far, but we are free to devise definitions to suit ourselves if it is useful. It is easy to treat a functioning robot as alive, and it would be unnecessarily complicated to try to invent a new word for the condition or to avoid the use of the familiar one. You are alive, for instance, Daniil, aren't you? Daniil said, slowly and with emphasis, I am functioning. Come, if a squirrel is alive, or a bug, or a tree, or a blade of grass, why not you? I would never remember to say or to think that I am alive, but that you are merely functioning, especially if I am to live for a while on Aurora, where I am to try not to make unnecessary distinctions between a robot and myself. Therefore, I tell you that we are both alive, and I ask you to take my word for it. I will do so, partner Elijah. And yet, can we say that the ending of robotic life by the deliberate violent action of a human being is also murder? We might hesitate. If the crime is the same, the punishment should be the same. But would that be right? If the punishment of the murder of a human being is death, should one actually execute a human being who puts an end to a robot? The punishment of a murderer is psychic probing, partner Elijah followed by the construction of a new personality. It is the personal structure of the mind that has committed the crime, not the life of the body. And what is the punishment on Aurora for putting a violent end to the functioning of a robot? I do not know, partner Elijah. Such an incident has never occurred on Aurora, as far as I know. I suspect the punishment would not be psychic probing, said Bailey. How about roboticide? Roboticide, as the term used to describe the killing of a robot. Daniil said, But what about the verb derived from the noun? Partner Elijah, one never says to homicide, and it would therefore not be proper to say to roboticide. You're right. You would have to say to murder in each case. But murder applies specifically to human beings. One does not murder an animal, for instance. Bailey said, True, and one does not murder even a human being by accident, only by deliberate intent. The more general term is to kill. That applies to accidental death as well as to deliberate murder, and it applies to animals as well as human beings. Even a tree may be killed by disease, so why may not a robot be killed, eh, Daniil? Human beings and other animals and plants as well, partner Elijah, are all living things, said Daniil. A robot is a human artifact, as much as this viewer is. An artifact is destroyed, damaged, demolished, and so on. It is never killed. Nevertheless, Daniil, I shall say killed. Jander Pennell was killed. Daniil said, Why should a difference in a word make any difference to the thing described? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Is that it, Daniil? Daniil paused, then said, I am not certain what is meant by the smell of a rose, but if a rose on earth is the common flower that is called a rose on aurora, and if by its smell you mean a property that can be detected, sensed, or measured by human beings, then surely calling a rose by another sound combination, and holding all else equal, would not affect the smell or any other of its intrinsic properties. True. And yet changes in name do result in changes in perception where human beings are concerned. I do not see why, partner Elijah. Because human beings are often illogical, Daniil. It is not an admirable characteristic. 
Bailey sank deeper into his chair and fiddled with his viewer, allowing his mind for a few minutes to retreat into private thought. The discussion with Daniil was useful in itself, for while Bailey played with the question of words, he managed to forget that he was in space, to forget that the ship was moving forward until it was far enough from the mass centers of the solar system to make the jump through hyperspace, to forget that he would soon be several million kilometers from Earth and, not long after that, several light years from Earth. More important, there were positive conclusions to be drawn. It was clear that Daniil's talk about Aurorans making no distinction between robots and human beings was misleading. The Aurorans might virtuously remove the initial R, the use of boy as a form of address, and the use of it as the customary pronoun. But from Daniil's resistance to the use of the same word for the violent ends of a robot and of a human being, a resistance inherent in his programming, which was in turn the natural consequence of Auroran assumptions about how Daniil ought to behave, one had to conclude that these were merely superficial changes. In essence, Aurorans were as firm as Earthmen in their belief that robots were machines that were infinitely inferior to human beings. That meant that his formidable task of finding a useful resolution of the crisis, if that were possible at all, would not be hampered by at least one particular misperception of Auroran society. Bailey wondered if he ought to question Giscard in order to confirm the conclusions he reached from his conversation with Daniil and, without much hesitation, decided not to. Giscard's simple and rather unsubtle mind would be of no use. He would, yes, sir, and no, sir, to the end. It would be like questioning a recording. Well, then, Bailey decided, he would continue with Daniil, who was at least capable of responding with something approaching subtlety. He said, Daniil, let us consider the case of Jander Pinnell, which I assume from what you have said so far is the first case of roboticide in the history of Aurora. The human being responsible, the killer, is, I take it, not known? If, said Daniil, one assumes that a human being was responsible, then his identity is not known. In that you are right, partner Elijah. What about the motive? Why was Jander Pinnell killed? That, too, is not known. But Jander Pinnell was a humaniform robot, one like yourself, and not one like, for instance, Argus, I mean, Giscard. That is so. Jander was a humaniform robot like myself. Might it not be, then, that no case of roboticide was intended? I do not understand, partner Elijah. Bailey said, a little impatiently, might not the killer have thought this gender was a human being, that the intention was homicide, not roboticide? Slowly, Daniil shook his head. Humaniform robots are quite like human beings in appearance, partner Elijah, down to the hairs and pores in our skin. Our voices are thoroughly natural. We can go through the motions of eating and so on. And yet, in our behavior, there are noticeable differences. There may be fewer such differences with time and with refinement of technique, but as yet they are many. You and other Earthmen not used to humaniform robots may not easily note these differences, but Aurorans would. No Auroran would mistake gender, or me, for a human being, not for a moment. Well, might some spacer other than an Auroran make the mistake? Daniil hesitated. I do not think so. I do not speak from personal observation or from direct programmed knowledge, but I do have the programming to know that all spacer worlds are as intimately acquainted with robots as Aurora is, some, like Solaria, even more so, and I deduce, therefore, that no spacer would miss the distinction between human and robot. Are there humaniform robots on the other spacer worlds? No, partner Elisha. They exist only on Aurora so far then other spacers would not be intimately acquainted with humaniform robots and might well miss the distinctions and mistake them for human beings. I do not think that is likely. Even humaniform robots will behave in robotic fashion in certain definite ways that any spacer would recognize. 
and yet surely there are spacers who are not as intelligent as most, not as experienced, not as mature. There are spacer children, if nothing else, who would miss the distinction. It is quite certain, partner Elijah, that the roboticide was not committed by anyone unintelligent, inexperienced, or young. Completely certain. We're making eliminations. Good. If no spacer would miss the distinction, what about an Earthman? Is it possible that... Partner Elijah, when you arrive in Aurora, you will be the first Earthman to set foot on the planet since the period of original settlement was over. All Aurorans now alive were born on Aurora, or, in a relatively few cases, on other spacer worlds. The first Earthman, muttered Bailey. I am honored. Might not an Earthman be present on Aurora without the knowledge of Aurorans? No, said Daniil, with simple certainty. Your knowledge, Daniil, might not be absolute. No, came the repetition, in tones precisely similar to the first. We conclude, then, said Bailey with a shrug, that the roboticide was intended to be roboticide and nothing else. That was the conclusion from the start. Bailey said, Those Aurorans who concluded this at the start had all the information to begin with. I am getting it now for the first time. My remark, partner Elijah, was not meant in any pejorative manner. I know better than to belittle your abilities. Well, thank you, Daniil. I know there was no intended sneer in your remark. You said just a while ago that the roboticide was not committed by anyone unintelligent, inexperienced, or young, and that this is completely certain. Let us consider your remark. Bailey knew that he was taking the long route. He had to. Considering his lack of understanding of Auroran ways and of their manner of thought, he could not afford to make assumptions and skip steps. If he were dealing with an intelligent human being in this way, that person would be likely to grow impatient and blurt out information and consider Bailey an idiot into the bargain. Daniil, however, as a robot, would follow Bailey down the winding road with total patience. That was one type of behavior that gave away Daniil as a robot, however humaniform he might be. An Auroran might be able to judge him a robot from a single answer to a single question. Daniil was right as to the subtle distinctions. Bailey said, One might eliminate children, perhaps also most women, and many male adults by presuming that the method of roboticide involved great strength, that Jander's head was perhaps crushed by a violent blow, or that his chest was smashed inward, this would not, I imagine, be easy for anyone who is not a particularly large and strong human being. From what Demichek had said on Earth, Bailey knew that this was not the manner of the roboticide. But how was he to tell that Demichek herself had not been misled? Daniil said, It would not be possible at all for any human being. Why not? Surely, partner Elijah, you are aware that the robotic skeleton is metallic in nature and much stronger than human bone. Our movements are more strongly powered, faster, and more delicately controlled. The third law of robotics states, A robot must protect its own existence. An assault by a human being could easily be fended off. The strongest human being could be immobilized. Nor is it likely that a robot can be caught unaware. We are always aware of human beings. We could not fulfill our functions otherwise. Bailey said, Come now, Daniil. The third law states a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. The second law states a robot must obey the orders given it by a human being except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the first law states a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. A human being could order a robot to destroy himself, and a robot would then use his own strength to smash his own skull. And if a human being attacked a robot, that robot could not fend off the attack without harming the human being, which would violate first law. Daniil said, You are, I suppose, thinking of Earth's robots. On Aurora, or on any of the spacer worlds, robots are regarded more highly than on Earth, and are, in general, more complex, versatile, and valuable. 
The third law is distinctly stronger in comparison to the second law on space or worlds than it is on Earth. An order for self-destruction would be questioned, and there would have to be a truly legitimate reason for it to be carried through, a clear and present danger. And, in fending off an attack, the first law would not be violated, for Aurora and robots are deft enough to immobilize a human being without hurting him. Well, suppose, though, that a human being maintained that unless a robot destroyed himself, he, the human being, would be destroyed. Would not the robot then destroy himself? An Auroran robot would surely question a mere statement to that effect. There would have to be clear evidence of the possible destruction of a human being. Might not a human being be sufficiently settled to so arrange matters in such a way as to make it seem to a robot that that human being was indeed in great danger? Is it the ingenuity that would be required that makes you eliminate the unintelligent, inexperienced, and young? And Daniil said, No, partner Elijah, it is not. Is there an error in my reasoning? None. Then the error may lie in my assumption that he was physically damaged. He was not, in actual fact, physically damaged. Is that right? Yes, partner Elijah. That meant Demichek had had her facts straight, Bailey thought. In that case, Daniil, Jander was mentally damaged, roadblock, total and irreversible. Roadblock? Short for a robot block, the permanent shutdown of the functioning of the positronic pathways. We do not use the word roadblock on Aurora, partner Elijah. Well, what do you say? We say mental freeze-out. Either way... It is the same phenomenon being described. It might be wise, partner Elijah, to use our expression, or the Aurorans you speak to may not understand. Conversation may be impeded. You stated a short while ago that different words make a difference. Very well. I will say freeze out. Could such a thing happen spontaneously? Yes, but the chances are infinitesimally small, roboticists say. As a humaniform robot... I can report that I have never myself experienced any effect that could even approach mental freeze-out. Then one must assume that a human being deliberately set up a situation in which mental freeze-out would take place. That is precisely what Dr. Fastolf's opposition contends, partner Elisha. And since this would take robotic training, experience, and skill, the unintelligent, the inexperienced, and the young cannot have been responsible. That is the natural reasoning, partner Elijah. It might even be possible to list the number of human beings on Aurora with sufficient skill and thus set up a group of suspects that might not be very large in number. That has, in actual fact, been done, partner Elijah. And how long is the list? The longest list suggested contains only one name. It was Bailey's turn to pause. His brows drew together in an angry frown, and he said, quite explosively. Only one name? Daniil said quietly, Only one name, partner Elijah. That is the judgment of Dr. Han Fastolf, who is Aurora's greatest theoretical roboticist. But what is then the mystery in all this? Whose is the one name? Our Daniil said, Why, that of Dr. Han Fastolf, of course. I have just stated that he is Aurora's greatest theoretical roboticist and, in Dr. Fastolf's professional opinion, he himself is the only one who could possibly have maneuvered Gender Pennell into total mental freeze-out without leaving any sign of the process. However, Dr. Fastolf also states that he did not do it. But that no one else could have either. Indeed, partner Elijah. There lies the mystery. And what if Dr. Fastolf... Bailey paused... There would be no point in asking Daniil if Dr. Fastolf was lying or was somehow mistaken, either in his own judgment that no one but he could have done it, or in the statement that he himself had not done it. Daniil had been programmed by Fastolf, and there would be no chance that the programming included the ability to doubt the programmer. Bailey said, therefore, with as close an approach to mildness as he could manage, I will think about this, Daniil, and we will talk again. That is well, partner Elijah. It is, in any case, time for sleep. Since it is possible that, on Aurora, 
the pressure of events may force an irregular schedule upon you, it would be wise to seize the opportunity for sleep now. I will show you how one produces a bed and how one manages the bedclothes. Uh, thank you, Daniil, muttered Bailey. He was under no illusion that sleep would come easily. He was being sent to Aurora for the specific purpose of demonstrating that Fastolf was innocent of roboticide, and success in that was required for Earth's continued security and, much less important but equally dear to Bailey's heart, for the continued prospering of Bailey's own career. Yet, even before reaching Aurora, he had discovered that Fastolf had virtually confessed to the crime. 8. Bailey did sleep, eventually, after Daniil demonstrated how to reduce the field intensity that served as a form of pseudo-gravity. This was not true anti-gravity, and it consumed so much energy that the process could only be used at restricted times and under unusual conditions. Daniil was not programmed to be able to explain the manner in which this worked, and if he had, Bailey was quite certain he would not have understood it. Fortunately, the controls could be operated without any understanding of the scientific justification. Daniil said, The field intensity cannot be reduced to zero, at least not by these controls. Sleeping under zero gravity is not, in any case, comfortable, certainly not for those inexperienced in space travel. What one needs is an intensity low enough to give one a feeling of freedom from the pressure of one's own weight, but high enough to maintain an up-down orientation. The level varies with the individual. Most people would feel most comfortable at the minimum intensity allowed by the control, but you might find that, on first use, you would wish a higher intensity, so that you might retain the familiarity of the weight sensation to a somewhat greater extent. Simply experiment with different levels and find the one that suits. Lost in the novelty of the sensation, Bailey found his mind drifting away from the problem of Fastolf's affirmation denial, even as his body drifted away from wakefulness. Perhaps the two were one process. He dreamed he was back on Earth, of course, moving along an expressway, but not in one of the seats. Rather, he was floating along beside the high-speed strip, just over the head of the moving people, gaining on them slightly. None of the ground-bound people seemed surprised. None looked up at him. It was a rather pleasant sensation, and he missed it upon waking. After breakfast the following morning, was it morning, actually? Could it be morning, or any other time of day, in space? Clearly it couldn't. He thought a while and decided he would define morning as the time after waking, and he would define breakfast as the meal eaten after waking, and abandon specific timekeeping as objectively unimportant. For him, at least, if not for the ship. After breakfast, then, the following morning, he studied the news sheets offered him only long enough to see that they said nothing about the roboticide on Aurora, and then turned to those book films that had been brought to him the previous day, Wake Period, by Giscard. He chose those whose titles sounded historical, and after viewing through several hastily, he decided that Giscard had brought him books for adolescents. They were heavily illustrated and simply written. He wondered if that was Giscard's estimate of Bailey's intelligence, or perhaps of his needs. After some thought, Bailey decided that Giscard, in his robotic innocence, had chosen well and that there was no point in brooding over a possible insult. He settled down to viewing with greater concentration and noted at once that Daniil was viewing the book film with him. Actual curiosity, or just to keep his eyes occupied? Daniil did not once ask to have a page repeated, nor did he stop to ask a question. Presumably he merely accepted what he read with robotic trust and did not permit himself the luxury of either doubt or curiosity. Bailey did not ask Daniil any questions concerning what he read, though he did ask for instructions on the operation of the printout mechanism of the Auroran viewer, with which he was not familiar. Occasionally Bailey stopped to make use of the small room that adjoined his room and could be used for the various private physiological functions so private that the room was referred to as the personal, 
with the capital letter always understood, both on Earth and, as Bailey discovered when Daniil referred to it, on Aurora. It was just large enough for one person, which made it bewildering to a city dweller accustomed to huge banks of urinals, excretory seats, wash basins, and showers. In viewing the book films, Bailey did not attempt to memorize details. He had no intention of becoming an expert on a roaring society, nor even of passing a high school test on the subject. Rather, he wished to get the feel of it. He noticed, for instance, even through the hagiographic attitude of historians writing for young people, that the Auroran pioneers, the founding fathers, the earth people who had first come to Aurora to settle in the early days of interstellar travel, had been very much earth people. Their politics, their quarrels, every facet of their behavior had been earthish. What happened on Aurora was, in ways, similar to the events that took place when the relatively empty sections of earth had been settled a couple of thousand years before. Of course, the Aurorans had no intelligent life to encounter and to fight, no thinking organisms to puzzle the invaders from Earth with questions of treatment, humane or cruel. There was precious little life of any kind, in fact, so the planet was quickly settled by human beings, by their domesticated plants and animals, and by the parasites and other organisms that were adventitiously brought along. And, of course... The settlers brought robots with them. The first Aurorans quickly felt the planet to be theirs, since it fell into their laps with no sense of competition, and they had called the planet New Earth to begin with. That was natural, since it was the first extrasolar planet, the first spacer world to be settled. It was the first fruit of interstellar travel, the first dawn of an immense new era, they quickly cut the umbilical cord, however, and renamed the planet Aurora after the Roman goddess of the dawn. It was the world of the dawn, and so did the settlers from the start self-consciously declare themselves the progenitors of a new kind. All previous history of humanity was a dark night, and only for the Aurorans on this new world was the day finally approaching. It was this great fact, this great self-praise, that made itself felt over all the details, all the names, dates, winners, losers. It was the essential. Other worlds were settled, some from Earth, some from Aurora, but Bailey paid no attention to that or to any of the details. He was after the broad brushstrokes, and he noted the two massive changes that took place and pushed the Aurorans ever farther away from their earthly origins. These were, first, the increasing integration of robots into every facet of life, and second, the extension of the lifespan. As the robots grew more advanced and versatile, the Aurorans grew more dependent on them, but never helplessly so. Not like the world of Solaria, Bailey remembered, on which a very few human beings were in the collective womb of very many robots. Aurora was not like that. And yet, they grew more dependent. Viewing as he did for intuitive feel, for trend and generality, every step in the course of human-robot interaction seemed to depend on dependence. Even the manner in which a consensus of robotic rights was reached, the gradual dropping of what Daniil would call unnecessary distinctions, was a sign of the dependence. To Bailey, it seemed not that the Aurorans were growing more humane in their attitude out of a liking for the humane, but that they were denying the robotic nature of the objects in order to remove the discomfort of having to recognize the fact that human beings were dependent upon objects of artificial intelligence. As for the extended lifespan, that was accompanied by a slowing of the pace of history. The peaks and troughs smoothed out. There was a growing continuity and a growing consensus. There was no question but that the history he was viewing grew less interesting as it went along. It became almost soporific. For those living through it, this had to be good. History was interesting to the extent that it was catastrophic, and while that might make absorbing viewing, it made horrible living. Undoubtedly, personal lives continued to be interesting for the vast majority of Aurorans, and if the collective interaction of lives grew quiet, who would mind? 
If the world of the dawn had a quiet, sunlit day, who on that world would clamor for storm? Somewhere in the course of his viewing, Bailey felt an indescribable sensation. If he had been forced to attempt a description, he would have said it was that of a momentary inversion. It was as though he had been turned inside out, and then back as he had been in the course of a small fraction of a second. So momentary had it been that he almost missed it, ignoring it as though it had been a tiny hiccup inside himself. It was only perhaps a minute later, suddenly going over the feeling in retrospect, that he remembered the sensation as something he had experienced twice before, once when traveling to Solaria and once when returning to Earth from that planet. It was the jump, the passage through hyperspace, that in a timeless, spaceless interval sent the ship across the parsecs and defeated the speed of light limit of the universe. No mystery in words, since the ship merely left the universe and traversed something which involved no speed limit. Total mystery in concept, however, for there was no way of describing what hyperspace was, unless one made use of mathematical symbols which could, in any case, not be translated into anything comprehensible. If one accepted the fact that human beings had learned to manipulate hyperspace without understanding the thing they manipulated, then the effect was clear. At one moment, the ship had been within microparsecs of Earth, and at the next moment, it was within microparsecs of Aurora. Ideally, the jump took zero time, literally zero, and if it were carried through with perfect smoothness, there would not, could not, be any biological sensation at all. Physicists maintained, however, that perfect smoothness required infinite energy, so that there was always an effective time that was not quite zero, though it could be made as short as desired. It was that which produced that odd and essentially harmless feeling of inversion. The sudden realization that he was very far from Earth and very close to Aurora filled Bailey with a desire to see the spacer world. Partly it was the desire to see somewhere people lived, Partly it was a natural curiosity to see something that had been filling his thoughts as a result of the book films he had been viewing. Giscard entered just then with the middle meal between waking and sleeping, call it lunch, and said, We are approaching Aurora, sir, but it will not be possible for you to observe it from the bridge. There would, in any case, be nothing to see. Aurora's sun is merely a bright star, and it will be several days before we are near enough to Aurora itself to see any detail. Then he added, as though an afterthought, It will not be possible for you to observe it from the bridge at that time either. Bailey felt strangely abashed. Apparently it was assumed he would want to observe, and that want was simply squashed. His presence as a viewer was not desired. He said, Very well, Giscard. And the robot left. Bailey looked after him somberly. How many other constraints would be placed on him? Improbable as successful completion of his task was, he wondered in how many different ways Aurorans would conspire to make it impossible. Chapter 3 Giscard 9 Bailey turned and said to Daniil, it annoys me, Daniel, that I must remain a prisoner here because the Aurorans on board this ship fear me as a source of infection. This is pure superstition. I have been treated. Daniel said, It is not because of Auroran fears that you are being asked to remain in your cabin, partner Elijah. No? What other reason? Perhaps you remember that, when we first met on this ship, you asked me my reasons for being sent to escort you. I said it was to give you something familiar as an anchor, and to please me. I was then about to tell you the third reason, when Giscard interrupted us with your viewer and viewing material, and thereafter we launched into a discussion of roboticide. And you never told me the third reason. What is it? Why, partner Elijah, it is merely that I might help protect you. Against what? Unusual passions have been stirred by the incident we have agreed to call roboticide. You are being called to Aurora to help demonstrate Dr. Fastolf's innocence. 
and the hyperwave drama. Gee, Josephat De Niel, said Bailey in outrage. Have they seen that thing on Aurora too? They have seen it throughout the Spacer Worlds, partner Elijah. It was a most popular program and has made it quite plain that you are a most extraordinary investigator. So that whoever might be behind the roboticide may well have exaggerated fears of what I might accomplish and might therefore risk a great deal to prevent my arrival or to kill me. Dr. Fastolf, said Daniil calmly, is quite convinced that no one is behind the roboticide since no human being other than himself could have carried it through. It was a purely fortuitous occurrence in Dr. Fastolf's view. However, there are those who are trying to capitalize on the occurrence, and it would be to their interest to keep you from proving that. For that reason, you must be protected. Bailey took a few hasty steps to one wall of the room and then back to the other, as though to speed his thought processes by physical example. Somehow he did not feel any sense of personal danger. He said, Daniil, how many humaniform robots are there altogether on Aurora? Do you mean now that Jander no longer functions? Yes, now that Jander is dead. One, partner Elijah. Bailey stared at Daniil in shock. Soundlessly, he mouthed the word, one. Finally, he said, let me understand this, Daniil. You are the only humaniform robot on Aurora? Or on any world, partner Elijah. I thought you were aware of this. I was the prototype, and then Jander was constructed. Since then, Dr. Fastolf has refused to construct any more, and no one else has the skill to do it. But in that case, since of two humaniform robots, one has been killed, does it not occur to Dr. Fastolf that the remaining humaniform, you, Daniil, might be in danger? He recognizes the possibility but the chance that the fantastically unlikely occurrence of mental freeze-out would take place a second time is remote. He doesn't take it seriously. He feels, however, that there might be a chance of other misadventure. That, I think, played some small part in his sending me to Earth to get you. It kept me away from Aurora for a week or so. And you are now as much a prisoner as I am, aren't you, Daniil? I am a prisoner said Daniil gravely, only in the sense, partner Elisha, that I am expected not to leave this room. In what other sense is one a prisoner? In the sense that the person so restricted in his movements resents the restriction. A true imprisonment has the implication of being involuntary. I quite understand the reason for being here, and I concur in the necessity. You do, grumbled Bailey. I do not. I am a prisoner in the full sense. And what keeps us safe here, anyway? For one thing, partner Elijah, Giscard is on duty outside. Is he intelligent enough for the job? He understands his orders entirely. He is rugged and strong, and quite realizes the importance of his task. You mean he is prepared to be destroyed to protect the two of us? Yes, of course, just as I am prepared to be destroyed to protect you. Bailey felt abashed. He said, You do not resent the situation in which you may be forced to give up your existence for me? It is my programming, partner Elijah, said Daniil, in a voice that seemed to soften. Yet somehow it seems to me that, even were it not for my programming, saving you makes the loss of my own existence seem quite trivial in comparison. Bailey could not resist this. He held out his hand and closed it on Daniil's with a fierce grip. Thank you, partner Daniil, but please do not allow it to happen. I do not wish the loss of your existence. The preservation of my own would be inadequate compensation, it seems to me. And Bailey was amazed to discover that he really meant it. He was faintly horrified to realize that he would be ready to risk his life for a robot. No, not for a robot. For Daniil. 10. Giscard entered without signaling. Bailey had come to accept that. The robot, as his guard, had to be able to come and go as he pleased. 
and Giscard was only a robot in Bailey's eyes, however much he might be a he, and however much one did not mention the R. If Bailey were scratching himself, picking his nose, engaged in any messy biological function, it seemed to him that Giscard would be indifferent, non-judgmental, incapable of reacting in any way, but coldly recording the observation in some inner memory bank. It made Giscard simply a piece of mobile furniture, and Bailey felt no embarrassment in his presence. Not that Giscard had ever intruded on him at an inconvenient moment, Bailey thought idly. Giscard brought a small cubicle with him. Sir, I suspect you still wish to observe a roar from space. Bailey started. No doubt. Daniil had noted Bailey's irritation and had deduced its cause and taken this way of dealing with it. To have Giscard do it and present it as an idea of his simple-minded own was a touch of delicacy on Daniil's part. It would free Bailey of the necessity of expressing gratitude, or so Daniil would think. Bailey had, as a matter of fact, been more irritated at being, to his way of thinking, needlessly kept from the view of Aurora than at being kept imprisoned generally. He had been fretting over the loss of the view during the two days since the jump. So he turned and said to Daniil, Thank you, my friend. It was Giscard's idea, said Daniil. Yes, of course, said Bailey with a small smile. I thank him, too. What is this, Giscard? It is an astro simulator, sir. It works essentially like a trimensional receiver and is connected to the view room. If I might add... Yes? You will not find the view particularly exciting, sir. I would not wish you to be unnecessarily disappointed. I will try not to expect too much, Giscard. In any case, I will not hold you responsible for any disappointment I might feel. Thank you, sir. I must return to my post, but Daniil will be able to help you with the instrument if any problem arises. He left, and Bailey turned to Daniil with approval. Giscard handled that very well, I thought. He may be a simple model, but he's well designed. He, too, is a fast-off robot, partner Elijah. This astro simulator is self-contained and self-adjusted. Since it is already focused on Aurora, it is only necessary to touch the control edge. That will put it in operation, and you need do nothing more. Would you care to set it going yourself? Bailey shrugged. No need. You may do it. Very well. Daniil had placed the cubicle upon the table on which Bailey had done his book film viewing. This, he said, indicating a small rectangle in his hand, is the control, partner Elijah. You need only hold it by the edges in this manner, and then exert a small inward pressure to turn the mechanism on, and then another to turn it off. Daniil pressed the control edge, and Bailey shouted in a strangled way. Bailey had expected the cubicle to light up and to display within itself a holographic representation of a star field. That was not what happened. Instead, Bailey found himself in space, in space, with bright, unblinking stars in all directions. It lasted for only a moment, and then everything was back as it was, the room, and within it, Bailey, Daniil, and the cubicle. My regrets, partner Elijah, said Daniil. I turned it off as soon as I understood your discomfort. I did not realize you were not prepared for the event. Then prepare me. What happened? The astro simulator works directly on the visual center of the human brain. There is no way of distinguishing the impression it leaves from three-dimensional reality. It is a comparatively recent device, and so far it has been used only for astronomical scenes which are, after all, low in detail. Did you see it too, Daniil? Yes, but very poorly and without the realism a human being experiences. I see the dim outline of a scene superimposed upon the still clear contents of the room, but it has been explained to me that human beings see the scene only. Undoubtedly, when the brains of those such as myself are still more finely tuned and adjusted, Bailey had recovered his equilibrium. Well, the point is, Daniil, that I was aware of nothing else. I was not aware of myself. I did not see my hands or sense where they were. I felt as though I were a 
disembodied spirit or as I imagine I would feel if I were dead but were consciously existing in some sort of immaterial afterlife. I see now why you would find that rather disturbing. Actually, I found it very disturbing. My regrets, partner Elisha. I shall have Giscard take this away. No, I, I'm prepared now. Let me have that cube. Will I be able to turn it off, even though I am not conscious of the existence of my hands? It will cling to your hand, so that you will not drop it, partner Elisha. I have been told by Dr. Fastolf, who has experienced this phenomenon, that the pressure is automatically applied when the human being holding it wills an end. It is an automatic phenomenon based on nerve manipulation, as the vision itself is. At least, that is how it works with aurorans, and I imagine that Earthmen are sufficiently similar to aurorans physiologically for it to work with us as well. Very well. Give me the control and I will try. With a slight internal wince, Bailey squeezed the control edge and was in space again. He was expecting it this time, and once he found he could breathe without difficulty and did not feel in any way as though he were immersed in a vacuum, he labored to accept it all as a visual illusion, breathing rather stertorously, perhaps to convince himself he was actually breathing, he stared about curiously in all directions. Suddenly aware he was hearing his breath rasp in his nose, he said, Can you hear me, Daniil? He heard his own voice, a little distant, a little artificial, but he heard it. And then he heard Daniil's, different enough to be distinguishable. Yes, I can, said Daniil. And you should be able to hear me, partner Elijah. The visual and kinesthetic senses are interfered with for the sake of a greater illusion of reality, but the auditory sense remains untouched. Largely so, at any rate. Well, I see only stars, ordinary stars, that is. Aurora has a sun. We are close enough to Aurora, I imagine, to make the star that is its sun considerably brighter than the others. Entirely too bright, partner Elijah. It is blanked out, or you might suffer retinal damage. Then where is the planet Aurora? Do you see the constellation of Orion? Yes, I do. What, do you mean we still see the constellations as we see them in Earth's sky, as in the city planetarium? Just about. As stellar distances go, we are not far from Earth and the solar system of which it is part, so that they have the star view in common. Aurora's sun is known as Tau Ceti on Earth and is only 3.67 parsecs from there. Now, if you'll imagine a line from Betelgeuse to the middle star of Orion's belt and continue it for an equal length and a bit more, the middling bright star you see is actually the planet Aurora. It will become increasingly unmistakable over the next few days as we approach it rapidly. Bailey regarded it gravely. It was just a bright, star-like object. There was no luminous arrow going on and off, pointing to it. There was no carefully lettered inscription arced over it. He said, Where's the sun, Earth's star, I mean? It's in the constellation Virgo, as seen from Aurora. It is a second-magnitude star. Unfortunately, the astro-simulator we have is not properly computerized, and it would not be easy to point it out to you. It would, in any case, just appear to be a star, quite an ordinary one. Uh, never mind, said Bailey. I'm going to turn off this thing now. If I have trouble, help out. He didn't have trouble. It flicked off just as he thought of doing so, and he sat blinking in the suddenly harsh light of the room. It was only then, when he had returned to his normal senses, that it occurred to him that for some minutes he had seemed to himself to have been out in space, without a protecting wall of any kind, and yet his earthly agoraphobia had not been activated. He had been perfectly comfortable once he had accepted his own non-existence. The thought puzzled him and distracted him from his book film viewing for a while. Periodically, he returned to the astro simulator and took another look at space as seen from a vantage point just outside the spaceship, with himself nowhere present, apparently. Sometimes it was just for a moment to reassure himself that he was still not made uneasy by the infinite void. 
Sometimes he found himself lost in the pattern of the stars, and he began lazily counting them or forming geometrical figures, rather luxuriating in the ability to do something which, on Earth, he would never have been able to do because the mounting agoraphobic uneasiness would quickly have overwhelmed everything else. Eventually, it grew quite obvious that Aurora was brightening. It soon became easy to detect among the other dots of light, then unmistakable, and finally unavoidable. It began as a tiny sliver of light, and thereafter it enlarged rapidly and began to show phases. It was almost precisely a half-circle of light when Bailey became aware of the existence of phases. Bailey inquired, and Daniil said, We are approaching from outside the orbital plane, partner Elijah. Aurora's south pole is more or less in the center of its disk, somewhat into the lighted half. It is spring in the southern hemisphere. Bailey said, According to the material I have been reading, Aurora's axis is tipped 16 degrees. He had glanced over the physical description of the planet with insufficient attention in his anxiety to get to the Aurorans, but he remembered that. Yes, partner Elijah. Eventually, we will move into orbit about Aurora, and the phases will then change rapidly. Aurora revolves more rapidly than Earth does. It has a 22-hour day, yes. A day of 22.3 traditional hours. The Auroran day is divided into 10 Auroran hours, with each hour divided into 100 Auroran minutes, which are in turn divided into 100 Auroran seconds. An Auroran second is thus roughly equal to 0.8 Earth seconds. Is that what the books mean when they refer to metric hours, metric minutes, and so on? Yes. It was difficult to persuade the Aurorans at first to abandon the time units to which they were accustomed, and both systems, the standard and the metric, were in use. Eventually, of course, the metric won out. At present, we speak only of hours, minutes, and seconds, but the decimalized versions are invariably meant. The same system has been adopted throughout the spacer worlds, even though on the other worlds it does not tie in with the natural rotation of the planet. Each planet also uses a local system, of course. As Earth does. Yes, partner Elijah. But Earth uses only the original standard time units. That inconveniences the spacer worlds where trade is concerned, but they allow Earth to go its way in this. Not out of friendliness, I imagine. I suspect they wish to emphasize Earth's difference. How does decimalization fit in with the year? After all, Aurora must have a natural period of revolution about its sun that controls the cycle of its seasons. How is that measured? Daniil said, Aurora revolves about its sun in 373.5 Auroran days, or in about 0.95 Earth years. That is not considered a vital matter in chronology. Aurora accepts 30 of its days as equaling a month and 10 months as equaling a metric year. The metric year is equal to about 0.8 seasonal years or about three-quarters of an Earth year. The relationship is different on each world, of course. Ten days is usually referred to as a decimonth. All the spacer worlds use this system. Well, surely there must be some convenient way of following the cycle of the seasons. Each world has its seasonal year, too, but it is little regarded. One can, by computer, convert any day, past or present, into its position in the seasonal year if, for any reason, such information is desired. And this is true on any world where conversion to and from the local days is also as easily possible. And, of course, partner Elijah, any robot can do the same and can guide human activity where the seasonal year or local time is relevant. The advantage of metricized units is that it supplies humanity with a unified chronometry that involves little more than decimal point shifts. It bothered Bailey that the books he viewed made none of this clear. But then, from his own knowledge of Earth's history, he knew that at one time the lunar month had been the key to the calendar and that there had come a time when, for ease of chronometry, the lunar month came to be ignored and was never missed. Yet if he had given books on Earth to some stranger, that stranger would have likely found no mention of the lunar month 
or any historical change in calendars. Dates would have been given without explanation. What else would be given without explanation? How far could he rely, then, on the knowledge he was gaining? He would have to ask questions constantly, take nothing for granted. There would be so many opportunities to miss the obvious, so many chances to misunderstand, so many ways of taking the wrong path. 11. Aurora filled his vision now when he used the astro simulator, and it looked like Earth. Bailey had never seen Earth in the same way, but there had been photographs in astronomy texts, and he had seen those. Well, what Bailey saw on Aurora were the same cloud patterns, the same glimpse of desert areas, the same large stretches of day and night, the same pattern of twinkling light in the expanse of the night hemisphere as the photographs showed on Earth's globe. Bailey watched raptly and thought, what if, for some reason, he had been taken into space, told he was being brought to Aurora, and was in reality being returned to Earth for some reason, for some subtle and insane reason. How could he tell the difference before landing? Was there reason to be suspicious? Daniil had carefully told him that the constellations were the same in the sky of both planets, but wouldn't that be naturally so for planets circling neighboring stars? The gross appearance of both planets from space was identical, but wouldn't that be expected if both were habitable and comfortably suited to human life? Was there any reason to suppose such a far-fetched deception would be played upon him? What purpose would it serve? And yet, why shouldn't it be made to appear far-fetched and useless? If there were an obvious reason to do such a thing, he would have seen through it at once. Would Daniil be party to such a conspiracy? Surely not, if he were a human being, but he was only a robot. Might there not be a way to order him to behave appropriately? There was no way of coming to a decision. Bailey found himself watching for glimpses of continental outlines that he could recognize as earthly or as non-earthly. That would be the telling test, except that it didn't work. The glimpses that came and went hazily through the clouds were of no use to him. He was not sufficiently knowledgeable about Earth's geography. What he really knew of Earth were its underground cities, its caves of steel. The bits of coastline he saw were unfamiliar to him. Whether Aurora or Earth, he did not know. Why this uncertainty, anyway? When he had gone to Solaria, he had never doubted his destination. He had never suspected that they might be bringing him back to Earth. Ah, but then he had gone on a clear-cut mission in which there was reasonable chance for success. Now, he felt, there was no chance at all. Perhaps it was, then, that he wanted to be returned to Earth and was building a false conspiracy in his mind so that he could imagine it possible. The uncertainty in his mind had come to have a life of its own. He couldn't let go. He found himself watching Aurora with an almost mad intensity, unable to come back to the cabin reality. Aurora was moving, turning slowly. He had watched long enough to see that. While he had been viewing space, everything had seemed motionless, like a painted backdrop, a silent and static pattern of dots of light, with, later on, a small half-circle included. Was it the motionlessness that had enabled him to be non-agoraphobic? But now he could see Aurora moving, and he realized that the ship was spiraling down in the final stage before landing. The clouds were bellying upward. No, not the clouds. The ship was spiraling downward. The ship was moving. He was moving. He was suddenly aware of his own existence, he was hurtling downward through the clouds. He was falling, unguarded, through thin air towards solid ground. His throat constricted. It was becoming very hard to breathe. He told himself desperately, You are enclosed. The walls of the ship are around you. But he sensed no walls. He thought, 
Even without considering the walls, you are still enclosed. You are wrapped in skin. But he sensed no skin. The sensation was worse than simple nakedness. He was an unaccompanied personality, the essence of identity totally uncovered, a living point, a singularity surrounded by an open and infinite world. And he was falling. He wanted to close off the vision, contract his fist upon the control edge, but nothing happened. His nerve endings had so abnormalized that the automatic contraction at an effort of will did not work. He had no will. Eyes would not close. Fist would not contract. He was caught and hypnotized by terror, frightened into immobility. All he sensed before him were clouds, white, not quite white, off-white, a slight golden orange cast. And all turned to gray, and he was drowning. He could not breathe. He struggled desperately to open his clogged throat, to call to Daniil for help. He could make no sound. Twelve. Bailey was breathing as though he had just breasted the tape at the end of a long race. The room was askew, and there was a hard surface under his left elbow. He realized he was on the floor. Giscard was on his knees beside him, his robot's hand, firm but somewhat cold, closed on Bailey's right fist. The door to the cabin, visible to Bailey just beyond Giscard's shoulder, stood ajar. Bailey knew without asking what had happened. Giscard had seized that helpless human hand and clenched it upon the control edge to end the astro simulation. Otherwise, Daniil was there as well, his face close to Bailey's, with a look on it that might well have been pain. He said, You said nothing, partner Elijah. Had I been more quickly aware of your discomfort? Bailey tried to gesture that he understood, that it did not matter. He was still unable to speak. The two robots waited until Bailey made a feeble movement to get up. Arms were under him at once, lifting him. He was placed in a chair and the control was gently taken away from him by Giscard. Giscard said, We will be landing soon. You will have no further need of the astro simulator, I believe. Daniil added gravely, It would be best to remove it in any case. Bailey said, Wait. His voice was a hoarse whisper, and he was not sure the word could be made out. He drew a deep breath, cleared his throat feebly, and said again, Wait. And then, Giscard. Giscard turned back. Sir? Bailey did not speak at once. Now that Giscard knew he was wanted, he would wait a lengthy interval, perhaps indefinitely. Bailey tried to gather his scattered wits. Agoraphobia or not, there still remained his uncertainty about their destination. That had existed first, and it might well have intensified the agoraphobia. He had to find out. Giscard would not lie. A robot could not lie unless very carefully instructed to do so. And why instruct Giscard? It was Daniil who was his companion, who was to be in his company at all times. If there was lying to be done, that would be Daniil's job. Giscard was merely a fetcher and carrier, a guard at the door. Surely there was no need to undergo the task of carefully instructing him in the web of lies. Giscard, said Bailey, almost normally now. Sir, we are about to land, are we? In a little less than two hours, sir. That was two metric hours, thought Bailey. More than two real hours, less? It didn't matter, it would only confuse, forget it. Bailey said, as sharply as he could manage, Tell me right now the name of the planet we are about to land on. A human being, if he had answered at all, would have done so only after a pause, and then with an air of considerable surprise. Giscard answered at once, with a flat and uninflected assertion, It is Aurora, sir. How do you know? It is our destination. Then, too, it could not be Earth, for instance, since Aurora's son, Tau Ceti, is only 90% the mass of Earth's sun. Tau Ceti is a little cooler, therefore, and its light has a distinct orange tinge to fresh and unaccustomed Earth eyes. 
You may have already seen the characteristic color of Aurora's sun in the reflection upon the upper surface of the cloud bank. You will certainly see it in the appearance of the landscape, until your eyes grow accustomed to it. Bailey's eyes left Giscard's impassive face. He had noticed the color difference, Bailey thought, and had attached no importance to it. A bad error. You may go, Giscard. Yes, sir. Bailey turned bitterly to Daniil. I've made a fool of myself, Daniil. I gather you wondered if perhaps we were deceiving you and taking you somewhere that was not Aurora. Did you have a reason for suspecting this, partner Elijah? Uh, none. It may have been the result of the uneasiness that arose from subliminal agoraphobia. Staring at seemingly motionless space, I felt no perceptible illness, but it may have lain just under the surface, creating a gathering uneasiness. The fault was ours, partner Elijah. Knowing of your dislike for open spaces, it was wrong to subject you to astro simulation, or, having done so, to subject you to no closer supervision. Bailey shook his head in annoyance. Uh, don't say that, Daniil. I have supervision enough. The question in my mind is how closely I am to be supervised on Aurora itself. Daniil said, Partner Elijah, it seems to me it will be difficult to allow you free access to Aurora and Aurorans. That is just what I must be allowed, nevertheless. If I am to get to the truth of this case of roboticide, I must be free to seek information directly on the site and from the people involved. Bailey was by now feeling quite himself, though a bit weary, Embarrassingly enough, the intense experience he had passed through left him with a keen desire for a pipe of tobacco, something he thought he had done away with altogether better than a year before. He could feel the taste and odor of the tobacco smoke making its way through his throat and nose. He would, he knew, have to make do with the memory. On Aurora, he would on no account be allowed to smoke. There was no tobacco on any of the spacer worlds, and if he had had any on him to begin with, it would have been removed and destroyed. Daniil said, Partner Elijah, this must be discussed with Dr. Fastolf once we land. I have no power to make any decisions in this matter. I'm aware of that, Daniil, but how do I speak to Fastolf? Through the equivalent of an astro simulator, with controls in my hand? Not at all, Partner Elijah. You will speak face to face. He plans to meet you at the spaceport. 13. Bailey listened for the noises of landing. He did not know what they might be, of course. He did not know the mechanism of the ship, how many men and women it carried, what they would have to do in the process of landing, what in the way of noise would be involved. Shouts, rumbles, a dim vibration. He heard nothing. Daniil said, you seem to be under tension, partner Elijah. I would prefer that you did not wait to tell me of any discomfort you might feel. I must help you at the very moment you are, for any reason, unhappy. There was a faint stress on the word must. Bailey thought absently. The first law drives him. He surely suffered as much in his way as I suffered in mine when I collapsed and he did not foresee it in time. A forbidden imbalance of positronic potentials may have no meaning to me, but it may produce in him the same discomfort and the same reaction as acute pain would to me. He thought further, How can I tell what exists inside the pseudo-skin and pseudo-consciousness of a robot any more than Daniil can tell what exists inside me? And then, feeling remorse at having thought of Daniil as a robot, Bailey looked into the other's gentle eyes. When did he start thinking of their expression as gentle? And said, I would tell you of any discomfort at once. There is none. I am merely trying to hear any noise that might tell me of the progress of the landing procedure, partner Daniil. Thank you, partner Elijah, said Daniil gravely. He bowed his head slightly and went on. There should be no discomfort in the landing. You will feel acceleration, but that will be minimal for this room will yield, to a certain extent, in the direction of the acceleration. The temperature may go up, but not more than two degrees Celsius. As for sonic effects, there may be a low hiss as we pass through the thickening atmosphere. Will any of this disturb you? Well, it shouldn't. 
What does disturb me is not being free to participate in the landing. I would like to know about such things. I do not want to be imprisoned and to be kept from the experience. You have already discovered, partner Elijah, that the nature of the experience does not suit your temperament. And how am I to get over that, Daniil? He said strenuously. That is not enough reason to keep me here. Partner Elijah, I have already explained that you are kept here for your own safety. Bailey shook his head in clear disgust. I have thought of that, and I say it's nonsense. My chances of straightening out this mess are so small, with all the restrictions being placed on me and with all the difficulty I will have in understanding anything about Aurora, that I don't think anyone in his right mind would bother to take the trouble to try to stop me. And if they did, why bother attacking me personally? Why not sabotage the ship? If we imagine ourselves to be facing no-holds-barred villains, they should find a ship and the people aboard it, and you and Giscard, and myself, of course, to be a small price to pay. This has, in point of fact, been considered, partner Elijah. The ship has been carefully studied. Any signs of sabotage would be detected. Are you sure? One hundred percent certain? Nothing of this sort can be absolutely certain. Giscard and I were comfortable, however, with the thought that the certainty was quite high and that we might proceed with minimal expectation of disaster. And if you were wrong? Something like a small sign of spasm crossed Daniil's face, as though he were being asked to consider something that interfered with the smooth working of the positronic pathways in his brain. He said, But we have not been wrong. You cannot say that. We are approaching the landing, and that is sure to be the danger moment. In fact, at this point, there is no need to sabotage the ship. My personal danger is greatest now, right now. I can't hide in this room if I'm to disembark at Aurora. I will have to pass through the ship and be within reach of others. Have you taken precautions to keep the landing safe? He was being petty, striking out at Daniil needlessly because he was chafing at his long imprisonment and at the indignity of his moment of collapse. But Daniil said calmly, We have, partner Elijah. And, incidentally, we have landed. We are now resting on the surface of Aurora. For a moment, Bailey was bewildered. He looked around wildly, but of course there was nothing to see but an enclosing room. He had felt and heard nothing of what Daniil had described, none of the acceleration or heat or wind whistle. Or had Daniil deliberately brought up the matter of his personal danger once again in order to make sure he would not think of other unsettling but minor matters? Bailey said, and yet there's still the matter of getting off the ship. How do I do that without being vulnerable to possible enemies? Daniil walked to one wall and touched a spot upon it. The wall promptly split in two, the two halves moving apart. Bailey found himself looking into a long cylinder, a tunnel. Giscard had entered the room at that moment from the other side and said, Sir, the three of us will move through the exit tube. Others have it under observation from without. At the other end of the tube, Dr. Fastolf is waiting. We have taken every precaution, said Daniil. Bailey muttered, My apologies, Daniil, Gisgard. He moved into the exit tube somberly. Every effort to assure that precautions had been taken also assured him that those precautions were thought necessary. Bailey liked to think he was no coward, but he was on a strange planet, with no way of telling friend from enemy, with no way of taking comfort in anything familiar, except, of course, Daniil. At crucial moments, he thought with a shiver, he would be without enclosure to warm him and to give him relief. Chapter 4 Fast Off 14 Dr. Han Fastolf was indeed waiting and smiling. He was tall and thin with light brown hair that was not very thick, and there were, of course, his ears. It was the ears that Bailey remembered even after three years. Large ears standing away from his head, giving him a vaguely humorous appearance, a pleasant homeliness. It was the ears that made Bailey smile rather than Fastolf's welcome. 
Bailey wondered briefly if Aurora in medical technology did not extend to the minor plastic surgery required to correct the ungainliness of those ears. But then it might well be that Fastolf liked their appearance, as Bailey himself, rather to his surprise, did. There is something to be said about a face that makes one smile. Perhaps Fastolf valued being liked at first glance. Or was it that he found it useful to be underestimated? Or just different? Fastolf said, Plain clothesman Elijah Bailey. I remember you well, even though I persist in thinking of you as possessing the face of the actor who portrayed you. Bailey's face turned grim. That hyperwave dramatization haunts me, Dr. Fastolf. If I knew where I could go to escape it, nowhere, said Fastolf genially. At least ordinarily. So if you don't like it, we'll expunge it from our conversations right now. I shall never mention it again. Agreed? Thank you. With calculated suddenness, he thrust out his hand at Fastolf. Fastolf hesitated perceptibly. Then he took Bailey's hand, holding it gingerly, and not for long, and said, I shall assume you are not a walking sack of infection, Mr. Bailey. Then he said ruefully, staring at his hands, I must admit, though, that my hands have been treated with an inert film that doesn't feel entirely comfortable. I am a creature of the irrational fears of my society. Bailey shrugged. So are we all. I do not relish the thought of being outside, in the open air, that is. For that matter, I do not relish having had to come to a roar under the circumstances in which I find myself. I understand that well, Mr. Bailey. I have a closed car for you here, and when we come to my establishment, we will do our best to continue to keep you enclosed. Well, thank you, but in the course of my stay on Aurora, I feel that it will be necessary for me to stay outside on occasion. I am prepared for that, as best I can be. I understand, but we will inflict the outside on you only when it is necessary. That is not now the case, so please consent to be enclosed. The car was waiting in the shadow of the tunnel, and there would scarcely be a trace of outside in passing from the latter to the former. Behind him, Bailey was aware of both Daniil and Giscard, quite dissimilar in appearance, but both identical in grave and waiting attitude, and both endlessly patient. Fastolf opened the back door and said, Please to get in. Bailey entered. Quickly and smoothly, Daniil entered behind him, while Giscard, virtually simultaneously in what seemed almost like a well-choreographed dance movement, entered on the other side. Bailey found himself wedged, but not oppressively so, between them. In fact, he welcomed the thought that, between himself and the outside on both sides, was the thickness of a robotic body. But there was no outside. Fastolf climbed into the front seat, and as the door closed behind him, the windows blanked out, and a soft artificial light suffused the interior. Fastolf said, I don't generally drive this way, Mr. Bailey, but I don't mind a great deal, and you may find it more comfortable. The car is completely computerized, knows where it's going, and can deal with any obstructions or emergencies. We need interfere in no way. There was the faintest feeling of acceleration, and then a vague, barely noticeable sensation of motion. Fastolf said, This is a secure passage, Mr. Bailey. I have gone to considerable trouble to make certain that as few people as possible know you will be in this car, and certainly you will not be detected within it. The trip by car, which rides on air jets, by the way, so that it is an airfoil, actually, will not take long, but if you wish, you can seize the opportunity to rest. You are quite safe now. You speak, said Bailey as though you think I'm in danger. I was protected to the point of imprisonment on the ship, and again now. Bailey looked about the small enclosed interior of the car, within which he was hemmed by the frame of metal and opacified glass, to say nothing of the metallic frame of two robots. Fastoff laughed lightly. <laughs> I am overreacting, I know, but feeling runs high on Aurora. You arrive here at a time of crisis for us, and I would rather be made to look silly by overreacting than to run the terrible risk that underreacting entails. Bailey said, 
I believe you understand, Dr. Fastoff, that my failure here would be a blow to Earth. I understand that well. I am as determined as you are to prevent your failure. Believe me. I do. Furthermore, my failure here, for whatever reason, will also be my personal and professional ruin on Earth. Fastolf turned in his seat to look at Bailey with a shocked expression. Really? Well, that would not be warranted. Bailey shrugged. I agree, but it will happen. I will be the obvious target for a desperate Earth government. This was not in my mind when I asked for you, Mr. Bailey. You may be sure I will do what I can. Though in all honesty, his eyes fell away. That will be little enough if we lose. I know that, said Bailey dourly. He leaned back against the soft upholstery and closed his eyes. The motion of the car was limited to a gentle, lulling sway. But Bailey did not sleep. Instead, he thought hard for what that was worth. Fifteen. Bailey did not experience the outside at the other end of the trip either. When he emerged from the airfoil, he was in an underground garage and a small elevator brought him up to ground level, as it turned out. He was ushered into a sunny room and, as he passed through the direct rays of the sun, yes, faintly orange, he shrank away a bit. Fastolf noticed. He said, Well, the windows are not opacifiable, though they can be darkened. I will do that if you like. In fact, I should have thought of that. No need, said Bailey gruffly. I'll just uh, sit with my back to it. I must acclimate myself. If you wish, but let me know if at any time you grow too uncomfortable. Mr. Bailey, it is late morning here on this part of Aurora. I don't know your personal time on the ship. If you have been awake for many hours and would like to sleep, that can be arranged. If you are wakeful but not hungry, you need not eat. However, if you feel you can manage it, you are welcome to have lunch with me in a short while. That would fit in well with my personal time as it happens. Excellent. I'll remind you that our day is about 7% shorter than Earth's. It shouldn't involve you in too much biorhythmic difficulties, but if it does, we will try to adjust ourselves to your needs. Thank you. Finally, I have no clear idea what your food preferences might be. I'll manage to eat whatever is put before me. Nevertheless, I won't feel offended if anything seems um, not palatable. Thank you. And you won't mind if Daniil and Giscar join us? Bailey smiled faintly. Will they be eating too? There was no answering smile from Fastolf. He said seriously, No, but I want them to be with you at all times. Still danger? Even here? I trust nothing entirely. Even here. A robot entered. Sir, lunch is served. Fastolf nodded. Very good, Faber. We will be at the table in a few moments. Bailey said, How many robots do you have? Oh, quite a few. We are not at the Solarian level of 10,000 robots to a human being, but I have more than the average number, 57. The house is a large one, and it serves as my office and my workshop as well. Then, too, my wife, when I have one, must have space enough to be insulated from my work in a separate wing and must be served independently. Well, with fifty-seven robots, I imagine you can spare two. I feel the less guilty at your having sent Giscard and Daniil to escort me to Aurora. It was no casual choice, I assure you, Mr. Bailey. Giscard is my major domo and my right hand. He has been with me all my adult life. Yet you sent him on the trip to get me. I am honored, said Bailey. It is a measure of your importance, Mr. Bailey. Giscard is the most reliable of my robots, strong and sturdy. Bailey's eye flickered toward Daniil, and Fastolf added, I don't include my friend Daniil in these calculations. He is not my servant, but an achievement of which I have the weakness to be extremely proud. He is the first of his class, and while Dr. Raj Nemena Sartan was his designer and model, the man who... Uh, he paused delicately, but Bailey nodded brusquely and said, I understand. He did not require the phrase to be completed with a reference to Sartan's murder on Earth. 
While Sartin supervised the actual construction, Fastolf went on, it was I whose theoretical calculations made Daniil possible. Fastolf smiled at Daniil, who bowed his head in acknowledgement. Bailey said, There was Jander, too. Yes. Fastolf shook his head and looked downcast. I should perhaps have kept him with me as I do Daniil, but he was my second humaniform, and that makes a difference. It is Daniil who is my firstborn, so to speak, a special case. And you construct no more humaniform robots now? No more. But come, said Fastolf, rubbing his hands. We must have our lunch. I do not think, Mr. Bailey, that on Earth the population is accustomed to what I might term natural food. We are having shrimp salad, together with bread and cheese, milk if you wish, or any of an assortment of fruit juices. It's all very simple. Ice cream for dessert. All traditional Earth dishes, said Bailey, which exist now in their original form only in Earth's ancient literature. None of it is entirely common here on Aurora, but... I didn't think it made sense to subject you to our own version of gourmet dining, which involves food items and spices of Aurora and varieties. The uh, taste would have to be acquired. He rose. Please come with me, Mr. Bailey. There will just be the two of us, and we will not stand on ceremony or indulge in unnecessary dining ritual. Well, thank you, said Bailey. I accept that as a kindness... I have relieved the tedium of the trip here by a rather intensive viewing of material relating to Aurora, and I know that proper politeness requires many aspects to a ceremonial meal that I would dread. You need not dread, Bailey said. Could we break ceremony even to the extent of talking business over the meal, Dr. Festolf? I must not lose time unnecessarily. I sympathize with that point of view. We will indeed talk business, and I imagine I can rely on you to say nothing to anyone concerning that lapse. I would not want to be expelled from polite society. He chuckled, then said, Though no, I should not laugh. It is nothing to laugh at. Losing time may be more than an inconvenience alone. It could easily be fatal. 16. The room that Bailey left was a spare one. Several chairs, a chest of drawers, something that looked like a piano but had brass valves in place of keys, some abstract designs on the walls that seemed to shimmer with light. The floor was a smooth checkerboard of several shades of brown, perhaps designed to be reminiscent of wood. And although it shone with highlights as though freshly waxed, it did not feel slippery underfoot. The dining room, though it had the same floor, was like it in no other way. It was a long rectangular room, overburdened with decoration. It contained six large square tables that were clearly modules that could be assembled in various fashions. A bar was to be found along one short wall with gleaming bottles of various colors standing before a curved mirror that seemed to lend a nearly infinite extension to the room it reflected. Along the other short wall were four recesses, in each of which a robot waited. Both long walls were mosaics in which the colors slowly changed. One was a planetary scene, though Bailey could not tell if it were Aurora or another planet, or something completely imaginary. At one end there was a wheat field, or something of that sort, filled with elaborate farm machinery, all robot-controlled. As one's eye traveled along the length of the wall, that gave way to scattered human habitations, becoming, at the other end, what Bailey felt to be the Auroran version of a city. The other long wall was astronomical. A planet, blue-white, lit by a distant sun, reflected light in such a manner that not the closest examination could free one from the thought that it was slowly rotating. The stars that surrounded it some faint, some bright, seemed also to be changing their patterns, though when the eye concentrated on some small grouping and remained fixed there, the stars seemed immobile. Bailey found it all confusing and repellent. Fastolf said, Rather a work of art, Mr. Bailey. Far too expensive to be worth it, though, but Fania would have it, 
Oh, Fanya is my current partner. Will she be joining us, Dr. Fastolf? No, Mr. Bailey, as I said, just the two of us. For the duration, I have asked her to remain in her own quarters. I do not want to subject her to this problem we have. You understand, I hope. Yes, of course. Come, please take your seat. One of the tables was set with dishes, cups, and elaborate cutlery, not all of which were familiar to Bailey. In the center was a tall, somewhat tapering cylinder that looked as though it might be a gigantic chess pawn made out of a gray, rocky material. Bailey, as he sat down, could not resist reaching toward it and touching it with a finger. Fastolf smiled. It's a spicer. It possesses simple controls that allows one to use it to deliver a fixed amount of any of a dozen different condiments on any portion of a dish. To do it properly, one picks it up and performs rather intricate evolutions that are meaningless in themselves, but that are much valued by fashionable aurorans as symbols of the grace and delicacy with which meals should be served. When I was younger, I could, with my thumb and two fingers, do the triple genuflection and produce salt as the spicer struck my palm. (laughs) Now if I tried it, I'd run a good risk of braining my guest. I trust you won't mind if I do not try. I urge you not to try, Dr. Fastolf. A robot placed the salad on the table. Another brought a tray of fruit juices. A third brought the bread and cheese. A fourth adjusted the napkins. All four operated in close coordination, weaving in and out without collision or any sign of difficulty. Bailey watched them in astonishment. They ended, without any apparent sign of prearrangements, one at each side of the table. They stepped back in unison, bowed in unison, turned in unison, and returned to the recesses along the wall at the far end of the room. Bailey was suddenly aware of Daniil and Giscard in the room as well. He had not seen them come in. They waited in two recesses that had somehow appeared along the wall with the wheat field. Daniil was the closer. Fastolf said, Now that they've gone... He paused and shook his head slowly in rueful conclusion. Except that they haven't. Ordinarily, it is customary for the robots to leave before lunch actually begins. Robots do not eat while human beings do. It therefore makes sense that those who eat do so and that those who do not leave. And it is ended by becoming one more ritual. It would be quite unthinkable to eat until the robots left. In this case, though... They have not left, said Bailey. No. I felt that security came before etiquette, and I felt that, not being an Auroran, you would not mind. Bailey waited for Fastolf to make the first move. Fastolf lifted a fork. So did Bailey. Fastolf made use of it, moving slowly and allowing Bailey to see exactly what he was doing. Bailey bit cautiously into a shrimp and found it delightful. He recognized the taste, which was like the shrimp paste produced on earth, but enormously more subtle and rich. He chewed slowly, and for a while, despite his anxiety to get on with the investigation while dining, he found it quite unthinkable to do anything but give his full attention to the lunch. It was, in fact, Fastolf who made the first move. Shouldn't we make a beginning on the problem, Mr. Bailey? Bailey felt himself flush slightly. Uh, Yes, by all means. I ask your pardon. Your roaring food caught me by surprise so that it was difficult for me to think of anything else. Um, the problem, Dr. Fastolf, is of your making, isn't it? Why do you say that? Someone has committed roboticide in a manner that requires great expertise, as I have been told. Roboticide? Hmm. An amusing term. Fastolf smiled. Of course, I understand what you mean by it. You have been told correctly. The manor requires enormous expertise. And only you have the expertise to carry it out, as I have been told. You have been told correctly there, too. And even you yourself admit, in fact, you insist, that only you could have put gender into a mental freeze-out. I maintain what is, after all, the truth, Mr. Bailey. It would do me no good to lie, even if I could bring myself to do so. It is notorious that I am the outstanding theoretical roboticist in all the fifty worlds. 
Nevertheless, Dr. Fastolf, might not the second best theoretical roboticist in all the worlds, or the third best, or even the fifteenth best, nevertheless possess the necessary ability to commit the deed? Does it really require all the ability of the very best? Fastolf said calmly, In my opinion, it really requires all the ability of the very best. Indeed, again in my opinion, I myself could only accomplish the task on one of my good days. Remember that the best brains in robotics, including mine, have specifically labored to design positronic brains that could not be driven into mental freeze-out. Are you certain of all that? Really certain? Completely. And you stated so publicly. Of course. There was no public inquiry, my dear Earthman. I was asked the questions you are now asking, and I answered truthfully. It is an Aurora custom to do so. Bailey said, I do not at the moment question that you were convinced you were answering truthfully, but might you not have been swayed by a natural pride in yourself? That might also be typically Aurora, might it not? You mean that my anxiety to be considered the best would make me willingly put myself in a position where everyone would be forced to conclude I had mentally frozen Jander? I picture you somehow as content to have your political and social status destroyed provided your scientific reputation remained intact. I see. You have an interesting way of thinking, Mr. Bailey. This would not have occurred to me. Given a choice between admitting I was second best and admitting I was guilty of, to use your phrase, a roboticide, you are of the opinion I would knowingly accept the latter. No, Dr. Fastolf, I do not wish to present the matter quite so simplistically. Might it not be that you deceive yourself into thinking you are the greatest of all roboticists and that you are completely unrivaled, clinging to that at all costs, because you unconsciously, un consciously, Dr. Fastolf, realize that, in fact, you are being overtaken, or have even already been overtaken by others. Fastolf laughed, but there was an edge of annoyance in it. Not so, Mr. Bailey. Quite wrong. Think, Dr. Fastolf. Are you certain that none of your roboticist colleagues can approach you in brilliance? There are only a few who are capable of dealing at all with humaniform robots. Daniil's construction created virtually a new profession for which there is not even a name. Humaniformists, perhaps. Of the theoretical roboticists on Aurora, not one, except for myself, understands the workings of Daniil's positronic brain. Dr. Sarton did, but he is dead, and he did not understand it as well as I do. The basic theory is mine. It may have been yours to begin with, but surely you can't expect to maintain exclusive ownership. Has no one learned the theory? Fastolf shook his head firmly. Not one. I have taught no one, and I defy any other living roboticist to have developed the theory on his own. Bailey said with a touch of irritation, Might there not be a bright young man, fresh out of the university, who is cleverer than anyone yet realizes who— No, Mr. Bailey, no! I would have known such a young man. He would have passed through my laboratories. He would have worked with me. At the moment, no such young man exists. Eventually one will, perhaps many will. At the moment, none. If you died, then, the new science dies with you? I am only 165 years old. That's metric years, of course, so it is only 124 of your Earth years, more or less. I am still quite young by Aurora standards and there is no medical reason why my life should be considered even half over. It is not entirely unusual to reach an age of 400 years, metric years. There is yet plenty of time to teach. They had finished eating, but neither man made any move to leave the table. Nor did any robot approach to clear it. It was as though they were transfixed into immobility by the intensity of the back-and-forth flow of talk. Bailey's eyes narrowed. He said, Dr. Fastolf, two years ago I was on Solaria. There I was given the clear impression that the Solarians were, on the whole, the most skilled roboticists in all the worlds. On the whole, that's probably true. And not one of them could have done the deed? Not one, Mr. Bailey. Their skill is with robots who are, at best, no more advanced than my poor, reliable Giscard. 
The Solarians know nothing of the construction of humaniform robots. How can you be sure of that? Since you were on Solaria, Mr. Bailey, you know very well that Solarians can approach each other with only the greatest of difficulty, that they interact by trimensional viewing, except where sexual contact is absolutely required. Do you think that any of them would dream of designing a robot so human in appearance that it would activate their neuroses? They would so avoid the possibility of approaching him since he would look so human that they could make no reasonable use of him. Might not a Solarian here or there display a surprising tolerance for the human body? How can you be sure? Even if a Solarian could, which I do not deny, there are no Solarian nationals on Aurora this year. None? None. They do not like to be thrown into contact even with Aurorans, and except on the most urgent business, none will come here or to any other world. Even in the case of urgent business, they will come no closer than orbit, and then they deal with us only by electronic communication. Bailey said, In that case, if you are, literally and actually, the only person in all the worlds who could have done it, did you kill Jander? Fastolf said, I cannot believe that Daniil did not tell you I have denied this deed. He did tell me so, but I want to hear it from you. Fastolf crossed his arms and frowned. He said, through clenched teeth, Then I'll tell you so. I did not do it. Bailey shook his head. I believe you believe that statement. I do, and most sincerely. I am telling the truth. I did not kill Jander. But if you did not do it, and if no one else can possibly have done it, then... Wait, I am perhaps making an unwarranted assumption. Is Jander really dead? Or have I been brought here under false pretenses? The robot is really destroyed. It will be quite possible to show him to you if the legislature does not bar my access to him before the day is over, which I don't think they will do. In that case, if you did not do it, and if no one else could possibly have done it, and if the robot is actually dead, who committed the crime? Fastolf sighed. I'm sure Daniil told you what I have maintained at the inquiry, but you want to hear it from my own lips. That is right, Dr. Fastolf. Well then, no one committed the crime. It was a spontaneous event in the positronic flow along the brain paths that set up the mental freeze-out in Jander. Is that likely? No, it is not. It is extremely unlikely, but if I did not do it, then that is the only thing that can have happened. Might it not be argued that there is a greater chance that you are lying than that a spontaneous mental freeze-out took place? Many do so argue, but I happen to know that I did not do it, and that leaves only the spontaneous event as a possibility. And you have had me brought here to demonstrate, to prove, that the spontaneous event did, in fact, take place? Yes. But how does one go about proving the spontaneous event? Only by proving it, it seems, can I save you, Earth, and myself. In order of increasing importance, Mr. Bailey? Bailey looked annoyed. Well, then, you, me, and Earth. I'm afraid, said Fastolf, that after considerable thought, I have come to the conclusion that there is no way of obtaining such a proof. 17. Bailey stared at Fastolf in horror. No way? No way. None. And then, in a sudden fit of apparent abstraction, he seized the spicer and said, You know, I am curious to see if I can still do the triple genuflection. He tossed the spicer into the air with a calculated flip of the wrist. It somersaulted, and as it came down, Fastolf caught the narrow end on the side of his right palm. His thumb tucked down. It went up slightly and swayed and was caught on the side of the left palm. It went up again in reverse and was caught on the side of the right palm and then again on the left palm. After this third genuflection, it was lifted with sufficient force to produce a flip. Fastolf caught it in his right fist, with his left hand nearby, palm upward. Once the spicer was caught, Fastolf displayed his left hand and there was a fine sprinkling of salt in it. Fastolf said, <laughs> It is a childish display to the scientific mind, and the effort is totally disproportionate to the end, which is, of course, a pinch of salt. 
but the good Auroran host is proud of being able to put on a display. There are some experts who can keep the spicer in the air for a minute and a half, moving their hands almost more rapidly than the eye can follow. Of course, he added thoughtfully, Daniil can perform such actions with greater skill and speed than any human. I have tested him in this manner in order to check on the workings of his brain paths, but it would be totally wrong to have him display such talents in public. It would needlessly humiliate human spicists, a popular term for them, you understand, though you won't find it in dictionaries. Bailey grunted. Fastolf sighed. But we must get back to business. You brought me through several parsecs of space for that purpose. Indeed I did. Let us proceed, Bailey said. Was there a reason for that display of yours, Dr. Fastolf? Fastolf said, well, we seem to have come to an impasse. I've brought you here to do something that can't be done. Your face was rather eloquent, and to tell you the truth, I felt no better. It seemed, therefore, that we could use a breathing space. And now, let us proceed on the impossible task. Why should it be impossible for you, Mr. Bailey? Your reputation is that of an achiever of the impossible. The hyperwave drama? You believe that foolish distortion of what happened on Solaria? Fastolf spread his arms. I have no other hope. Bailey said, And I have no choice. I must continue to try. I cannot return to Earth a failure. That has been made clear to me. Tell me, Dr. Fastolf. How could Jander have been killed? What sort of manipulation of his mind would have been required? Mr. Bailey, I don't know how I could possibly explain that even to another roboticist, which you certainly are not, and even if I were prepared to publish my theories, which I certainly am not. However, let me see if I can't explain something. You know, of course, that robots were invented on Earth. Very little concerning robotics is dealt with on Earth. Earth's strong anti-robot bias is well known on the spacer worlds. But the earthly origin of robots is obvious to any person on Earth who thinks about it. It is well known that hyperspatial travel was developed with the aid of robots, and since the spacer worlds could not have been settled without hyperspatial travel, it follows that robots existed before settlement had taken place and while Earth was still the only inhabited planet. Robots were therefore invented on Earth by Earth people. Yet Earth feels no pride in that, does it? We do not discuss it, said Bailey shortly. And Earth people know nothing about Susan Calvin. I have come across her name in a few old books. She was one of the early pioneers in robotics. Is that all you know of her? Bailey made a gesture of dismissal. I suppose I could find out more if I searched the records, but I have had no occasion to do so. How strange said Fastolf. She's a demigod to all spacers, so much so that I imagine that few spacers who are not actually roboticists think of her as an earth woman. It would seem a profanation. They would refuse to believe it if they were told that she died after having lived scarcely more than a hundred metric years. And yet you know her only as an early pioneer. Has she got something to do with all this, Dr. Fastolf? Well, not directly, but in a way. You must understand that numerous legends cluster about her name. Most of them are undoubtedly untrue, but they cling to her nonetheless. One of the most famous legends, and one of the least likely to be true, concerns a robot manufactured in those primitive days that, through some accident on the production lines, turned out to have telepathic abilities. What? A legend! I told you it was a legend and undoubtedly untrue. Mind you, there is some theoretical reason for supposing this might be possible, though no one has ever presented a plausible design that could even begin to incorporate such an ability. That it could have appeared in positronic brains as crude and simple as those in the pre-hyperspatial era is totally unthinkable. That is why we are quite certain that this particular tale is an invention. But let me go on anyway, for it points out a moral. By all means, go on. The robot, according to the tale, could read minds. And when asked questions, he read the questioner's mind and told the questioner what he wanted to hear. Now, the first law of robotics states quite clearly that a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a person to come to harm. 
but to robots, generally, that means physical harm. A robot who can read minds, however, would surely decide that disappointment or anger or any violent emotion would make the human being feeling those emotions unhappy, and the robot would interpret the inspiring of such emotions under the heading of harm. If then a telepathic robot knew that the truth might disappoint or enrage a questioner or cause that person to feel envy or unhappiness, he would tell a pleasing lie instead. Do you see that? Yes, of course. So the robot lied even to Susan Calvin herself. The lies could not long continue, for different people were told different things that were not only inconsistent among themselves, but unsupported by the gathering evidence of reality, you see. Susan Calvin discovered she had been lied to and realized that those lies had led her into a position of considerable embarrassment. What would have disappointed her somewhat to begin with had now, thanks to false hopes, disappointed her unbearably. You never heard the story? I give you my word. Astonishing. Yet it certainly wasn't invented on Aurora, for it is equally current on all the worlds. In any case, Calvin took her revenge. She pointed out to the robot that whether he told the truth or told a lie, he would equally harm the person with whom he dealt. He could not obey the first law, whatever action he took. The robot, understanding this, was forced to take refuge in total inaction. If you want to put it colorfully, his positronic pathways burned out. His brain was irrecoverably destroyed. The legend goes on to say that Calvin's last word to the destroyed robot was, Liar! Bailey said, And something like this, I take it, was what happened to Jander Pennell. He was faced with a contradiction in terms and his brain burned out. It's what appears to have happened, though that is not as easy to bring about as it would have been in Susan Calvin's day. Possibly because of the legend, roboticists have always been careful to make it as difficult as possible for contradictions to arise. As the theory of positronic brains has grown more subtle and as the practice of positronic brain design has grown more intricate, increasingly successful systems have been devised to have all situations that might arise resolve into non-equality, so that some action can always be taken that will be interpreted as obeying the first law. Well, then, you can't burn out a robot's brain. Is that what you're saying? Because if you are, what happened to Jander? It's not what I'm saying. The increasingly successful systems I speak of are never completely successful. They cannot be. No matter how subtle and intricate a brain might be, there is always some way of setting up a contradiction. That is a fundamental truth of mathematics. It will remain forever impossible to produce a brain so subtle and intricate as to reduce the chance of contradiction to zero. Never quite to zero. However, the systems have been made so close to zero that to bring about a mental freeze-out by setting up a suitable contradiction would require a deep understanding of the particular positronic brain being dealt with, and that would take a clever theoretician. Such as yourself, Dr. Fastolf. Such as myself, in the case of humaniform robots, only myself. Or no one at all, said Bailey, heavily ironic. Or no one at all, precisely, said Fastolf, ignoring the irony. The humaniform robots have brains, and I might add bodies, constructed in conscious imitation of the human being. The positronic brains are extraordinarily delicate, and they take on some of the fragility of the human brain, naturally, just as a human being may have a stroke through some chance event within the brain and without the intervention of any external effect, so a humaniform brain might, through chance alone, the occasional aimless drifting of positrons, go into mental freeze. Can you prove that, Dr. Fastolf? I can demonstrate it mathematically, but of those who could follow the mathematics, not all would agree that the reasoning was valid. It involves certain suppositions of my own that do not fit into the accepted modes of thinking in robotics. And how likely is spontaneous mental freeze-out? Given a large number of humaniform robots, say a hundred thousand, there is an even chance that one of them might undergo spontaneous mental freeze-out in an average Auroran lifetime. And yet it could happen much sooner, as it did to Jander, although then the odds would be very greatly against it. 
But look here, Dr. Fastolf, even if you were to prove conclusively that a spontaneous mental freeze-out could take place in robots generally, that would not be the same as proving that such a thing happened to Jander in particular at this particular time. No, admitted Fastolf. You are quite right. You, the greatest expert in robotics, cannot prove it in the specific case of Jander. Again, you are quite right. Then what do you expect me to be able to do when I know nothing of robotics? There is no need to prove anything. It would surely be sufficient to present an ingenious suggestion that would make spontaneous mental freeze-out plausible to the general public. Such as, I don't know. Bailey said harshly, Are you sure you don't know, Dr. Fastolf? What do you mean? I have just said I don't know. Let me point out something. I assume that Aurorans, generally, know that I have come to the planet for the purpose of tackling this problem. It would be difficult to manage to get me here secretly, considering that I am an Earthman and this is Aurora. Yes, certainly, and I made no attempt to do that. I consulted the chairman of the legislature and persuaded him to grant me permission to bring you here. It is how I've managed to win a stay in judgment. You are to be given a chance to solve the mystery before I go on trial. I doubt that they'll give me a very long stay. I repeat then, Aurorans in general know I'm here, and I imagine they know precisely why I am here, that I am supposed to solve the puzzle of the death of Jander. Of course. What other reason could there be? And from the time I boarded the ship that brought me here, you have kept me under close and constant guard because of the danger that your enemies might try to eliminate me, judging me to be some sort of wonder man who just might solve the puzzle in such a way as to place you on the winning side, even though all the odds are against me. I fear that as a possibility, yes. And suppose someone who does not want to see the puzzle solved, and you, Dr. Fastolf, exonerated, should actually succeed in killing me. Might that not swing sentiment in your favor? Might not people reason that your enemies felt you were in actual fact innocent, or they would not fear the investigation so much that they would want to kill me? Rather complicated reasoning, Mr. Bailey. I suppose that, properly exploited, your death might be used to such a purpose, but it's not going to happen. You are being protected, and you will not be killed. But why protect me, Dr. Fastolf? Why not let them kill me, and use my death as a way of winning? Because I would rather you remained alive and succeeded in actually demonstrating my innocence. Bailey said, But surely you know that I can't demonstrate your innocence. Perhaps you can. You have every incentive. The welfare of Earth hangs on your doing so and, as you have told me, your own career. What good is incentive? If you ordered me to fly by flapping my arms and told me further that if I failed I would be promptly killed by slow torture and that Earth would be blown up and all its population destroyed, I would have enormous incentive to flap my wings and fly and yet still be unable to do so. Fastolf said uneasily, I know the chances are small. You know they are non-existent said Bailey violently, and that only my death can save you. Then I will not be saved, for I am seeing to it that my enemies cannot reach you. But you can reach me. What? I have the thought in my head, Dr. Fastolf, that you yourself might kill me in such a way as to make it appear that your enemies have done the deed. You would then use my death against them, and that that is why you have brought me to Aurora. For a moment... Fastolf looked at Bailey with a kind of mild surprise, and then, in an excess of passion both sudden and extreme, his face reddened and twisted into a snarl. Sweeping up the spicer from the table, he raised it high and brought his arm down to hurl it at Bailey. And Bailey, caught utterly by surprise, barely managed to cringe back against his chair. Chapter 5 Daniil and Giscard. 18. If Fastolf had acted quickly, Daniil had reacted far more quickly still. To Bailey, who had all but forgotten Daniil's existence, there seemed a vague rush, a confused sound, and then Daniil was standing to one side of Fastolf, holding the spicer and saying, I trust, Dr. Fastolf, that I did not in any way hurt you. Bailey noted in a dazed sort of way, that Giscard was not far from Fastolf on the other side, and that every one of the four robots at the far wall had advanced almost to the dining room table. Panting slightly, Fastolf, his hair quite disheveled, said, No, Daniil, you did very well indeed. 
He raised his voice. You all did well, but remember, you must allow nothing to slow you down, even my own involvement. He laughed softly and took his seat once more, straightening his hair with his hand. I'm sorry, he said, to have startled you so, Mr. Bailey, but I felt the demonstration might be more convincing than any words of mine would have been. Bailey, whose moment of cringing had been purely a matter of reflex, loosened his collar and said, with a touch of hoarseness, I'm afraid I expected words, but I agree the demonstration was convincing. I'm glad that Daniil was close enough to disarm you. Any one of them was close enough to disarm me, but Daniil was the closest and got to me first. He got to me quickly enough to be gentle about it. Had he been farther away, he might have had to wrench my arm or even knock me out. Would he have gone that far? Mr. Bailey, said Fastolf, I have given instructions for your protection, and I know how to give instructions. They would not have hesitated to save you, even if the alternative was harm to me. They would, of course, have labored to inflict minimum harm, as Daniil did. All he harmed was my dignity and the neatness of my hair. And my fingers tingle a bit. Fastall flexed them ruefully. Bailey drew a deep breath, trying to recover from that short period of confusion. He said, Would not Daniil have protected me even without your specific instruction? Undoubtedly, he would have had to. You must not think, however, that robotic response is a simple yes or no, up or down, in or out. It is a mistake the layman often makes. There is the matter of speed of response. My instructions with regard to you were so phrased that the potential built up within the robots of my establishment, including Daniil, is abnormally high, as high as I can reasonably make it, in fact, the response, therefore, to a clear and present danger to you is extraordinarily rapid. I knew it would be, and it was for that reason that I could strike out at you as rapidly as I did, knowing I could give you a most convincing demonstration of my inability to harm you. Yes, but I don't entirely thank you for it. Oh, I was entirely confident in my robots, especially Daniil. It did occur to me, though, a little too late that if I had not instantly released the Spicer, he might, quite against his will, or the robotic equivalent of will, have broken my wrist. Bailey said, It occurs to me that it was a foolish risk for you to have undertaken. It occurs to me as well, after the fact. Now, if you had prepared yourself to hurl the Spicer at me, Daniil would have at once countered your move, but not with quite the same speed for he has received no special instructions as to my safety. I can hope he would have been fast enough to save me, but I'm not sure, and I would prefer not to test that matter. Fastolf smiled genially. Bailey said, What if some explosive device were dropped on the house from some airborne vehicle? Or if a gamma beam were trained upon us from a neighboring hilltop? My robots do not represent infinite protection, but such radical terrorist attempts are unlikely in the extreme here on Aurora. I suggest we do not worry about them. I am willing not to worry about them. Indeed, I did not seriously suspect that you were a danger to me, Dr. Fastolf, but I needed to eliminate the possibility altogether if I were to continue. We can now proceed. Fastolf said, Yes, we can. Despite this additional and very dramatic distraction, we still face the problem of proving that Jander's mental freeze-out was spontaneous chance. But Bailey had been made aware of Daniil's presence, and he now turned to him and said uneasily, Daniil, does it pain you that we discuss this matter? Daniil, who had deposited the spicer on one of the farther of the empty tables, said, Partner Elijah, I would prefer that past friend Jander were still operational, but since he is not, and since he cannot be restored to proper functioning, the best of what is left is that action be taken to prevent similar incidents in the future. Since the discussion now has that end in view, it pleases rather than pains me. Well, then, just to settle another matter, Daniil, uh, 
Do you believe that Dr. Fastolf is responsible for the end of your fellow robot gender? You'll pardon my inquiring, Dr. Fastolf. Fastolf gestured his approval, and Daniil said, Dr. Fastolf has stated that he was not responsible, so he, of course, was not. You have no doubts on the matter, Daniil? None, partner Elijah. Fastolf seemed a little amused. You are cross-examining a robot, Mr. Bailey. I know that, but I cannot quite think of Daniil as a robot, and so I have asked. His answers would have no standing before any board of inquiry. He is compelled to believe me by his positronic potentials. Well, I am not a board of inquiry, Dr. Fastolf, and I am clearing out the underbrush. Let me go back to where I was. Either you burned out Jander's brain, or it happened by random circumstance. You assure me that I cannot prove random circumstance, and that leaves me only with the task of disproving any action by you. In other words, if I can show that it is impossible for you to have killed Jander, we are left with random circumstance as the only alternative. And how can you do that? It is a matter of means, opportunity, and motive. You had the means of killing Jander, the theoretical ability to so manipulate him that he would end in a mental freeze-out. But did you have the opportunity? He was your robot in that you designed his brain paths and supervised his construction, but... Was he in your actual possession at the time of the mental freeze-out? No, as a matter of fact, he was in the possession of another. For how long? About eight months, or a little over half of one of your years. Oh, that's an interesting point. Were you with him or near him at the time of his destruction? Could you have reached him? In short, can we demonstrate the fact that you were so far from him or so out of touch with him that it is not reasonable to suppose that you could have done the deed at the time it is supposed to have been done. Fastolf said, That, I'm afraid, is impossible. There is a rather broad interval of time during which the deed might have been done. There are no robotic changes after destruction, equivalent to rigor mortis or decay in a human being. We can only say that, at a certain time, gender was known to be in operation, and, at a certain other time, he was known not to be in operation. Between the two was a stretch of about eight hours. For that period, I have no alibi. None? During that time, Dr. Fastolf, what were you doing? I was here in my establishment. Your robots were surely aware, perhaps, that you were here and could bear witness. They were certainly aware, but they cannot bear witness in any legal sense. And on that day, Fania was off on business of her own. Does Fania share your knowledge of robotics, by the way? Fastolf indulged in a wry smile. She knows less than you do. Besides, none of this matters. Why not? Fastolf's patience was clearly beginning to stretch to the cracking point. My dear Mr. Bailey, this was not a matter of close-range physical assault, such as my recent pretended attack on you. What happened to Jander did not require my physical presence. As it happens, although not actually in my establishment, Jander was not far away geographically, but it wouldn't have mattered if he were on the other side of Aurora. I could always reach him electronically and could, by the orders I gave him and the responses I could deduce, send him into mental freeze-out. The crucial step would not even necessarily require much in the way of time, Bailey said at once, It's a short process, then, one that someone else might move through by chance, while intending something perfectly routine. No, said Fastolf. For Aurora's sake, Earthman, let me talk. I've already told you that's not the case. Inducing mental freeze-out in gender would be a long and complicated and tortuous process, requiring the greatest understanding and wit— and could be done by no one accidentally, without incredible and long-continued coincidence. There would be far less chance of accidental progress over that enormously complex route than of spontaneous mental freeze-out, if my mathematical reasoning were only accepted. However, if I wished to induce mental freeze-out, I could carefully produce changes and reactions little by little over a period of weeks, months, even years, until I had brought Jander to the very point of destruction. And at no time in that process 
would he show any signs of being at the edge of catastrophe. Just as you could approach closer and closer to a precipice in the dark and yet feel no loss and firmness of footing whatever, even at the very edge. Once I had brought him to the very brink, however, the lip of the precipice, a single remark from me would send him over. It is that final step that would take but a moment of time. You see? Bailey tightened his lips. There was no use trying to mask his disappointment. In short, then, you had the opportunity. Anyone would have had the opportunity. Anyone on Aurora, provided he or she had the necessary ability. And only you have the necessary ability. I'm afraid so. Which brings us to motive, Dr. Fastolf. Ah. And it's there that we might be able to make a good case. These humaniform robots are yours. They are based on your theory, and you were involved in their construction at every step of the way, even if Dr. Sarton supervised that construction. They exist because of you and only because of you. You have spoken of Daniil as your firstborn. They are your creations, your children, your gift to humanity, your hold on immortality. Bailey felt himself growing eloquent and, for a moment, imagined himself to be addressing a board of inquiry. Why on earth, or Aurora, rather, why on Aurora should you undo this work? Why should you destroy a life you have produced by a miracle of mental labor? Fastoff looked wanly amused. Why, Mr. Bailey, you know nothing about it. How can you possibly know that my theory was the result of a miracle of mental labor? It might have been the very dull extension of an equation that anyone might have accomplished, but which none had bothered to do before me. I think not, said Bailey, endeavoring to cool down. If no one but you can understand the humaniform brain well enough to destroy it, then I think it likely that no one but you can understand it well enough to create it. Can you deny that? Fastolf shook his head. No, I won't deny that. And yet, Mr. Bailey... His face grew grimmer than it had been since they had met. Your careful analysis is succeeding only in making matters far worse for us. We have already decided that I am the only one with the means and the opportunity. As it happens, I also have a motive. The best motive in the world. And my enemies know it. How on earth, then, to quote you or on Aurora, or on anywhere, are we going to prove I didn't do it? 19. Bailey's face crumpled into a furious frown. He stepped hastily away, making for the corner of the room as though seeking enclosure. Then he turned suddenly and said sharply, Dr. Fastolf, it seems to me that you are taking some sort of pleasure in frustrating me. Fastolf shrugged. No pleasure. I'm merely presenting you with the problem as it is. Poor Jander died the robotic death by the pure uncertainty of positronic drift. Since I know I had nothing to do with it, I know that's how it must be. However, no one else can be sure I'm innocent, and all the indirect evidence points to me, and this must be faced squarely in deciding what, if anything, we can do. Bailey said, Well then, let's investigate your motive. What seems like an overwhelming motive to you may be nothing of the sort. I doubt that. I am no fool, Mr. Bailey. You are also no judge, perhaps, of yourself and your motives. People sometimes are not. You may be dramatizing yourself for some reason. I don't think so. Then tell me your motive. What is it? Tell me. Not so quickly, Mr. Bailey. It's not easy to explain it. Could you come outside with me? Bailey looked quickly toward the window. Outside? The sun had sunk lower in the sky, and the room was the sunnier for it. He hesitated, then said, rather more loudly than was necessary, Yes, I will. Excellent, said Fastolf. And then, with an added note of amiability, he added, But perhaps you would care to visit the personal first. Bailey thought for a moment. He felt no immediate urgency, but he did not know what might await him outside, how long he would be expected to stay, 
what facilities there might or might not be there. Most of all, he did not know Auroran customs in this respect, and he could not recall anything in the book films he had viewed on the ship that served to enlighten him in this respect. It was safest, perhaps, to acquiesce in whatever one's host suggested. Thank you, he said. If it will be convenient for me to do so, Fastolf nodded. Daniil, he said. Show Mr. Bailey to the visitor's personal. Daniil said, Partner Elijah, would you come with me? As they stepped together into the next room, Bailey said, I am sorry, Daniil, that you were not part of the conversation between myself and Dr. Fastolf. It would not have been fitting, Partner Elijah. When you asked me a direct question, I answered, but I was not invited to take part fully. I would have issued the invitation, Daniil, if I did not feel constrained by my position as guest. I thought it might be wrong to take the initiative in this respect. I understand. This is the visitor's personal partner, Elijah. The door will open at a touch of your hand anywhere upon it if the room is unoccupied. Bailey did not enter. He paused thoughtfully, then said, If you had been invited to speak, Daniil, is there anything you would have said? Any comment you would have cared to make? I would value your opinion, my friend. Daniil said with his usual gravity, The one remark I care to make is that Dr. Fastolf's statement that he had an excellent motive for placing gender out of operation was unexpected to me. I do not know what the motive might be. Whatever he states to be his motive, however, you might ask why he would not have the same motive to put me in mental freeze-out. If they can believe he had a motive to put Jander out of operation, why would the same motive not apply to me? I would be curious to know. Bailey looked at the other sharply, seeking automatically for expression in a face not given to lack of control. He said, Do you feel insecure, Daniil? Do you feel fast off is a danger to you? Daniil said, By the third law, I must protect my own existence, but I would not resist Dr. Fastolf or any human being if it were their considered opinion that it was necessary to end my existence. That is the second law. However, I know that I am of great value both in terms of investment of material, labor, and time, and in terms of scientific importance. It would therefore be necessary to explain to me carefully the reasons for the necessity of ending my existence. Dr. Fastolf has never said anything to me, never, partner Elisha, that would sound as though such a thing were in his mind. I do not believe it is remotely in his mind to end my existence, or that it ever was in his mind to end Jander's existence. Random positronic drift must have ended Jander, and may some day end me. There is always an element of chance in the universe. Bailey said, you say so, Fastolf says so, and I believe so, but the difficulty is to persuade people generally to accept this view of the matter. He turned gloomily to the door of the personal and said, Are you coming in with me, Daniil? Daniil's expression contrived to seem amused. It is flattering, partner Elijah, to be taken for human to this extent. I have no need, of course. Well, of course, but you can enter anyway. It would not be appropriate for me to enter. It is not the custom for robots to enter the personal. The interior of such a room is purely human. Besides, this is a one-person personal. One person? Momentarily, Bailey was shocked. He rallied, however. Other worlds, other customs. And this one he did not recall being described in the book films. He said, that's what you meant, then, by saying that the door would open only if it were unoccupied. What if it is occupied, as it will be in a moment? Then it will not open at a touch from outside, of course, and your privacy will be protected. Naturally, it will open at a touch from the inside. And what if a visitor fell into a faint, had a stroke or a heart seizure while in there, and could not touch the door from inside? Wouldn't that mean no one could enter to help him? There are emergency ways of opening the door, partner Elijah, if that should seem advisable. Then, clearly disturbed, are you of the opinion that something of this sort will occur? 
No, of course not. I am merely curious. I will be immediately outside the door, said Daniil uneasily. If I hear a call, partner Elijah, I will take action. I doubt that you'll have to. Bailey touched the door, casually and lightly, with the back of his hand, and it opened at once. He waited a moment or two to see if it would close. It didn't. He stepped through, and the door then closed promptly. While the door was open, the personal had seemed like a room that flatly served its purpose. A sink, a stall, presumably equipped with a shower arrangement, a tub, a translucent half-door with a toilet seat beyond in all likelihood. There were several devices that he did not quite recognize. He assumed they were intended for the fulfillment of personal services of one sort or another. He had little chance to study any of these, for in a moment it was all gone, and he was left to wonder if what he had seen had really been there at all, or if the devices had seemed to exist because they were what he had expected to see. As the door closed, the room darkened, for there was no window. When the door was completely closed, the room lit up again, but nothing of what he had seen returned. It was daylight, and he was outside, or so it appeared. There was open sky above, with clouds drifting across it in a fashion just regular enough to seem clearly unreal. On every side there seemed an outstretching of greenery moving in equally repetitive fashion. He felt the familiar knotting of his stomach that arose whenever he found himself outside, but he was not outside. He had walked into a windowless room. It had to be a trick of the lighting. He stared directly ahead of him and slowly slid his feet forward. He put his hands out before him, slowly, staring hard. His hands touched the smoothness of a wall. He followed the flatness to either side. He touched what he had seen to be a sink in that moment of original vision, and, guided by his hands, he could see it now, faintly, faintly against the overpowering sensation of light. He found the faucet, but no water came from it. He followed its curve backward and found nothing that was the equivalent of the familiar handles that would control the flow of water. He did find an oblong strip whose slight roughness marked it off from the surrounding wall. As his fingers slid along it, he pushed slightly and experimentally against it, and at once the greenery, which stretched far beyond the plain along which his fingers told him the wall existed, was parted by a rivulet of water falling quickly from a height toward his feet with a loud noise of splashing. He jumped backward in automatic panic, but the water ended before it reached his feet. It didn't stop coming, but it didn't reach the floor. He put his hand out. It was not water, but a light illusion of water. It did not wet his hand. He felt nothing. But his eyes stubbornly resisted the evidence they saw water. He followed the rivulet upward and eventually came to something that was water, a thinner stream issuing from the faucet. It was cold. His fingers found the oblong again and experimented, pushing here and there. The temperature shifted quickly and he found the spot that produced water of suitable tepidity. He did not find any soap. Somewhat reluctantly, he began to rub his unsoaped hands against each other under what seemed a natural spring that should have been soaking him from head to foot, but did not. And as though the mechanism could read his mind, or more likely was guided by the rubbing together of his hands, he felt the water grow soapy, while the spring he did, didn't see, grew bubbles and developed into foam. Still reluctant, he bent over the sink and rubbed his face with the same soapy water. He felt the bristles of his beard, but knew that there was no way in which he could translate the equipment of this room into a shave without instruction. He finished and held his hands helplessly under the water. How did he stop the soap? He did not have to ask. 
Presumably, his hands, no longer rubbing either themselves or his face, controlled that. The water lost its soapy feel, and the soap was rinsed from his hands. He splashed the water against his face, without rubbing, and that was rinsed too. Without the help of vision and with the clumsiness of one unused to the process, he managed to soak his shirt badly. Towels, paper... He stepped back, eyes closed, holding his head forward to avoid dripping more water on his clothes. Stepping back was apparently the key action, for he felt the warm flow of an air current. He placed his face within it, and then his hands. He opened his eyes and found the spring no longer flowing. He used his hands and found that he could feel no real water. The knot in his stomach had long since dissolved into irritation, he recognized that personals varied enormously from world to world, but somehow this nonsense of simulated outside went too far. On Earth, a personal was a huge community chamber restricted to one gender with private cubicles to which one had a key. On Solaria, one entered a personal through a narrow corridor appended to one side of a house, as though Solarians hoped that it would not be considered a part of their home. In both worlds, however, though so different in every possible way, the personals were clearly defined, and the function of everything in them could not be mistaken. Why should there be on Aurora this elaborate pretense of rusticity that totally masked every part of a personal? Why? At any rate, his annoyance gave him little emotional room in which to feel uneasy over the pretense of outside. He moved in the direction in which he recalled having seen the translucent half-door. It was not the correct direction. He found it only by following the wall slowly and after barking various parts of his body against protuberances. In the end, he found himself urinating into the illusion of a small pond that did not seem to be receiving the stream properly. His knees told him that he was aiming correctly between the sides of what he took to be a urinal and he told himself that if he were using the wrong receptacle or misjudging his aim, the fault was not his. For a moment, when done, he considered finding the sink again for a final hand rinse and decided against it. He just couldn't face the search and that false waterfall. Instead, he found, by groping, the door through which he had entered, but he did not know he had found it until his hand touch resulted in its opening. The light died out at once, and the normal, non-illusory gleam of day surrounded him. Daniil was waiting for him, along with Fastolf and Giscard. Fastolf said, You took nearly twenty minutes. We were beginning to fear for you. Bailey felt himself grow warm with rage. I had problems with your foolish illusions, he said in a tightly controlled fashion. Fastolf's mouth pursed, and his eyebrows rose in a silent, Oh. He said, There is a contact just inside the door that controls the illusion. It can make it dimmer and allow you to see reality through it, or it can wipe out the illusion altogether if you wish. I was not told. Are all your personals like this? Fastolf said, No. Personals on Aurora commonly possess illusory qualities, but the nature of the illusion varies with the individual. The illusion of natural greenery pleases me, and I vary its details from time to time. One grows tired of anything, you know, after a while. There are some people who make use of erotic illusions, but that is not to my taste. Of course, when one is familiar with personals, the illusions offer no trouble, the rooms are quite standard, and one knows where everything is. It's no worse than moving about a well-known place in the dark, but tell me, Mr. Bailey, why didn't you find your way out and ask for directions? Bailey said, Because I didn't wish to. I admit that I was extremely irritated over the illusions, but I accepted them. After all, it was Daniil who led me to the personal, and he gave me no instructions, nor any warning. He would certainly have instructed me at length if he had been left to his own devices, for he would surely have foreseen harm to me otherwise. I had to assume, therefore, that you had carefully instructed him not to warn me, and since I didn't really expect you to play a practical joke on me, I had to assume that you had a serious purpose in doing so. 
Oh, after all, you had asked me to come outside, and when I agreed, you immediately asked me if I wished to visit the personal. I decided that the purpose of sending me into an illusion of outside was to see whether I could endure it, or if I would come running out in panic. If I could endure it, I might be trusted with the real thing. Well, I endured it. I'm a little wet, thank you, but that will dry soon enough. Fastolf said, You are a clear-thinking person, Mr. Bailey. I apologize for the nature of the test and for the discomfort I caused you. I was merely trying to ward off the possibility of far greater discomfort. Do you still wish to come out with me? I not only wish it, Dr. Fastolf, I insist on it. 20. They made their way through a corridor with Daniil and Giscard following close behind. Fastolf said chattily, I hope you won't mind the robots accompanying us. Aurorans never go anywhere without at least one robot in attendance, and in your case in particular, I must insist that Daniil and Giscard be with you at all times. He opened a door, and Bailey tried to stand firm against the beat of sunshine and wind, to say nothing of the envelopment of the strange and subtly alien smell of Aurora's land. Fastolf stayed to one side, and Giscard went out first. The robot looked keenly about for a few moments. One had the impression that all his senses were intently engaged. He looked back, and Daniil joined him and did the same. Leave them for a moment, Mr. Bailey, said Fastolf, and they will tell us when they think it's safe for us to emerge. Well, let me take the opportunity of once again apologizing for the scurvy trick I played on you with respect to the personal. I assure you we would have known if you were in trouble. Your various vital signs were being recorded. I am very pleased, though not entirely surprised, that you penetrated my purpose. He smiled and with almost unnoticeable hesitation, placed his hand upon Bailey's left shoulder and gave it a friendly squeeze. Bailey held himself stiffly. You seem to have forgotten your earlier scurvy trick, your apparent attack on me with the spicer. If you will assure me that we will now deal with each other frankly and honestly, I will consider these matters as having been of reasonable intent. Done. Is it safe to leave now? Bailey looked out to where Giscard and Daniil had moved farther and had separated from each other to right and left, still watching and sensing. Not quite yet. They will move all around the establishment. Daniil tells me that you invited him into the personal with you. Was that seriously meant? Yes. I knew he had no need, but I felt it might be impolite to exclude him. I wasn't sure of Auroran custom in that respect, despite all the reading I did on Auroran matters. I suppose that isn't one of those things Aurorans feel necessary to mention, and of course one can't expect the books to make any attempt to prepare visiting Earthmen concerning these subjects, because there are so few visiting Earthmen. Exactly. The point is, of course, that robots never visit personals. It is the one place where human beings can be free of them. I suppose there is the feeling that one should feel free of them at some periods and in some places. Bailey said, And yet when Daniil was on Earth on the occasion of Sartan's death three years ago, I tried to keep him out of the community personal by saying he had no need. Still, he insisted on entering. And rightly so. He was, on that occasion, strictly instructed to give no indication he was not human for reasons you well remember. Here on Aurora, however, ah, they are done. The robots were coming toward the door, and Daniil gestured them outward. Fastolf held out his arm to bar Bailey's way. If you don't mind, Mr. Bailey, I will go out first. Count to one hundred patiently, and then join us. Twenty-one. Bailey, on the count of one hundred, stepped out firmly and walked toward Fastolf. His face was perhaps too stiff, his jaws too tightly clenched, his back too straight. He looked about. The scene was not very different from that which had been presented in the personal. Fastolf had, perhaps, used his own grounds as a model. Everywhere 
there was green, and in one place there was a stream filtering down a slope. It was perhaps artificial, but it was not an illusion. The water was real. He could feel the spray when he passed near it. There was somehow a tameness to it all. The outside on earth seemed wilder and more grandly beautiful, what little Bailey had seen of it. Fastolf said, with a gentle touch on Bailey's upper arm and a motion of his hand, Come in this direction. Look there. A space between two trees revealed an expanse of lawn. For the first time, there was a sense of distance, and on the horizon one could see a dwelling place, low-roofed, broad, and so green in color that it almost melted into the countryside. This is a residential area, said Fastolf. It might not seem so to you, since you are accustomed to Earth's tremendous hives, but we are in the Auroran city of Eos, which is actually the administrative center of the planet. There are 20,000 human beings living here, which makes it the largest city, not only on Aurora, but on all the spacer worlds. There are as many people in Eos as on all of Solaria. Fastolf said it with pride. How many robots, Dr. Fastolf? In this area? Uh, perhaps a hundred thousand. On the planet as a whole, there are fifty robots to each human being on the average. Not ten thousand per human as on Solaria. Most of our robots are on our farms, in our mines, in our factories, in space. If anything, we suffer from a shortage of robots, particularly of household robots. Most Aurorans make do with two or three such robots, some with only one. Still, we don't want to move in the direction of Solaria. How many human beings have no household robots at all? None at all. That would not be in the public interest. If a human being, for any reason, could not afford a robot, he or she would be granted one which would be maintained, if necessary, at public expense. What happens as the population rises? Do you add more robots? Fastolf shook his head. Well, the population does not rise. Aurora's population is 200 million, and that has remained stable for three centuries. It is the number desired. Surely you have read that in the books you viewed. Yes, I have, admitted Bailey. But I found it difficult to believe. Let me assure you it's true. It gives each of us ample land, ample space, ample privacy, and an ample share of the world's resources. There are neither too many people as on Earth, nor too few as on Solaria. He held out his arm for Bailey to take, so they might continue walking. What you see, Fastolf said, is a tame world. It is what I have brought you out to show you, Mr. Bailey. There is no danger in it? Always some danger. We do have storms, rock slides, earthquakes, blizzards, avalanches, a volcano or two. Accidental death can never be entirely done away with. And there are even the passions of angry or envious persons, the follies of the immature and the madness of the short-sighted, these things are very minor irritants, however, and do not much affect the civilized quiet that rests upon our world. Fastolf seemed to ruminate over his words for a moment. Then he sighed and said, I can scarcely want it to be any other way, but I have certain intellectual reservations. We have brought here to Aurora only those plants and animals we felt would be useful, ornamental, or both, we did our best to eliminate anything we would consider weeds, vermin, or even less than standard. We selected strong, healthy, and attractive human beings, according to our own views, of course. We have tried to... But you smile, Mr. Bailey. Bailey had not. His mouth had merely twitched. No, no, he said. There is nothing to smile about. There is for I know as well as you do that I myself am not attractive by aurora and standards. The trouble is that we cannot altogether control gene combinations and intrauterine influences. Nowadays, of course, with ectogenesis becoming more common, though I hope it shall never be as common as it is on Solaria, I would be eliminated in the late fetal stage. In which case, Dr. Fastolf, the worlds would have lost a great theoretical roboticist. Perfectly correct, 
said Fastolf, without visible embarrassment. But the worlds would never have known that, would they? In any case, we have labored to set up a very simple but completely workable ecological balance, an equable climate, a fertile soil, and resources as evenly distributed as is possible. The result is a world that produces all of everything that we need and that is, if I may personify, considerate of our wants. Shall I tell you the ideal for which we have striven? Please do, said Bailey. We have labored to produce a planet which, taken as a whole, would obey the three laws of robotics. It does nothing to harm human beings, either by commission or omission. It does what we want it to do, as long as we do not ask it to harm human beings. And it protects itself, except at times and in places where it must serve us or save us, even at the price of harm to itself. Nowhere else, neither on Earth nor in the other spacer worlds, is this so nearly true as here on Aurora. Bailey said sadly, Earthmen, too, have longed for this, but we have long since grown too numerous, and we have too greatly damaged our planet in the days of our ignorance to be able to do very much about it now. But one of Aurora's indigenous life forms, surely you did not come to a dead planet. Fastolf said, You know we didn't, if you have viewed books on our history. Aurora had vegetation and animal life when we arrived, and a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere. This was true of all the fifty spacer worlds. Peculiarly, in every case, the life forms were sparse and not very varied, nor were they particularly tenacious in their hold on their own planet. We took over, so to speak, without a struggle, and what is left of the indigenous life is in our aquaria, our zoos, and in a few carefully maintained primeval areas. We do not really understand why the life-bearing planets that human beings have encountered have been so feebly life-bearing, why only Earth itself has been overflowing with madly tenacious varieties of life filling every environmental niche, and why only Earth has developed any sign of intelligence whatever. Bailey said, Maybe it is coincidence, the accident of incomplete exploration. We know so few planets so far. I admit said Fastolf, that that is the most likely explanation. Somewhere there may be an ecological balance as complex as that of Earth. Somewhere there may be intelligent life and a technological civilization. Yet Earth's life and intelligence has spread outward for parsecs in every direction. If there is life and intelligence elsewhere, why have they not spread out as well? And why have we not encountered each other? That might happen tomorrow, for all we know. It might. And if such an encounter is imminent, all the more reason why we should not be passively waiting. For we are growing passive, Mr. Bailey. No new spacer world has been settled in two and a half centuries. Our worlds are so tame, so delightful, we do not wish to leave them. This world was originally settled, you see, because Earth had grown so unpleasant that the risks and dangers of new and empty worlds seemed preferable by comparison. By the time our fifty spacer worlds were developed, Solaria last of all, there was no longer any push, any need to move out elsewhere, and Earth itself had retreated to its underground caves of steel. The end. Fini. You don't really mean that. If we stay as we are, if we remain placid and comfortable and unmoving, yes, I do mean that. Humanity must expand its range somehow if it is to continue to flourish. One method of expansion is through space, through a constant pioneering reach toward other worlds. If we fail in this, some other civilization that is undergoing such expansion will reach us, and we will not be able to stand against its dynamism. You expect a space war like a hyperwave shoot 'em up No, I doubt that that would be necessary. A civilization that is expanding through space will not need our few worlds, and will probably be too intellectually advanced to feel the need to batter its way into hegemony here. 
If, however, we are surrounded by a more lively, a more vibrant civilization, we will wither away by the mere force of the comparison. We will die of the realization of what we have become and of the potential we have wasted. Of course, we might substitute other expansions, an expansion of scientific understanding or of cultural vigor, for instance. I fear, however, that these expansions are not separable. To fade in one is to fade in all. Certainly, we are fading in all. We live too long. We are too comfortable. Bailey said, On Earth, we think of spacers as all-powerful, as totally self-confident. I cannot believe I'm hearing this from one of you. You won't from any other spacer. My views are unfashionable. Others would find them intolerable, and I don't often speak of such things to Aurorans. Instead, I simply talk about a new drive for further settlement without expressing my fears of the catastrophes which will result if we abandon colonization. In that, at least, I have been winning. Aurora has been seriously, even enthusiastically, considering a new era of exploration and settlement. You say that, said Bailey, without any noticeable enthusiasm. What's wrong? It's just that we are approaching my motive for the destruction of Jander Pennell. Fastolf paused, shook his head, and continued. I wish, Mr. Bailey, I could understand human beings better. I have spent six decades in studying the intricacies of the positronic brain, and I expect to spend fifteen to twenty more on the problem. In this time, I have barely brushed against the problem of the human brain, which is enormously more intricate. Are there laws of humanics, as there are laws of robotics? How many laws of humanics might there be, and how can they be expressed mathematically? I don't know. Perhaps, though, there may come a day when someone will work out the laws of humanics and then be able to predict the broad strokes of the future and know what might be in store for humanity instead of merely guessing, as I do, and know what to do to make things better instead of merely speculating. I dream sometimes of founding a mathematical science which I think of as psychohistory, but I know I can't and I fear no one ever will. He faded to a halt. Bailey waited, then said softly, And your motive for the destruction of Jander Pennell, Dr. Fastolf? Fastolf did not seem to hear the question. At any rate, he did not respond. He said instead, Daniel and Giscard are again signaling that all is clear. Tell me, Mr. Bailey, would you consider walking with me farther afield? Where? asked Bailey cautiously. Toward a neighboring establishment, in that direction across the lawn. Would the openness disturb you? Bailey pressed his lips together and looked in that direction, as though attempting to measure its effect. I believe I could endure it. I anticipate no trouble. Giscard, who was close enough to hear, now approached still closer, his eyes showing no glow in the daylight. If his voice was without human emotion, his words marked his concern. Sir, may I remind you that on the journey here, you suffered serious discomfort on the descent to the planet. Bailey turned to face him. However he might feel toward Daniil, whatever warmth of past association might paper over his attitude toward robots, there was none here. He found the more primitive Giscard distinctly repellent. He labored to fight down the touch of anger he felt and said, I was incautious aboard ship, boy, because I was overly curious. I faced a vision I had never experienced before and I had no time for adjustment. This is different. Sir, do you feel discomfort now? May I be assured of that? Whether I do or not, said Bailey firmly, reminding himself that the robot was helplessly in the grip of the first law, and trying to be polite to a lump of metal who, after all, had Bailey's welfare as his only care. Doesn't matter. I have my duty to perform, and that cannot be done if I am to hide in enclosures. Your duty? Giscard said it 
as though he had not been programmed to understand the word. Bailey looked quickly in Fastolf's direction, but Fastolf stood quietly in his place and made no move to intervene. He seemed to be listening with abstracted interest, as though weighing the reaction of a robot of a given type to a new situation and comparing it with relationships, variables, constants, and differential equations only he understood. Or so Bailey thought. He felt annoyed at being part of an observation of that type and said, perhaps too sharply he knew, Do you know what duty means? That which should be done, sir, said Giscard. Your duty is to obey the laws of robotics, and human beings have their laws too, as your master, Dr. Fastolf, was only this moment saying, which must be obeyed. I must do that which I have been assigned to do. It is important. But to go into the open, when you are not, it must be done nevertheless. My son may some day go to another planet, one much less comfortable than this one, and expose himself to the outside for the rest of his life. And if I could, I would go with him. But why would you do that? I have told you I consider it my duty. Sir, I cannot disobey the laws. Can you disobey yours? For I must urge you to... I can choose not to do my duty, but I do not choose to. And that is sometimes the stronger compulsion, Giscard. There was silence for a moment, and then Giscard said, Would it do you harm if I were to succeed in persuading you not to walk into the open? In so far as I would then feel I have failed in my duty, it would. More harm than any discomfort you might feel in the open? Much more. Thank you for explaining this, sir, said Giscard. And Bailey imagined there was a look of satisfaction on the robot's largely expressionless face. The human tendency to personify was irrepressible. Giscard stepped back, and now Dr. Fastolf spoke. That was interesting, Mr. Bailey. Giscard needed instructions before he could quite understand how to arrange the positronic potential response to the three laws, or, rather, how those potentials were to arrange themselves in the light of the situation. Now he knows how to behave. Bailey said, I noticed that Daniil asked no questions. Fastolf said, Daniil knows you. He has been with you on Earth and on Solaria. But come, shall we walk? Let us move slowly. Look about carefully, and if at any time you should wish to rest, to wait, even to turn back, I will count on you to let me know. I will. But what is the purpose of this walk? Since you anticipate possible discomfort on my part, you cannot be suggesting it idly. I am not, said Fastolf. I think you will want to see the inert body of gender. As a matter of form, yes, but I rather think it will tell me nothing. I am sure of that, but then you might also have the opportunity to question the one who was gender's quasi-owner at the time of the tragedy. Surely you would like to speak to some human being other than myself concerning the matter. 22. Fastolf moved slowly forward, plucking a leaf from a shrub that he passed, bending it in two and nibbling at it. Bailey looked at him curiously, wondering how spacers could put something untreated, unheated, even unwashed into their mouths when they feared infection so badly. He remembered that Aurora was free, entirely free, of pathogenic microorganisms, but found the action repulsive anyway. Repulsion did not have to have a rational basis, he thought defensively, and suddenly found himself on the edge of excusing the spacers their attitude toward Earthmen. He drew back. That was different. Human beings were involved there. Giscard moved ahead, forward, and toward the right. Daniil lagged behind and toward the left. Aurora's orange sun, Bailey scarcely noticed the orange tinge now, was mildly warm on his back, lacking the febrile heat that Earth's sun had in summer. But then, what was the climate and season on this portion of Aurora right now? The grass, or whatever it was, it looked like grass, was a bit stiffer and springier than he recalled it being on Earth, and the ground was hard, as though it had not rained for a while. 
They were moving toward the house up ahead, presumably the house of Jander's quasi-owner. Bailey could hear the rustle of some animal in the grass to the right, the sudden chirrup of a bird somewhere in a tree behind him, the small, unplaceable clatter of insects all about. These, he told himself, were all animals with ancestors that had once lived on earth. They had no way of knowing that this patch of ground they inhabited was not all there was, forever and forever back in time. The very trees and grass had arisen from other trees and grass that had once grown on earth. Only human beings could live on this world and know that they were not autochthonous but had stemmed from earthmen. And yet, did the spacers really know it, or did they simply put it out of their mind? Would the time come, perhaps, when they would not know it at all? when they would not remember which world they had come from or whether there was a world of origin at all. Dr. Fastolf, he said suddenly, in part to break the chain of thought that he found to be growing oppressive, you still have not told me your motive for the destruction of Jander. True, I have not. Now why do you suppose, Mr. Bailey, I have labored to work out the theoretical basis for the positronic brains of humaniform robots? I cannot say. Well, think. The task is to design a robotic brain as close to the human as possible, and that would require, it would seem, a certain reach into the poetic. He paused, and his small smile became an outright grin. You know, it always bothers some of my colleagues when I tell them that. If a conclusion is not poetically balanced, it cannot be scientifically true. They tell me they don't know what that means. Bailey said, I'm afraid I don't either, but I know what it means. I can't explain it, but I feel the explanation without being able to put it into words, which may be why I have achieved results my colleagues have not. However, I grow grandiose, which is a good sign I should become prosaic. To imitate a human brain, when I know almost nothing about the workings of the human brain, needs an intuitive leap, something that feels to me like poetry and the same intuitive leap that would give me the humaniform positronic brain should surely give me a new access of knowledge about the human brain itself. That was my belief, that through humaniformity I might take at least a small step toward the psychohistory I told you about. I see. And if I succeeded in working out a theoretical structure that would imply a humaniform positronic brain, I would need a humaniform body to place it in. The brain does not exist by itself, you understand. It interacts with the body so that a humaniform brain in a non-humaniform body would become, to an extent, itself non-human. Are you sure of that? Quite. You have only to compare Daniil with Gisgard. Then Daniil was constructed as an experimental device for furthering the understanding of the human brain? You have it. I labored two decades at the task with Sarton. There were numerous failures that had to be discarded. Daniil was the first true success, and of course I kept him for further study and out of... He grinned lopsidedly as though admitting to something silly. Affection. After all, Daniil can grasp the notion of human duty, while Giscard, with all his virtues, has trouble doing so. Well, you saw... And Daniil's stay on Earth with me three years ago was his first assigned task? His first of any importance, yes. When Sartan was murdered, we needed something that was a robot and could withstand the infectious diseases of Earth and yet looked enough like a man to get around the anti-robotic prejudices of Earth's people. Oh, an astonishing coincidence that Daniil should be right at hand at that time. Oh, do you believe in coincidences? It is my feeling that any time at which a development as revolutionary as the humaniform robot came into being, some task that would require its use would present itself. Similar tasks had probably been presenting themselves regularly in all the years that Daniil did not exist, and because Daniil did not exist, other solutions and devices had to be used. And have your labors been successful, Dr. Fastolf? Do you now understand the human brain better than you did? 
Fast Elf had been moving more and more slowly, and Bailey had been matching his progress to the others. They were now standing still, about halfway between Fast Elf's establishment and the others. It was the most difficult point for Bailey, since it was equally distant from protection in either direction, but he fought down the growing uneasiness, determined not to provoke Giscard. He did not wish, by some motion or outcry or even expression, to activate the inconvenience of Giscard's desire to save him. He did not want to have himself lifted up and carried off to shelter. Fastolf showed no sign of understanding Bailey's difficulty. He said, There's no question but that advances in mentology have been carried through. There remain enormous problems, and perhaps these will always remain, but there has been progress. Still. Still? Still, Aurora is not satisfied with a purely theoretical study of the human brain. Uses for humaniform robots have been advanced that I do not approve of, such as the use on Earth. No, that was a brief experiment that I rather approved of and was even fascinated by. Could Daniil fool Earth people? It turned out he could, though. Of course, the eyes of Earthmen for robots are not very keen. Daniil cannot fool the eyes of Aurorans, though I dare say future humaniform robots could be improved to the point where they would. There are other tasks that have been proposed, however, such as... Fastolf gazed thoughtfully into the distance. I told you this world was tame when I began my movement to encourage a renewed period of exploration and settlement, it was not to the super-comfortable Aurorans or spacers generally that I looked for leadership. I rather thought we ought to encourage Earthmen to take the lead. With their horrid world, excuse me, and short lifespan, they have so little to lose, I thought they would surely welcome the chance, especially if we were to help them technologically. I spoke to you about such a thing when I saw you on Earth three years ago. Do you remember? He looked sidelong at Bailey. Bailey said stolidly, I remember quite well. In fact, you started a chain of thought in me that has resulted in a small movement on Earth in that very direction. Indeed. It would not be easy, I imagine. There is the claustrophilia of you Earthmen, your dislike of leaving your walls. We are fighting it, Dr. Fastolf. Our organization is planning to move out into space. My son is a leader in the movement, and I hope the day may come when he leaves Earth at the head of an expedition to settle a new world. If we do indeed receive the technological help you speak of, Bailey let that dangle. If we supplied the ships, you mean? And other equipment? Yes, Dr. Fastolf. There are difficulties... Many Aurorans do not want Earthmen to move outward and settle new worlds. They fear the rapid spread of Earthish culture, its beehive cities, its chaoticism. He stirred uneasily and said, Why are we standing here, I wonder? Let's move on. He walked slowly forward and said, I have argued that that would not be the way it would be. I have pointed out that the settlers from Earth would not be Earthmen in the classical mode. They would not be enclosed in cities. Coming to a new world, they would be like the Auroran fathers coming here. They would develop a manageable ecological balance and would be closer to Aurorans than to Earthmen in attitude. Would they not then develop all the weaknesses you find in spacer culture, Dr. Fastolf? Perhaps not. They would learn from our mistakes. But that is academic, for something has developed which makes the argument moot. And what is that? Why, the humaniform robot. You see, there are those who see the humaniform robot as the perfect settler. It is they who can build the new worlds. Bailey said, well, you've always had robots. Do you mean this idea was never advanced before? Oh, it was. But it was always clearly unworkable. Ordinary non-humaniform robots, without immediate human supervision, building a world that would suit their own non-humaniform selves, could not be expected to tame and build a world that would be suitable for the more delicate and flexible minds and bodies of human beings. 
Well, surely the world they would build would serve as a reasonable first approximation. Surely it would, Mr. Bailey. It is a sign of a roar and decay, however, that there is an overwhelming feeling among our people that a reasonable first approximation is unreasonably insufficient. A group of humaniform robots, on the other hand, as closely resembling human beings in body and mind as possible, would succeed in building a world which, in suiting themselves, would also inevitably suit Aurorans. Do you follow the reasoning? Completely. They would build a world so well, you see, that when they are done and Aurorans are finally willing to leave, our human beings will step out of Aurora and into another Aurora. They will never have left home. They will simply have another newer home, exactly like the older one, in which to continue their decay. Do you follow that reasoning, too? I see your point, but I take it that Aurorans do not. May not. I think I can argue the point effectively if the opposition does not destroy me politically via this matter of the destruction of gender. Do you see the motive attributed to me? I am supposed to have embarked on a program of the destruction of humaniform robots rather than allow them to be used to settle other planets, or so my enemies say. It was Bailey now who stopped walking. He looked thoughtfully at Fastolf and said, You understand, Dr. Fastolf, that it is to Earth's interest that your point of view went out completely. And to your own interests as well, Mr. Bailey, and to mine. But if I put myself to one side for the moment, it still remains vital to my world that our people be allowed, encouraged, and helped to explore the galaxy, that we retain as much of our own ways as we are comfortable with, that we not be condemned to imprisonment on Earth forever, since there we can only perish. Fastolf said, Some of you, I think, will insist on remaining imprisoned. Of course. Perhaps almost all of us will. However, at least some of us, as many of us as possible, will escape if given permission. It is therefore my duty, not only as a representative of the law of a large fraction of humanity, but as an earthman, plain and simple, to help you clear your name, whether you are guilty or innocent. Nevertheless, I can throw myself wholeheartedly into this task only if I know that, in fact, the accusations against you are unjustified. Of course, I understand. In the light, then, of what you have told me of the motive attributed to you, assure me once again that you did not do this thing. Fastolf said, Mr. Bailey, I understand completely that you have no choice in this matter. I am quite aware that I can tell you with impunity that I am guilty and that you would still be compelled by the nature of your needs and those of your world to work with me to mask that fact. Indeed, if I were actually guilty, I would feel compelled to tell you so, so that you could take that fact into consideration and, knowing the truth, work the more efficiently to rescue me and yourself. But I cannot do so because the fact is I am innocent. However much appearances may be against me, I did not destroy Jander. Such a thing never entered my mind. Never? Fastolf smiled sadly. Oh, I may have thought once or twice that Aurora would have been better off if I had never worked out the ingenious notions that led to the development of the humaniform positronic brain, or that it would be better off if such brains proved unstable and readily subject to mental freeze-out. But those were fugitive thoughts. Not for a split second did I contemplate bringing about Jander's destruction for this reason. Then we must destroy this motive that they attribute to you. Good. But how? We could show that it serves no purpose. What good does it do to destroy gender? More humaniform robots can be built. Thousands, millions. I'm afraid that's not so, Mr. Bailey. None can be built. I alone know how to design them, and as long as robot colonization is a possible destiny, I refuse to build any more. Jander is gone, and only Daniil is left. Oh, the secret will be discovered by others. Fastolf's chin went up. I would like to see the roboticist capable of it. My enemies have established a robotics institute with no other purpose than to work out the methods behind the construction of a humaniform robot, but they won't succeed. 
They certainly haven't succeeded so far, and I know they won't succeed. Bailey frowned. If you are the only man who knows the secret of the humaniform robots, and if your enemies are desperate for it, will they not try to get it out of you? Of course, by threatening my political existence, by perhaps maneuvering some punishment that will forbid my working in the field and thus putting an end to my professional existence as well, they hope to have me agree to share the secret with them. They may even have the legislature direct me to share the secret on the pain of confiscation of property, imprisonment, who knows what. However, I have made up my mind to submit to anything, anything, rather than give in. But I don't want to have to, you understand. Do they know of your determination to resist? I hope so. I have told them plainly enough. I presume they think I'm bluffing, that I'm not serious, but I am. But if they believe you, they might take more serious steps. What do you mean? I'll steal your papers, kidnap you, torture you. Fastolf broke into a loud laugh and Bailey flushed. He said, I hate to sound like a hyperwave drama, but have you considered that? Fastolf said, Mr. Bailey, first, my robots can protect me. It would take full-scale war to capture me or my work. Second, even if somehow they succeeded, not one of the roboticists opposed to me could bear to make it plain that the only way he could obtain the secret of the humaniform positronic brain is to steal it or force it from me. His or her professional reputation would be completely wiped out. Third, such things on Aurora are unheard of. The merest hint of an unprofessional attempt upon me would swing the legislature and public opinion in my favor at once. Is that so? muttered Bailey, silently damning the fact of having to work in a culture whose details he simply didn't understand. Yes, take my word for it. I wish they would try something of this melodramatic sort. I wish they were so incredibly stupid as to do so. In fact, Mr. Bailey, I wish I could persuade you to go to them, worm your way into their confidence, and cajole them into mounting an attack on my establishment, or waylaying me on an empty road, or anything of the sort that I imagine is common on earth. Bailey said stiffly, I don't think that would be my style. I don't think so either, so I have no intention of trying to implement my wish. And believe me, that is too bad, for if we cannot persuade them to try the suicidal method of force, they will continue to do something much better from their standpoint. They will destroy me by falsehoods. What falsehoods? It is not just the destruction of one robot they attribute to me. That is bad enough and just might suffice. They are whispering, and is only a whisper as yet, that the death is merely an experiment of mine and a dangerous, successful one. They whisper that I am working out a system for destroying humaniform brains rapidly and efficiently so that when my enemies do create their own humaniform robots, I, together with members of my party, will be able to destroy them all, thus preventing Aurora from settling new worlds and leaving the galaxy to my Earthmen confederates. Surely there can be no truth in this. Of course not. I told you these are lies, and ridiculous lies, too. No such method of destruction is even theoretically possible, and the Robotics Institute people are not on the point of creating their own humaniform robots. I cannot conceivably indulge in an orgy of mass destruction even if I wanted to. I cannot. Well, doesn't the whole thing fall by its own weight, then? Unfortunately, it's not likely to do so in time. It may be silly nonsense, but it will probably last long enough to sway public opinion against me to the point of swinging just enough votes in the legislature to defeat me. Eventually, it will all be recognized as nonsense, but by then, it will be too late. And please notice that Earth is being used as a whipping boy in this. The charge that I am laboring on behalf of Earth is a powerful one, and many will choose to believe the whole farrago against their own better sense because of their dislike of Earth and Earth people. Bailey said, What you're telling me is that active resentment against Earth is being built up. Fastolf said, Exactly, Mr. Bailey. The situation grows worse for me and for Earth every day, and we have very little time. 
But isn't there an easy way of knocking this thing on its head? Bailey, in despair, decided it was time to fall back on Daniil's point. If you were indeed anxious to test a method for the destruction of a humaniform robot, why seek out one in another establishment, one with which it might be inconvenient to experiment? You had Daniil himself in your own establishment. He was at hand and convenient. Would not the experiment have been conducted upon him if there were any truth at all in the rumor? No, no, said Fastolf. I couldn't get anyone to believe that. Daniil was my first success, my triumph. I wouldn't destroy him under any circumstances. Naturally, I would turn to Jander. Everyone would see that, and I would be a fool to try to persuade them that it would have made more sense for me to sacrifice Daniil. They were walking again, nearly at their destination. Bailey was in deep silence, his face tight-lipped. Fastolf said, How do you feel, Mr. Bailey? Bailey said in a low voice, if you mean as far as being outside is concerned, I am not even aware of it. If you mean as far as our dilemma is concerned, I think I am as close to giving up as I can possibly be without putting myself into an ultrasonic brain-dissolving chamber. Then passionately, Why did you send for me, Dr. Fastolf? Why have you given me this job? What have I ever done to you to be treated so? Actually, said Fastolf, it was not my idea to begin with, and I can only plead my desperation. Well, whose idea was it? It was the owner of this establishment we have now reached who suggested it originally, and I had no better idea. The owner of this establishment? Why would he... She. Well, then why would she suggest anything of the sort? Oh, <laughs> I haven't explained that she knows you, have I, Mr. Bailey? Well, there she is, waiting for us now. Bailey looked up, bewildered. Jehoshaphat, he whispered. Chapter 6 Gladiah 23. The young woman who faced them said with a wan smile, I knew that when I met you again, Elijah, that would be the first word I would hear. Bailey stared at her. She had changed. Her hair was shorter, and her face was even more troubled now than it had been two years ago, and seemed more than two years older, somehow. She was still unmistakably Gladia, however. There was still the triangular face, with its pronounced cheekbones and small chin. She was still short, still slight of figure, still vaguely childlike. He had dreamed of her frequently, though not in an overtly erotic fashion, after returning to Earth. His dreams were always stories of not being able to quite reach her. She was always there, a little too far off to speak to easily. She never quite heard when he called her. She never grew nearer when he approached her. It was not hard to understand why the dreams had been as they were, she was a Solarian-born person and, as such, was rarely supposed to be in the physical presence of other human beings. Elijah had been forbidden to her because he was human, and beyond that, of course, because he was from Earth. Though the exigencies of the murder case he was investigating forced them to meet, throughout their relationship she was completely covered, when physically together, to prevent actual contact. And yet... At their last meeting, she had, in defiance of good sense, fleetingly touched his cheek with her bare hand. She must have known she could be infected as a result. He cherished the touch the more for every aspect of her upbringing combined to make it unthinkable. The dreams had faded in time. Bailey said, rather stupidly, It was you who owned the... He paused, and Glodaya finished the sentence for him. The robot. And two years ago, it was I who possessed the husband. Whatever I touch is destroyed. Without really knowing what he was doing, Bailey reached up to place his hand on his cheek. Glodaya did not seem to notice. She said, You came to rescue me that first time. Forgive me, but I had to call on you again. Come in, Elijah. Come in, Dr. Fastolf. Fastolf stepped back to allow Bailey to walk in first. He followed. 
Behind Fastolf came Daniil and Giscard, and they, with the characteristic self-effacement of robots, stepped to unoccupied wall niches on opposite sides and remained silently standing, backs to the wall. For one moment, it seemed that Glodaya would treat them with the indifference with which human beings commonly treated robots. After a glance at Daniil, however, she turned away and said to Fastolf in a voice that choked a little, That one, please, ask him to leave. Fastolf said with a small motion of surprise, Daniil? He's too, too gender-like. Fastolf turned to look at Daniil, and a look of clear pain crossed his face momentarily. Of course, my dear. You must forgive me. I did not think. Daniil, move into another room and remain there while we are here. Without a word, Daniil left. Glodaya glanced a moment at Giscard, as though to judge whether he also was too gender-like, and turned away with a small shrug. She said, Would either of you like refreshment of any kind? I have an excellent coconut drink, fresh and cold. No, Glodaya, said Fastolf. I have merely brought Mr. Bailey here as I promised I would. I will not stay long. Uh, if I may have a glass of water, said Bailey, I won't trouble you for anything more. Glodaya raised one hand. Undoubtedly, she was under observation, for in a moment, a robot moved in noiselessly with a glass of water on a tray and a small dish of what looked like crackers with a pinkish blob on each. Bailey could not forbear taking one, even though he was not certain what it might be. It had to be something earth-descended, for he could not believe that on Aurora, he or anyone would be eating any portion of the planet's sparse indigenous biota, or anything synthetic either. Nevertheless, the descendants of earthly food species might change with time, either through deliberate cultivation or the action of a strange environment, and Fastolf at lunchtime had said that much of the Auroran diet was an acquired taste. He was pleasantly surprised. The taste was sharp and spicy, but he found it delightful and took a second almost at once. He said, Thank you, to the robot, who would not have objected to standing there indefinitely, and took the entire dish together with the glass of water. The robot left. It was late afternoon now, and the sunlight came ruddily through the western windows. Bailey had the impression that this house was smaller than Fastolf's, but it would have been more cheerful had not the sad figure of Glodaya standing in its midst provoked a dispiriting effect. That might, of course, be Bailey's imagination. Cheer, in any case, seemed to him impossible in any structure purporting to house and protect human beings that yet remained exposed to the outside beyond each wall. Not one wall, he thought, had the warmth of human life on the other side. In no direction could one look for companionship and community. Through every outer wall, every side, top and bottom, there was inanimate world. Cold. Cold. And coldness flooded back upon Bailey himself as he thought again of the dilemma in which he found himself. For a moment, the shock of meeting Glodaya again had driven it from his mind. Glodaya said, Come, sit down, Elijah. You must excuse me for not quite being myself. I am, for a second time, the center of a planetary sensation, and the first time was more than enough. Oh, I understand, Glodaya. Please do not apologize, said Bailey. And as for you, dear doctor, please don't feel you need go. Well, Fastolf looked at the time strip on the wall. I will stay for a short while, but then, my dear, there is work that must be done, though the skies fall. All the more so, since I must look forward to a near future in which I may be restrained from doing any work at all. Glodaya blinked rapidly, as though holding back tears. I know, Dr. Fastolf. You are in deep trouble because of, of what happened here, and I don't seem to have time to think of anything but my own discomfort. Fastolf said, I'll do my best to take care of my own problem, Glodaya, and there is no need for you to feel guilt over the matter. Perhaps Mr. Bailey will be able to help us both. Bailey pressed his lips together at that, then said heavily, 
I was not aware, Gladiah, that you were in any way involved in this affair. Who else would be? She said with a sigh. Well, you are, were, in possession of Jander Pennell? Not truly in possession. I had him on loan from Dr. Fastolf. Were you with him when he, um, Bailey hesitated over some way of putting it. Died? Mightn't we say died? No, I was not. And before you ask, there was no one else in the house at the time. I was alone. I am usually alone. Almost always. That is my Solarian upbringing, you remember. Of course, that is not obligatory. You two are here, and I do not mind very much. And you were definitely alone at the time Jander died. No mistake. I have said so, said Gladiah, sounding a little irritated. No, oh, never mind, Elijah. I know you must have everything repeated and repeated. I was alone, honestly. There were robots present, though. Yes, of course. When I say alone, I mean there were no other human beings present. How many robots do you possess, Gladiah? Not counting Jander. Gladiah paused as though she were counting internally. Finally, she said, Twenty. Five in the house and fifteen on the grounds. Robots move freely between my house and Dr. Fastolf's, too, so that it isn't always possible to judge when a robot is quickly seen at either establishment, whether it is one of mine or one of his. Ah, said Bailey. And since Dr. Fastolf has 57 robots in his establishment, that means if we combine the two that there are 77 robots available altogether. Are there any other establishments whose robots may mingle with yours indistinguishably? Fastolf said, There is no other establishment near enough to make that practical. Nor is the practice of mixing robots really encouraged. Gladiah and I are a special case because she is not a Roran and because I have taken rather a uh, responsibility for her. Even so, 77 robots, said Bailey. Yes, said Fastolf. But why are you making this point? Bailey said, because it means you can have any of 77 moving objects, each vaguely human in form, that you are used to seeing out of the corner of the eye, and to which you would pay no particular attention. Isn't it possible, Gladiah, that if an actual human being were to penetrate the house, for whatever purpose, you would scarcely be aware of it? It would be one more moving object, vaguely human in form, and you would pay no attention. Fastolf chuckled softly, and Gladiah unsmiling, shook her head. Elijah, she said, one can tell you are an earthman. Do you imagine that any human being, even Dr. Fastolf here, could possibly approach my house without my being informed of the fact by my robots? I might ignore a moving form, assuming it to be a robot, but no robot ever would. I was waiting for you just now when you arrived, but that was because my robots had informed me you were approaching. No. No, when Jander died, there was no other human being in the house. Except yourself. Except myself. Just as there was no one in the house except myself when my husband was killed. Fastolf interposed gently. There is a difference, Gladia. Your husband was killed with a blunt instrument. The physical presence of the murderer was necessary, and if you were the only one present, that was serious. In this case, Jander was put out of operation by a subtle spoken program. Physical presence was not necessary. Your presence here alone means nothing, especially since you do not know how to block the mind of a humaniform robot. They both turned to look at Bailey. Fast off with a quizzical look on his face, Gladiah with a sad one. It irritated Bailey that Fastolf, whose future was as bleak as Bailey's own, nevertheless seemed to face it with humor. What on earth is there to the situation to cause one to laugh like an idiot? Bailey thought morosely. Ignorance, said Bailey slowly, may mean nothing. A person may not know how to get to a certain place and yet may just happen to reach it while walking blindly. One might talk to Jander and all unknowingly pushed the button for mental freeze-out. Fastolf said, And the chances of that? You're the expert, Dr. Fastolf, and I suppose you will tell me they are very small. Incredibly small. A person may not know how to get to a certain place, 
but if the only route is a series of tight ropes stretched in sharply changing directions, what are the chances of reaching it by walking randomly while blindfolded? Gladiah's hands fluttered in extreme agitation. She clenched her fists as though to hold them steady and brought them down on her knees. I didn't do it, accident or not. I wasn't with him when it happened. I wasn't. I spoke to him in the morning. He was, well, perfectly normal. Hours later, when I summoned him, he never came. I went in search of him, and he was standing in his accustomed place, seeming quite normal. The trouble was, he didn't respond to me. He didn't respond at all. He has never responded since. Bailey said, Could something you had said to him, quite in passing, have produced mind freeze only after you had left him, an hour after, perhaps? Fastolf interposed sharply. Quite impossible, Mr. Bailey. If mind freeze is to take place, it takes place at once. Please do not badger Gladai in this fashion. She is incapable of producing mind freeze deliberately, and it is unthinkable that she would produce it accidentally. Isn't it unthinkable that it would be produced by random positronic drift, as you say it must have? Not quite as unthinkable. Both alternatives are extremely unlikely. What is the difference in unthinkability? A great one. I imagine that a mental freeze-out through positronic drift might have a probability of 1 in 10 to the 12th power. That, by accidental pattern building, 1 in 10 to the 100th power. That is just an estimate, but a reasonable one. The difference is greater than that between a single electron and the entire universe, and it is in favor of the positronic drift. There was silence for a while. Bailey said, Dr. Fastolf, you said earlier that you couldn't stay long. I have stayed too long already. Good. Then would you leave now? Fastolf began to rise, then said, Why? Because I want to speak to Glodaya alone. To badger her? I must question her without your interference. Our situation is entirely too serious to worry about politeness. Glodaya said, I am not afraid of Mr. Bailey, dear doctor. She added wistfully, My robots will protect me if his impoliteness becomes extreme. Fastolf smiled and said, Very well, Gladiah. He rose and held out his hand to her. She took it briefly. He said, I would like to have Giscard remain here for a general protection, and Daniil will continue to be in the next room, if you don't mind. Could you lend me one of your own robots to escort me back to my establishment? Certainly, said Gladia, raising her arms. You know Pandion, I believe. Of course, a sturdy and reliable escort. He left, with the robot following closely. Bailey waited, watching Gladia, studying her. She sat there, her eyes on her hands, which were folded limply together in her lap. Bailey was certain there was more for her to tell. How he could persuade her to talk, he couldn't say. But of one thing more, he was certain. While Fastolf was there, she would not tell the whole truth. 24. Finally, Gladiah looked up, her face like a little girl's. She said in a small voice, How are you, Elisha? How do you feel? Well enough, Gladiah. She said, Dr. Fastolf said he would lead you here across the open and see to it that you would have to wait some time in the worst of it. Oh, why was that? For the fun of it? No, Elisha. I had told him how you reacted to the open. You remember the time you fainted and fell into the pond? Elijah shook his head quickly. He could not deny the event or his memory thereof, but neither did he approve of the reference. He said gruffly, I'm not quite like that anymore. I've improved. But Dr. Fastolf said he would test you. Was it all right? It was sufficiently all right. I didn't faint. He remembered the episode aboard the spaceship during the approach to Aurora and ground his teeth faintly. That was different, and there was no call to discuss the matter. He said, in a deliberate change of subject, What do I call you here? How do I address you? You've been calling me Gladiah. Well, it's inappropriate, perhaps. I could say Mrs. Delmar, but you may have... She gasped and interrupted sharply. I haven't used that name since arriving here. Please don't you use it. 
What do the Aurorans call you then? They say Glodias Solaria, but that's just an indication that I'm an alien and I don't want that either. I am simply Glodaya, one name. It's not an Aurora name, and I doubt that there is another one on this planet, so it's sufficient. I'll continue to call you Elijah, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Glodaya said, I would like to serve tea. It was a statement, and Bailey nodded. He said, I didn't know that spacers drank tea. It's not earth tea. It's a plant extract that is pleasant, but is not considered harmful in any way. We call it tea. She lifted her arm, and Bailey noted that the sleeve held tightly at the wrist, and that joining it were thin, flesh-colored gloves. She was still exposing the minimum of body surface in his presence. She was still minimizing the chance of infection. Her arm remained in the air for a moment, and after a few more moments, a robot appeared with a tray. He was patently even more primitive than Giscard, but he distributed the teacups, the small sandwiches, and the bite-sized bits of pastry smoothly. He poured tea with what amounted to grace. Bailey said curiously, How do you do that, Glodaya? Do what, Elijah? You lift your arm whenever you want something, and the robots always know what it is. How did this one know you wanted tea served? It's not difficult. Every time I lift my arm, it distorts a small electromagnetic field that is maintained continuously across the room. Slightly different positions of my hand and fingers produce different distortions, and my robots can interpret these distortions as orders. I only use it for simple orders. Come here, bring tea, and so on. I haven't noticed Dr. Fastolf using the system at his establishment. It's not really a Rorin. It's our system in Solaria, and I'm used to it. Besides, I always have tea at this time. Borgraf expects it. Oh, this is Borgraf? Bailey eyed the robot with some interest, aware that he had only glanced at him before. Familiarity was quickly breeding indifference. Another day, and he would not notice robots at all. They would flutter about him unseen, and chores would appear to do themselves. Nevertheless, he did not want to fail to notice them. He wanted them to fail to be there. He said, Glodaya, I want to be alone with you, not even robots. Giscard, join Daniil. You can stand guard from there. Yes, sir, said Giscard, brought suddenly to awareness and response by the sound of his name. Glodaya seemed distantly amused. You Earth people are so odd. I know you have robots on Earth, but you don't seem to know how to handle them. You bark your orders as though they're deaf. She turned to Borgraf and, in a low voice, said, Borgraf, none of you are to enter the room until summoned. Do not interrupt us for anything short of a clear and present emergency. Borgraf said, Yes, ma'am. He stepped back, glanced over the table as though checking whether he had omitted anything, turned and left the room. Bailey was amused in his turn. Glodaya's voice had been soft, but her tone had been as crisp as though she were a sergeant major addressing a recruit. But then why should he be surprised? He had long known that it was easier to see another's follies than one's own. Glodaya said, We are now alone, Elijah. Even the robots are gone. Bailey said, You are not afraid to be alone with me? Slowly she shook her head. Why should I be? A raised arm, a gesture, a startled outcry, and several robots would be here promptly. No one on any spacer world has any reason to fear any other human being. This is not Earth. Why ever should you ask, anyway? Because there are other fears than physical ones. I would not offer you violence of any kind or mistreat you physically in any way, but are you not afraid of my questioning and what it might uncover about you? Remember that this is not Solaria either. On Solaria, I sympathized with you and was intent on demonstrating your innocence. She said in a low voice, Don't you sympathize with me now? It's not a husband dead this time. You are not suspected of murder. It's only a robot that has been destroyed, and as far as I know, you are suspected of nothing. Instead, it is Dr. Fastolf who is my problem. It is of the highest importance to me, for reasons I need not go into, that I be able to demonstrate his innocence. If the process turns out to be damaging to you, I will not be able to help it. 
I do not intend to go out of my way to save you pain. It is only fair that I tell you this. She raised her head and fixed her eyes on his arrogantly. Why should anything be damaging to me? Perhaps we will now proceed to find out, said Bailey coolly, without Dr. Fastolf present to interfere. He plucked one of the small sandwiches out of the dish with a small fork. There was no point in using his fingers and perhaps making the entire dish unusable to Gladaya. Scraped it off onto his own plate, popped it into his mouth, and then sipped at his tea. She matched him sandwich for sandwich, sip for sip. If he were going to be cool, so was she, apparently. Gladaya, said Bailey. It is important that I know exactly the relationship between you and Dr. Fastolf. You live near him, and the two of you form what is virtually a single robotic household. He is clearly concerned for you. He has made no effort to defend his own innocence, aside from the mere statement that he is innocent. But he defends you strongly the moment I harden my questioning. Gladaya smiled faintly. What do you suspect, Elijah? Bailey said, don't fence with me. I don't want to suspect. I want to know. Has Dr. Fastolf mentioned Fania? Yes, he has. Have you asked him whether Fania is his wife or merely his companion, whether he has children? Bailey stirred uneasily. He might have asked such questions, of course. In the close quarters of crowded earth, however, privacy was cherished, precisely because it had all but perished. It was virtually impossible on earth not to know all the facts about the family arrangements of others, so one never asked and pretended ignorance. It was a universally maintained fraud. Here on Aurora, of course, the earthways would not hold, yet Bailey automatically held with them. Stupid. He said, I have not yet asked. Tell me. Gladaya said, Fania is his wife. He has been married a number of times, consecutively, of course, though simultaneous marriage for either or both sexes is not entirely unheard of on Aurora. The bit of mild distaste with which she said that brought an equally mild defense. It is unheard of on Solaria. However, Dr. Fastolf's current marriage will probably soon be dissolved. Both will then be free to make new attachments, though often either or both parties do not wait for a dissolution to do that. I don't say I understand this casual way of treating the matter, Elijah, but it is how Aurorans build their relationships. Dr. Fastolf, to my knowledge, is rather straight-laced. He always maintains one marriage or another and seeks nothing outside of it. On Aurora, that is considered old-fashioned and rather silly. Bailey nodded. I've gathered something of this in my reading. Marriage takes place when there's the intention to have children, I understand. In theory, that is so, but I'm told hardly anyone takes that seriously these days. Dr. Fastolf already has two children and can't have any more, but he still marries and applies for a third. He gets turned down, of course, and knows he will. Some people don't even bother to apply. Then why bother marrying? There are social advantages to it, it's rather complicated, and not being an Aurora, and I'm not sure I understand it. Well, never mind. Tell me about Dr. Fastolf's children. He has two daughters by two different mothers. Neither of the mothers was Fania, of course. He has no sons. Each daughter was incubated in the mother's womb, as is the fashion on Aurora. Both daughters are adults now and have their own establishments. Is he close with his daughters? I don't know. He never talks about them. One is a roboticist, and I suppose he must keep in touch with her work. I believe the other is running for office on the council of one of the cities, or that she is actually in possession of the office. I don't really know. Do you know if there are any family strains? None that I am aware of, which may not go for much, Elijah. As far as I know, he is on civil terms with all his past wives. None of the dissolutions were carried through in anger. For one thing, Dr. Fastolf is not that kind of person. I can't imagine him greeting anything in life with anything more extreme than a good-natured sigh of resignation. He'll joke on his deathbed. That at least rang true, Bailey thought. He said, And Dr. Fastolf's relationship to you, the truth, please, we are not in a position to dodge the truth in order to avoid embarrassment. She looked up and met his eyes levelly. She said, there is no embarrassment to avoid. 
Dr. Han Fostolf is my friend, my very good friend. How good, Gladiah? As I said, very good. Are you waiting for the dissolution of his marriage so that you may be his next wife? No, she said it very calmly. Are you lovers, then? No. Have you been? No. Are you surprised? I merely need information, said Bailey. Then let me answer your questions connectedly, Elijah, and don't bark them at me as though you expected to surprise me into telling you something I would otherwise keep secret. She said it without noticeable anger. It was almost as though she were amused. Bailey, flushing slightly, was about to say that this was not at all his intention, but of course it was, and he would gain nothing by denying it. He said in a soft growl, Well, then go ahead. The remains of the tea littered the table between them. Bailey wondered if, under ordinary conditions, she would not have lifted her arm and bent it just so, and if the robot, Borgraf, would not have then entered silently and cleared the table. Did the fact that the litter remained upset Gladiah, and would it make her less self-controlled in her response? If so, it had better remain, but Bailey did not really hope for much for he could see no signs of Glodiah being disturbed over the mess or even of her being aware of it. Glodiah's eyes had fallen to her lap again, and her face seemed to sink lower and to become a touch harsh, as though she were reaching into a past she would much rather obliterate. She said, You caught a glimpse of my life on Solaria. It was not a happy one, but I knew no other. It was not until I experienced a touch of happiness that I suddenly knew exactly to what an extent and how intensively my earlier life was not happy. The first hint came through you, Elijah. Through me? Bailey was caught by surprise. Yes, Elijah. Our last meeting on Solaria, I hope you remember it, Elijah, taught me something. I touched you. I removed my glove one that was similar to the glove I am wearing now, and I touched your cheek. The contact did not last long. I don't know what it meant to you. No, don't tell me it's not important. But it meant a great deal to me. She looked up, meeting his eyes defiantly. It meant everything to me. It changed my life. Remember, Elijah, that until then, after my few years of childhood, I had never touched a man or any human being, actually, except for my husband. And I touched my husband very rarely. I had viewed men on Trimensic, of course, and in the process I had become entirely familiar with every physical aspect of males, every part of them. I had nothing to learn in that respect. But I had no reason to think that one man felt much different from another, I knew what my husband's skin felt like, what his hands felt like when he could bring himself to touch me, what... everything. I had no reason to think that anything would be different with any man. There was no pleasure in contact with my husband, but why should there be? Is there particular pleasure in the contact of my fingers with this table, except to the extent that I might appreciate its physical smoothness? Contact with my husband was part of an occasional ritual that he went through because it was expected of him, and as a good Solarian, he therefore carried it through by the calendar and clock, and for the length of time and in the manner prescribed by good breeding. Except that, in another sense, it wasn't good breeding, for although this periodic contact was for the precise purpose of sexual intercourse, my husband had not applied for a child and was not interested, I believe, in producing one. And I was too much in awe of him to apply for one on my own initiative, as would have been my right. As I look back on it, I can see that the sexual experience was perfunctory and mechanical. I never had an orgasm, not once. That such a thing existed I gathered from some of my reading— but the descriptions merely puzzled me, and since they were to be found only in imported books, Solarian books never dealt with sex, I could not trust them. I thought they were merely exotic metaphors. Nor could I experiment, successfully at least, with autoeroticism. Masturbation is, I think, the common word. At least I have heard that word used on aurora. 
On Solari, of course, no aspect of sex is ever discussed, nor is any sex-related word used in polite society, nor is there any other kind of society on Solaria. From something I occasionally read, I had an idea of how one might go about masturbating, and on a number of occasions, I made a half-hearted attempt to do what was described. I could not carry it through. The taboo against touching human flesh made even my own seem forbidden and unpleasant to me. I could brush my hand against my side, cross one leg over another, feel the pressure of thigh against thigh, but these were casual touches, unregarded. To make the process of touch an instrument of deliberate pleasure was different. Every fiber of me knew it shouldn't be done, and because I knew that, the pleasure wouldn't come. And it never occurred to me, never once, that there might be pleasure in touching under other circumstances. Why should it occur to me? How could it occur to me? Until I touched you that time. Why I did, I don't know. I felt a gush of affection for you because you had saved me from being a murderess. And besides, you were not altogether forbidden. You were not a Salarian. You were not, forgive me, altogether a man. You were a creature of earth. You were human in appearance, but you were short-lived and infection-prone, something to be dismissed as semi-human at best. So because you had saved me and were not really a man, I could touch you. And what's more, you looked at me not with the hostility and repugnance of my husband or with the carefully schooled indifference of someone viewing me on Trimensic. You were right there, palpable, and your eyes were warm and concerned. You actually trembled when my hand approached your cheek. I saw that. Why it was, I don't know. The touch was so fugitive, and there was no way in which the physical sensation was different from what it would have been if I had touched my husband or any other man or perhaps even any woman. But there was more to it than the physical sensation. You were there. You welcomed it. You showed me every sign of what I accepted as affection. And when our skins, my hand, your cheek, made contact, it was as though I had touched gentle fire that made its way up my hand and arm instantaneously and set me all in flame. I don't know how long it lasted. It couldn't be for more than a moment or two, but for me, time stood still. Something happened to me that had never happened to me before, and looking back on it long afterward, when I had learned about it, I realized that I had very nearly experienced an orgasm. I tried not to show it. Bailey, not daring to look at her, shook his head. Well, then I didn't show it. I said, thank you, Elijah. I said it for what you had done for me in connection with my husband's death, but I said it much more for lighting my life and showing me, without even knowing it, what there was in life, for opening a door, for revealing a path, for pointing out a horizon. The physical act was nothing in itself, just a touch, but it was the beginning of everything. Her voice had faded out, and for a moment she said nothing, remembering. Then one finger lifted. No, don't say anything. I'm not done yet. I had had imaginings before, very vague, uncertain things. A man and I doing what my husband and I did, but somehow different. I didn't even know different in what way, and feeling something different, something I could not even imagine when imagining with all my might. I might conceivably have gone through my whole life trying to imagine the unimaginable, and I might have died, as I suppose women on Solaria, and men too, often do, never knowing, even after three or four centuries, never knowing, 
having children, but never knowing. But one touch of your cheek, Elijah, and I knew. Isn't that amazing? You taught me what I might imagine. Not the mechanics of it, not the dull, reluctant approach of bodies, but something that I could never have conceived as having anything to do with it. The look on a face, the sparkle in an eye, the feeling of gentleness, kindness, something I can't even describe, acceptance, a lowering of the terrible barrier between individuals. Love, I suppose a convenient word to encompass all of that and more. I felt love for you, Elijah, because I thought you could feel love for me. I don't say you loved me, but it seemed to me you could. I never had that, and although in ancient literature they talked of it, I didn't know what they meant any more than when men in those same books talked about honor and killed each other for its sake. I accepted the word, but never made out its meaning. I still haven't. And so it was with love until I touched you. After that, I could imagine, and I came to Aurora remembering you and thinking of you and talking to you endlessly in my mind and thinking that in Aurora I would meet a million Elijahs. She stopped, lost in her own thoughts for a moment then suddenly went on. I didn't. Aurora, it turned out, was, in its way, as bad as Solaria. In Solaria, sex was wrong. It was hated, and we all turned away from it. We could not love for the hatred that sex aroused. In Aurora, sex was boring. It was accepted calmly, easily, as easily as breathing, if one felt the impulse, one reached out toward anyone who seemed suitable, and if that suitable person was not at the moment engaged in something that could not be put aside, sex followed in any fashion that was convenient, like breathing. But where is the ecstasy in breathing? If one were choking, then perhaps the first shuddering breath that followed upon deprivation might be an overwhelming delight and relief. But if one never choked and if one never unwillingly went without sex, if it were taught to youngsters on an even basis with reading and programming, if children were expected to experiment as a matter of course, and if older children were expected to help out, sex, permitted and free as water, has nothing to do with love on Aurora, just as sex, forbidden and a thing of shame, has nothing to do with love on Solaria. In either case, children are few and must come about only after formal application. And then, if permission is granted, there must be an interlude of sex designed for childbearing only, dull and brackish. If, after a reasonable time, impregnation doesn't follow, the spirit rebels and artificial insemination is resorted to. In time, as on Solaria, ectogenesis will be the thing so that fertilization and fetal development will take place in genitalia, and sex will be left to itself as a form of social interaction and play that has no more to do with love than space polo does. I could not move into the auroran attitude, Elijah. I had not been brought up to it. With terror, I had reached out for sex, and no one refused, and no one mattered. Each man's eyes were blank when I offered myself and remained blank as they accepted. Another one, they said. What matter? They were willing, but no more than willing. And touching them meant nothing. I might have been touching my husband. I learned to go through with it, to follow their lead, to accept their guidance, and it all still meant nothing. I gained not even the urge to do it to myself and by myself. The feeling you had given me never returned. And in time, I gave up. In all this, Dr. Fastolf was my friend. He alone on all Aurora knew everything that happened on Solaria. At least so I think. 
You know that the full story was not made public and certainly did not appear in that dreadful hyperwave program that I've heard of. I refuse to watch it. Dr. Fastolf protected me against the lack of understanding on the part of Aurorans and against their general contempt for Solarians. He protected me also against the despair that filled me after a while. No, we were not lovers. I would have offered myself, but by the time it occurred to me that I might do so, I no longer felt that the feeling you had inspired Elijah would ever recur. I thought it might have been a trick of memory, and I gave up. I did not offer myself, nor did he offer himself. I do not know why he did not. Perhaps he could see that my despair arose over my failure to find anything useful in sex and did not want to accentuate the despair by repeating the failure. It would be typically kind of him to be careful of me in this way. So we were not lovers. He was merely my friend at a time when I needed that so much more. There you are, Elijah. You have the whole answer to the questions you asked. You wanted to know my relationship with Dr. Fastolf and said you needed information. You have it. Are you satisfied? Bailey tried not to let his misery show. I'm sorry, Gladia, but life has been so hard for you. You have given me the information I needed. You have given me more information than perhaps you think you have. Gladia frowned. In what way? Bailey did not answer directly. He said, Gladai, I am glad that your memory of me has meant so much to you. It never occurred to me at any time on Solaria that I was impressing you so, and even if it had, I would not have tried. You know. I know, Elijah, she said, softening. Nor would it have availed you if you had tried. I couldn't have, and I know that. Nor do I take what you have told me as an invitation now. One touch, one moment of sexual insight, need be no more than that. Very likely it can never be repeated, and that one-time existence ought not to be spoiled by foolish attempts at resurrection. That is a reason why I do not now offer myself. My failure to do so is not to be interpreted as one more blank ending for you. Besides... Yes. You have, as I said earlier, told me perhaps more than you realize you did. You have told me that the story does not end with your despair. Why do you say that? In telling me of the feeling that was inspired by the touch upon my cheek, you said something like, looking back on it long afterward, when I had learned, I realized that I had very nearly experienced an orgasm. Then you went on to explain that sex with Aurorans was never successful, and I presume you did not then experience orgasm either. Yet you must have, Gladia, if you recognized the sensation you experienced that time on Solaria. You could not look back and recognize it for what it was unless you had learned to love successfully. In other words, you have had a lover, and you have experienced love. If I am to believe that Dr. Fastolf is not your lover and has not been, then it follows that someone else is, or was. And if so, why is that your concern, Elisha? I don't know if it is or is not, Gladia. Tell me who it is, and if it proves to be not my concern, that will be the end of it. Gladia was silent. Bailey said, if you don't tell me, Gladia, I will have to tell you. I told you earlier that I am not in a position to spare your feelings. Gladia remained silent, the corners of her lips whitening with pressure. It must be someone, Gladia, and your sorrow over Jander's loss is extreme. You sent Daniil out because you could not bear to look at him for the reminder of Jander that his face brought. If I am wrong in deciding that it was Jander Pennell, he paused a moment, then said harshly, If the robot, Jander Pennell, was not your lover, say so. And Gladia whispered, Jander Pennell, the robot, 
was not my lover. Then, loudly and firmly, she said, He was my husband. 25. Bailey's lips moved soundlessly, but there was no mistaking the tetrasyllabic exclamation. Yes, said Glidaya. Jehoshaphat, you are startled. Why? Do you disapprove? Bailey said tonelessly, and it's not my place either to approve or disapprove. Which means you disapprove. Which means I seek only information. How does one distinguish between a lover and a husband on Aurora? If two people live together in the same establishment for a period of time, they may refer to each other as wife or husband rather than as lover. How long a period of time? That varies from region to region, I understand, according to local option. In the city of Eos, the period of time is three months. Is it also required that during this period of time one refrain from sexual relations with others? Glodaya's eyebrows lifted in surprise. Why? I merely ask. Exclusivity is unthinkable on Aurora. Husband or lover, it makes no difference. One engages in sex at pleasure. And did you please while you were with Jander? As it happens, I did not. But that was my choice. Others offered themselves. Occasionally. And you refused? I can always refuse at will. That is part of the non-exclusivity. But did you refuse? I did. And did those whom you refused know why you refused? What do you mean? Did they know that you had a robot husband? I had a husband. Don't call him a robot husband. There is no such expression. Did they know? She paused. I don't know if they knew. Did you tell them? What reason was there to tell them? Don't answer my questions with questions. Did you tell them? I did not. How could you avoid that? Don't you think an explanation for your refusal would have been natural? No explanation is ever required. A refusal is simply a refusal and is always accepted. I don't understand you. Bailey stopped to gather his thoughts. Glodaya and he were not at cross purposes. They were running down parallel tracks. He started again. Would it have seemed natural on Solaria to have a robot for a husband? On Solaria, it would have been unthinkable, and I would never have thought of such a possibility. On Solaria, everything was unthinkable. And on Earth, too, Elijah. Would your wife ever have taken a robot for a husband? That's irrelevant, Glodaya. Perhaps. But your expression was answer enough. We may not be Aurorans, you and I, but we are on Aurora. I have lived here for two years, and I accept its mores. Do you mean that human-robot sexual connections are common here on Aurora? I don't know. I merely know that they are accepted because everything is accepted where sex is concerned, everything that is voluntary, that gives mutual satisfaction, and that does no physical harm to anyone. What conceivable difference would it make to anyone else how an individual or any combination of individuals found satisfaction— would anyone worry about which books I viewed, what food I ate, what hour I went to sleep or awoke, whether I was fond of cats or disliked roses? Sex, too, is a matter of indifference. On Aurora. On Aurora, echoed Bailey. But you were not born on Aurora and were not brought up in its ways. You told me just a while ago that you couldn't adjust to this very indifference to sex that you now praise. Earlier, you expressed your distaste for multiple marriages and for easy promiscuity. If you did not tell those whom you refused why you refused, it might have been because in some hidden pocket of your being you were ashamed of having Jander as a husband. You might have known or suspected or even merely supposed that you were unusual in this, unusual even on Aurora, and you were ashamed. No, Elisha, you won't talk me into being ashamed." If having a robot as a husband is unusual even on Aurora, that would be because robots like Jander are unusual. The robots we have on Solaria or on Earth or on Aurora except for Jander and Daniil are not designed to give any but the most primitive sexual satisfaction. They might be used as masturbation devices, perhaps, as a mechanical vibrator might be, but nothing much more. When the new humaniform robot becomes widespread, so will human-robot sex become widespread. Bailey said, How did you come to possess Jander in the first place, Glodaya? Only two existed, both in Dr. Fastolf's establishment. 
Did he simply give one of them half of the total to you? Yes. Why? Out of kindness, I suppose. I was lonely, disillusioned, wretched, a stranger in a strange land. He gave me Jander for company, and I will never be able to thank him enough for it. It only lasted for half a year, but that half year may be worth all my life beside. Did Dr. Fastolf know that Jander was your husband? He never referred to it, so I don't know. Did you refer to it? No. Why not? I saw no need. And no, it was not because I felt shame. How did it happen? That I saw no need? No. That Jander became your husband. Gladia stiffened. She said in a hostile voice, Why do I have to explain that? Bailey said, Gladia, it's getting late. Don't fight me every step of the way. Are you distressed that Jander is, is gone? Need you ask? Do you want to find out what happened? Again, need you ask? Then help me. I need all the information I can get if I am to begin, even begin to make progress in working out an apparently insoluble problem. How did Jander become your husband? Gladia sat back in her chair, and her eyes were suddenly brimming with tears. She pushed at the plate of crumbs that had once been pastry and said in a choked voice, Ordinary robots do not wear clothes, but they are so designed as to give the effect of wearing clothes. I know robots well, having lived on Solaria, and I have a certain amount of artistic talent. I remember your light forms, said Bailey softly. Gladia nodded in acknowledgment. I constructed a few designs for new models that would possess, in my opinion, more style and more interest than some of those in use in Aurora. Some of my paintings, based on those designs, are on the walls here. Others I have in other places in this establishment. Bailey's eyes moved to the paintings. He had seen them. They were of robots, unmistakably. They were not naturalistic, but seemed elongated and unnaturally curved. He noted now that the distortions were so designed as to stress, quite cleverly, those portions which, now that he looked at them from a new perspective, suggested clothing. Somehow there was an impression of servants' costumes he had once viewed in a book devoted to the Victorian England of medieval times. Did Gladia know of these things, or was it a merely chance, if circumstantial, similarity? It was a question of no account, probably, but not something, perhaps, to be forgotten. When he had first noticed them, he had thought it was Gladia's way of surrounding herself with robots in imitation of life on Solaria. She hated that life, she said, but that was only a product of her thinking mind. Solaria had been the only home she had really known, and that is not easily sloughed off. Perhaps not at all. And perhaps that remained a factor in her painting, even if her new occupation gave her a more plausible motive. She was speaking. I was successful. Some of the robot manufacturing concerns paid well for my designs, and there were numerous cases of existing robots being resurfaced according to my directions. There was a certain satisfaction in all this that, in a small measure, compensated for the emotional emptiness of my life. When Jander was given me by Dr. Fastolf, I had a robot who, of course, wore ordinary clothing. The dear doctor was, indeed, kind enough to give me a number of changes of clothing for Jander. None of it was in the least imaginative, and it amused me to buy what I considered more appropriate garb. That meant measuring him quite accurately, since I intended to have my designs made to order, and that meant having him remove his clothing in stages. He did so, and it was only when he was completely unclothed that I quite realized how close to human he was. Nothing was lacking, and those portions which might be expected to be erectile were, indeed, erectile. Indeed, they were under what in a human would be called conscious control. Gender could tumesce and detumesce on order, he told me so when I asked him if his penis was functional in that respect. I was curious, and he demonstrated. You must understand that, although he looked very much like a man, I knew he was a robot. I have a certain hesitation about touching men, you understand, and I have no doubt 
That played a part in my inability to have satisfactory sex with Aurorans. But this was not a man, and I had been with robots all my life. I could touch gender freely. It didn't take me long to realize that I enjoyed touching him, and it didn't take gender long to realize that I enjoyed it. He was a finely tuned robot who followed the three laws carefully. To have failed to give joy when he could would have been to disappoint. Disappointment could be reckoned as harm, and he could not harm a human being. He took infinite care then to give me joy, and because I saw in him the desire to give joy, something I never saw in Auroran men, I was indeed joyful, and eventually I found out, to the full, I think, what an orgasm is. Bailey said, You were then completely happy. With gender? Of course. Completely. You never quarreled? With Chander? How could I? His only aim, his only reason for existence was to please me. Might that not disturb you? He only pleased you because he had to. What motive would anyone have to do anything but that, for one reason or another, he had to? And you never had the urge to try real... to try Aurorans after you had learned to experience orgasm? It would have been an unsatisfactory substitute. I wanted only gender. And do you understand now what I have lost? Bailey's naturally grave expression lengthened into solemnity. He said, I understand, Gladia. If I gave you pain earlier, please forgive me, for I did not entirely understand then. But she was weeping, and he waited, unable to say anything more unable to think of a reasonable way to console her. Finally, she shook her head and wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. She whispered, Is there anything more? Bailey said apologetically, A few questions on another subject, and then I will be through annoying you. He added cautiously, For now. What is it? She seemed very tired. Do you know that there are people who seem to think that Dr. Fastolf was responsible for the killing of Jander? Yes. Do you know that Dr. Fastolf himself admits that only he possesses the expertise to kill Jander in the way that he was killed? Yes. The dear doctor told me so himself. Well then, Gladiah, do you think Dr. Fastolf killed Jander? She looked up at him, suddenly and sharply, and then said angrily, Of course not. Why should he? Jander was his robot to begin with, and he was full of care for him. You don't know the dear doctor as I do, Elijah. He is a gentle person who would hurt no one, and who would never hurt a robot. To suppose he would kill one is to suppose that a rock would fall upward. I have no further questions, Gladiah, and the only other business I have here at the moment is to see Jander what remains of Jander, if I have your permission. She was suspicious again, hostile. Why? Why? Gladiah, please. I don't expect it to be of any use, but I must see Jander and know that seeing him is of no use. I will try to do nothing that will offend your sensibilities. Gladiah stood up. Her gown, so simple as to be nothing more than a closely fitting sheath, was not black, as it would have been on earth, but of a dull color that showed no sparkle anywhere in it. Bailey, no connoisseur of clothing, realized how well it represented mourning. Come with me, she whispered. 26. Bailey followed Gladia through several rooms, the walls of which glowed dully. On one or two occasions, he caught a hint of movement, which he took to be a robot getting rapidly out of the way, since they had been told not to intrude. Through a hallway, then, and up a short flight of stairs into a small room in which one part of one wall gleamed to give the effect of a spotlight. The room held a cot and a chair, and no other furnishings. 
This was his room, said Glodaya. Then, as though answering Bailey's thought, she went on to say, It was all he needed. I left him alone as much as I could. All day if I could. I did not want to ever grow tired of him. She shook her head. I wish now I had stayed with him every second. I didn't know our time would be so short. Here he is. Jander was lying on the cot, and Bailey looked at him gravely. The robot was covered with a smooth and shiny material. The spotlighted wall cast its glow on Jander's head, which was smooth and almost inhuman in its serenity. The eyes were wide open, but they were opaque and lusterless. He looked enough like Daniil to give ample point to Glodaya's discomfort at Daniil's presence. His neck and bare shoulders showed above the sheet. Bailey said, has Dr. Fastolf inspected him? Yes, thoroughly. I came to him in despair, and if you had seen him rush here, the concern he felt, the pain, the, the panic, you would never think he could have been responsible. There was nothing he could do. Is he unclothed? Yes. Dr. Fastolf had to remove the clothing for a thorough examination. There was no point in replacing them. Would you permit me to remove the covering, Ladaya? Must you? I do not wish to be blamed for having missed some obvious point of examination. What can you possibly find that Dr. Fastolf didn't? Nothing, Ladaya. But I must know that there is nothing for me to find. Please cooperate. Well, then go ahead. But please put the covering back exactly as it is now when you are done. She turned her back on him and on Jander, put her left arm against the wall and rested her forehead on it. There was no sound from her, no motion, but Bailey knew that she was weeping again. The body was, perhaps, not quite human. The muscular contours were somehow simplified and a bit schematic, but all the parts were there. Nipples, navel, penis, testicles, pubic hair, and so on. Even fine, light hair on the chest. How many days was it since Jander had been killed? It struck Bailey that he didn't know, but it had been some time before his trip to Aurora had begun. Over a week had passed, and there was no sign of decay, either visually or olfactorily. A clear robotic difference. Bailey hesitated, and then thrust one arm under Jander's shoulders and another under his hips, working them through to the other side. He did not consider asking for Glodaya's help. That would be impossible. He heaved and, with some difficulty, turned Jander over without throwing him off the cot. The cot creaked. Glodaya must know what he was doing, but she did not turn around. Though she did not offer to help, she did not protest either. Bailey withdrew his arms. Jander felt warm to the touch. Presumably, the power unit continued to do so simple a thing as to maintain temperature, even with the brain inoperative. The body felt firm and resilient, too. Presumably, it never went through any stage analogous to rigor mortis. One arm was now dangling off the cot in quite a human fashion. Bailey moved it gently and released it. It swung to and fro slightly and came to a halt. He bent one leg at the knee and studied the foot, then the other. The buttocks were perfectly formed, and there was even an anus. Bailey could not get rid of the feeling of uneasiness. The notion that he was violating the privacy of a human being would not go away. If it were a human corpse, its coldness and its stiffness would have deprived it of humanity. He thought uncomfortably, a robot corpse is much more human than a human corpse. Again he reached under Jander, lifted, and turned him over. He smoothed out the sheet as best he could then replaced the cover as it had been, and smoothed that. He stepped back and decided it was as it had been at first. 
or as near to that as he could manage. I'm finished, Gladiah, he said. She turned, looked at Jander with wet eyes, and said, May we go, then? Yes, of course, but Glodiah. Well? Will you be keeping him this way? I imagine he won't decay. Does it matter if I do? In some ways, yes. You must give yourself a chance to recover. You can't spend three centuries mourning. What is over is over. His statements sounded hollowly sententious in his own ear. What must they have sounded like in hers? She said, I know you mean it kindly, Elijah. I have been requested to keep Jander till the investigation is done. He will then be torched at my request. Torched? Put under a plasma torch and reduced to his elements, as human corpses are. I will have holograms of him and memories. Will that satisfy you? Of course. I must return to Dr. Fastolf's house now. Yes. Have you learned anything from Jander's body? I did not expect to, Glidaya. She faced him full. And Elijah, I want you to find out who did this and why. I must know. But Glidaya, she shook her head violently as though keeping out anything she wasn't ready to hear. I know you can do this.